Book One, Chapter One. The Rise of David Levinsky. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Kahan. Book One Home and School. Chapter One. Sometimes, when I think of my past in a superficial, casual way, the metamorphosis I have gone through strikes me as nothing short of a miracle. I was born and reared in the lowest depth of poverty, and I arrived in America in 1885 with four cents in my pocket. I am now worth more than two million dollars, and recognized as one of the two or three leading men in the cloak and suit trade in the united states and yet when i take a look at my inner identity it impresses me as being precisely the same as it was thirty or forty years ago my present station power the amount of worldly happiness at my command and the rest of it seem to be devoid of significance when I was young, I used to think that middle-aged people recalled their youth as something seen through a haze. I know better now. Life is much shorter than I imagined it to be. The last years that I spent in my native land and my first years in America come back to me with the distinctness of yesterday. Indeed, I have a better recollection of many a trifle of my childhood days then I have of some important things that occurred to me recently. I have a good memory for faces, but I am apt to recognize people I have not seen for a quarter of a century more readily than I do some I used to know only a few years ago. I love to brood over my youth. The dearest days in one's life are those that seem very far and very near at once. My wretched boyhood appeals to me as a sick child does to its mother. I was born in Antomer, in the northwestern region, Russia, in 1865. All I remember of my father is his tawny beard, a huge yellow apple he once gave me at the gate of an orchard where he was employed as watchman, and the candle which burned at his head his body lay under a white shroud on the floor. I was less than three years old when he died, so my mother would carry me to the synagogue in her arms to have somebody say the prayer for the dead with me. I was unable fully to realize the meaning of the ceremony, of course, but its solemnity and pathos were not altogether lost upon me. There is a streak of sadness in the blood of my race. Very likely, it's of oriental origin. If it is, it has been amply nourished by many centuries of persecution. Left to her own resources, my mother strove to support herself and me by peddling pea mush or doing odds and ends of jobs. She had to struggle hard for our scanty livelihood and her trials and loneliness came home to me at an early period. I was her, all in all, though she never poured over me those torrents of senseless rhapsody which I heard other Jewish mothers shower over their children. The only words of endearment I often heard from her were, my little bean, and my comfort. Sometimes, when she seemed to be crushed by the miseries of her life, she would call me, my poor little orphan. Otherwise, it was, come here, my comfort. Are you hungry, my little bean? Or, you are a silly little dear, my comfort. These words of hers and the sonorous contralto in which they were uttered are ever alive in my heart, like the flame everlasting in a synagogue. Mama, why do you never beat me like other mamas do? I once asked her. She laughed, kissed me, and said, because God has punished you hard enough as it is, poor orphan mine. I scarcely remembered my father, yet I missed him keenly. I was ever awaked to the fact that other little boys had fathers, and that I was a melancholy exception. 
that most married women had husbands, while my mother had to bear her burden unaided. In my dim childish way, I knew that there was a great blank in our family nest, that it was a widow's nest, and the feeling of it seemed to color all my other feelings. When I was a little older and would no longer sleep with my mother, a rusty old coat of my deceased father served me as a quilt. At night, before falling asleep, I would pull it over my head, shut my eyes tight, and evoke a flow of fantastic shapes, bright, beautifully tinted, and incessantly changing form and color. While the play of these figures and hues was going on before me, I would see all sorts of bizarre visions, which at times seemed to have something to do with my father's spirit. Is Papa in heaven now? Is he through with hell? I once inquired of my mother. Some things or ideas would assume queer forms in my mind. God, for example, appealed to me as a beardless man wearing a quilted silk cap. Holiness was something burning, forbidding, something connected with fire, while a day had the form of an oblong box. I was a great dreamer of daydreams. One of my pastimes was to imagine a host of tiny soldiers, each the size of my little finger, but alive and real. These I would drill as I saw officers do their men in front of the barracks some distance from our home, or else I would take to marching up and down the room with mother's rolling pin for a rifle, grunting ferociously in Russian, left one, left one, left one, in the double capacity of a Russian soldier and of David fighting Goliath. Often, while bent upon her housework, my mother would hum some of the songs of the famous wedding bard, Eliakim Zunzer, who later immigrated to America. I distinctly remember her singing this, There is a flower on the road, decaying in the dust, passers-by treading upon it. His summer and winter, and his Rachel is bemoaning her children, I vividly recall these brooding airs as she used to sing them, for I have inherited her musical memory and her passionate love for melody, though not her voice. I cannot sing myself, but some tunes give me thrills of pleasure, keen and terrible as the edge of a sword. Some haunt me like ghosts. But then this is a common trait among our people. She was a wiry little woman, my mother with prominent cheekbones, a small firm mouth, and dark eyes. Her hair was likewise dark, though I saw it but very seldom, for like all orthodox daughters of Israel she always had it carefully covered by a kerchief, a nightcap, or, on Saturdays and holidays, by a wig. She was extremely rigorous about it. For instance, while she changed her kerchief for her nightcap, she would cause me to look away. My great sport during my ninth and tenth years was to play buttons. These we would flip around on some patch of unpaved ground with a little pit for a billiard pocket. My own pockets were usually full of those buttons. As the game was restricted to brass ones from the uniforms of soldiers, my mother had plenty to do to keep these pockets of mine in good repair. To develop skill for the sport, I would spend hours in some secluded spot, secretly practicing it by myself. Sometimes, as I was thus engaged, my mother would seek me out and bring me a hunk of rye bread. Here, she would say gravely, handing me it. And I would accept it with preoccupied mien, take a deep bite, and go on flipping my buttons. I gambled passionately and was continually counting my treasure or running around the big courtyard, jingling it self-consciously. But one day I suddenly wearied of it all and traded my entire hoard of buttons for a pocket knife and some trinkets. Don't you care for buttons any more? Mother inquired. I can't bear the sight of them, I replied. She shrugged her shoulders smilingly and called me queer fellow. 
Sometimes I would fall to kissing her passionately. Once, after an outburst of this kind, I said, Are people sorry for us, Mama? What do you mean? Uh, because I have no papa and we have no money. Antomer, which then boasted 80,000 inhabitants, was a town in which a few thousand rubles was considered wealth, and we were among the humblest and poorest in it. The bulk of the population lived on less than 50 kopecks, 25 cents a day, and that was difficult to earn. A hunk of rye bread and a bit of herring or cheese constituted a meal. A quarter of a kopeck, an eighth of a cent, was a coin with which one purchased a few crumbs of pot cheese or some boiled water for tea. Rubbers were worn by people of means only. I never saw any in the district in which my mother and I had our home. A white starched collar was an attribute of aristocracy. Children had to nag their mothers for a piece of bread. Mama, I want a piece of bread, with a mild whimper. Again, bread, you will eat my head off. May the worms eat you. Dialogues such as this were heard at every turn. My boyhood recollections include the following episode. Mother once sent me to a tinker's shop to have our drinking cup repaired. It was a plain tin affair and must have cost when new something like four or five cents. It had done service as long as I could remember. It was quite rusty and finally sprang a leak. And so I took it to the tinker or tinsmith who soldered it up. On my way home I slipped and fell whereupon the cup hit a cobblestone and sprang a new leak. When my mother discovered the damage, she made me tell the story of the accident over and over again, wringing her hands and sighing as she listened. The average mother in our town would have given me a whipping in the circumstances. She did not. End of chapter 1 Recording by Mark Cholsky, Massachusetts, United States Book One, Chapter Two The Rise of David Levinsky. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Kahan. Book One Home and School. Chapter Two. We lived in a deep basement in a large, dusky room that we shared with three other families, each family occupying one of the corners and as much space as it was able to rest. Violent quarrels were a commonplace occurrence, and the question of floor space a staple bone of contention. The huge brick oven in which the four housewives cooked dinner was another prolific source of strife. Fights over pots were as frequent and as truculent as those over the children. Of our roommates I best recall a bookbinder and a retired old soldier who mended old sheepskin coats for a living. My memories of home are inseparable from the odors of sheepskin and paste and the image of two upright wooden screws, the bookbinder's machine. The soldier had finished his term of military service years before, yet he still wore his uniform, a dilapidated black coat with new brass buttons and a similar overcoat of a coarse gray material. Also, he still shaved his chin, sporting a pair of formidable gray side whiskers. Shaving is one of the worst sins known to our faith. But somehow people overlooked it in one who had once been compelled to practice it in the army. Otherwise, the furrier, or sheepskin tailor, was an extremely pious man. He was very kind to me, so that his military whiskers never owed me. Not so his lame, tall wife, who often hit me with one of her crutches. She was the bane of my life 
The bookbinder's wife was much younger than her husband, and one of the things I often heard was that he was crazy for her because she is his second wife, from which I inferred that second wives were loved far more than first ones. The bookbinder had a red-haired little girl whom I hated like poison. Red Esther, we called her, to distinguish her from a black Esther, whose home was on the same yard. She was full of fight. Knowing how repulsive she was to me, she was often the first to open hostilities, mocking my way of speaking or sticking out her tongue at me, or else she would press her freckled cheek against my lips and then dodge back, shouting gloatingly, He has kissed a girl! He has kissed a girl! Sinner! Shame! Sinner! Sinner! There were some other things that she or some of the other little girls of our courtyard would do to make an involuntary sinner of me, but this had better be left out. I had many a fierce duel with her. I was considered a strong boy, but she was quick and nimble as a cat, and I usually got the worst of the bargain, often being left badly scratched and bleeding at which point the combat would be taken up by our mothers. The room, part of which was our home, and two other single-room apartments similarly tenanted, opened into a pitch-dark vestibule, which my fancy peopled with evil ones. A steep stairway led up to the yard, part of which was occupied by a huddle of ramshackle one-story houses. It was known as Abner's Court. During the summer months, it swarmed with tattered, unkempt humanity. There was a peculiar order to the place which I can still smell. Indeed, many of the things that I conjure up from the past appeal as much to my sense of smell as to my visual memory. It was anything but a grateful odor. The far end of our street was part of a squalid little suburb known as the Sands. It was inhabited by Gentiles exclusively. Sometimes, when a Jew chanced to visit it, some of its boys would descend upon him with shouts of damn Jew, Christ killer, and sick their dogs at him. As we had no dogs to defend us, Orthodox Jews being prohibited from keeping these domestic animals by a custom amounting to a religious injunction, our boys never ventured into the place, except, perhaps, in a spirit of daredevil bravado. One day the bigger Jewish boys of our street had a pitched battle with the Sands boys, an event which is one of the landmarks in the history of my childhood. Still, some of the Sands boys were on terms of friendship with us and would even come to play with us in our yard. The only Gentile family that lived in Abner's court was that of the porter. His children spoke fairly good Yiddish. One Saturday evening a pockmarked lad from the Sands, the son of a chimney sweep, meeting me in the street, set his dog at me. As a result, I came home with a fair-sized piece of my trousers, knee breeches were unknown to us, missing. I am going to kill him, my mother said with something like a sob. I am just going to kill him. Cool down, the retired soldier pleaded, without removing his short-stemmed pipe from his mouth. Mother was silent for a minute and even seated herself, but presently she sprang to her feet again and made for the door. The soldier's wife seized her by an arm. Where are you going? To the sands? Are you crazy? If you start a quarrel over there, you will never come back alive. I don't care. She wrenched herself free and left the room. Half an hour later, she came back beaming. His father is a lovely Gentile, she said. He went out, 
brought his murderer of a boy home, took off his belt, and skinned him alive. A good Gentile, the soldier's wife commented admiringly. There was always a pile of logs somewhere in our court, the property of some family that was to have it cut up for firewood. This was our great gathering place of a summer evening. Here we would bandy stories, often of our own inventing, or discuss things, the leading topic of conversation being the soldiers of the two regiments that were stationed in our town. We saw a good deal of these soldiers, and we could tell their officers commissioned or not commissioned by the number of stars or bands on their shoulder straps also we knew the names of their generals colonels and some of their majors and captains the more important maneuvers took place a great distance from abner's court but that didn't matter if they occurred on a saturday when we were free from school and as good luck would have it they usually did Many of us, myself invariably included, would go to see them. The blare of trumpets, the beat of drums, the playing of the band, the rhythmic clatter of thousands of feet, the glint of rows and rows of bayonets, the red or the blue of the uniforms, the commanding officer on his mount, the spirited singing of the men marching back to barracks, all this would literally hold me spellbound. That we often played soldiers goes without saying, but we played hares more often, a game in which the counting was done by means of senseless words, like the American inny mini miny mo. Sometimes we would play war, with the names of the belligerents borrowed from the Old Testament, and once in a while we would have a real war with the boys of the next street. I was accounted one of the strong fellows among the boys of Abner's court, as well as one of the conspicuous figures among them. Compactly built, broad-shouldered, with a small, firm mouth like my mother's, a well-formed nose and large dark eyes, I was not a homely boy by any means, nor one devoid of a certain kind of magnetism. One of my recollections is of my mother administering a tongue lashing to a married young woman whom she had discovered flirting in the dark vestibule with a man not her husband. A few minutes later the young woman came in and begged my mother not to tell her husband. If I was your husband, I would skin you alive. Oh, don't tell him. Take pity, don't. I won't. Get out of here, you lump of stench. Oh, swear you won't tell him. Do swear, dearie. Long life to you. Health to every little bone of yours. First you swear that you will never do it again, you heap of dung. Strike me blind and dumb and deaf if I ever do it again. There. Your oaths are worth no more than the barking of a dog. Can't you be decent? You ought to be noted in the marketplace. You are a plague. Black luck upon you. Get away from me. But I will be decent. May I break both my legs and both my arms if I am not. Do swear that you won't tell him. My mother yielded. She was passionately devout, my mother. Being absolutely illiterate, she would murmur meaningless words in the sing-song of a prayer, pretending to herself that she was performing her devotions. This, however, she would do with absolute earnestness and fervor, often with tears of ecstasy coming to her eyes. To be sure, she knew how to bless the Sabbath candles and to recite the two or three other brief prayers that our religion exacts from married women. But she was not contented with it, and the sight of a woman going to synagogue with a huge prayer book under her arm was ever a source of envy to her. Most of the tenants of the court were good people, honest and pure, 
but there were exceptions. Of these, my memory has retained the face of a man who was known as Carrot Pudding Mo. A red-headed, broad-shouldered finger worker, a specialist in short change, yardstick frauds, and other varieties of marketplace ledger domain. One woman, a cross between a beggar and a dealer in second-hand dresses, had four sons, all of whom were pickpockets, but she herself was said to be of spotless honesty. She never allowed them to enter Abner's court, though every time one of them was in prison she would visit him and bring him food. Nor were professional beggars barred from the court as tenants. Indeed, one of our next-door neighbors was a regular recipient of alms at the hands of my mother. For, poor as she was, she seldom let a Friday pass without distributing a half groschen an eighth of a cent in charity. The amusing part of it was the fact that one of the beggars of her list was far better off than she. He is old and lame and no hypocrite like the rest of them, she would explain. She had a ferocious temper, but there were people, myself among them, with whom she was never irritated. The women of Abner's court were either her devoted followers or her bitter enemies. She was a leader in most of the feuds that often divided the whole court into two warring camps, and in those exceptional cases when she happened to be neutral, she was an ardent peacemaker. She wore a dark blue kerchief, which was older than I, and almost invariably, when there was a crowd of women in the yard, that kerchief would loom in its center. Growing as I did in that crowded basement room, which was the home of four families, it was inevitable that the secrets of sex should be revealed to me before I was able fully to appreciate their meaning. Then, too, the neighborhood what not of the purest in town. Located a short distance from Abner's court, midway between it and the barracks, was a lane of ill repute, usually full of soldiers. If it had an official name, I never heard it. It was generally referred to as that street, in a subdued voice that was suggestive either of shame and disgust or of waggish mirth. For a long time I was under the impression that that was simply the name of the street. One summer day, I must have been eight years old, I told my mother that I had peeked in one of the little yards of the mysterious lane that I had seen half-naked women and soldiers there, and that one of the women had beckoned me and given me some cake. Why, you mustn't do that, Davy, she said aghast. Don't you ever go near that street again, do you hear? Why? Because it's a bad street. Why is it bad? Keep still and don't ask foolish questions. I obeyed, with the result that the foolish question kept ranking in my brain. On a subsequent occasion, when she was combing my dark hair fondly, I ventured once more, Mama, why mustn't I come near that street? Because it's a sin to do so, my comfort. Fee upon it. That answer settled it. One did not ask why it was a sin to do this or not to do that. You don't demand explanations of the master of the world, as people were continually saying around me. My curiosity was silenced. That strength became repellent to me, something hideously wicked and sinister. Sometimes some of the excommunicated women would drop in at our yard. As a rule, my mother was bitterly opposed to their visits, and she often chased them out with maledictions and expressions of abhorrence. But there was one case in which she showed unusual tolerance, and even assumed the part of father confessor to a woman of this kind. She would listen to her tale of woe 
homesickness and repentance, including some of the most intimate details of her loathsome life. She would even deliver her donations to the synagogue, thus helping her cheat the biblical injunction which bars the gifts of fallen women from a house of God. My mother would bid me keep away during those confabs of theirs, but this only whetted my curiosity, and I often overheard far more than I should. Fridays were half holidays with us Jewish boys. One Friday afternoon a wedding was celebrated in our courtyard. The procession emerged from one of the rickety one-story houses, accompanied by a band of playing a solemn tune. When it reached the center of the vacant part of the yard, it came to a halt, and the canopy was stretched over the principal figures of the ceremony. Prayers and benedictions were chanted. The groom put the ring on the bride's finger, dedicating her to himself according to the laws of Moses and Israel. More prayers were recited, the bridegroom and the bride received sips of wine, a plate was smashed, the sound being greeted by shouts of good luck, good luck. The band struck up a lively tune with a sad tang to it. The yard was crowded with people. It was the greatest sensation we children had ever enjoyed there. We remained out chattering of the event till the windows were a glitter with sabbath lights i was in a trance the ceremony was a poem to me something inexpressibly beautiful and sacred presently a boy somewhat older than i made a jest at the young couple's expense what he said was a startling revelation to me certain things which i had known before suddenly appeared in a new light to me I relished the discovery, and I relished the deviltry of it. But the poem vanished. The beauty of the wedding I had just witnessed, and the weddings in general, seemed to be irretrievably desecrated. That boy's name was Naphtali. He was a trim-looking fellow, with curly brown hair, somewhat near-sighted. He was as poor as the average boy in the yard, and as poorly dressed, but he was the tidiest of us. He would draw with a piece of chalk figures of horses and men which he admired. He knew things, good and bad, and from that Friday I often sought his company. Unlike most of the other boys, he talked little, throwing out his remarks at long intervals, which sharpened my sense of his wisdom. His father never let him attend the maneuvers, yet he knew more about soldiers than any of the other boys, more even than I, though I had that retired soldier, the sheepskin man, to explain things military to me. One summer evening Naphtali and I sat on a pile of logs in the yard watching a boy who was playing on a toy fiddle of his own making. I said, I wish I knew how to play on a real fiddle, don't you? Naphtali made no answer. After a little he said, You must think it's the bow that does the playing, don't you? What else does it? I asked, perplexed. It's the fingers of the other hand, though that are jumping around. Is it? I did not understand, but I was deeply impressed all the same. The question bothered me all that evening. Finally, I submitted it to my mother. Mama, Naphtali says when you play on a fiddle, it's not the bow that makes the tune, but the fingers that are jumping around. Is it true? She told me not to bother her with foolish questions, but the retired soldier, who had overheard my query, volunteered to answer it of course it's not the bow he said but if you did not work the bow the strings would not play would they i urged you could play a tune by pinching them he answered but if you just kept passing the bow up and down 
there would be no tune at all I plied him with further questions and he answered them all patiently and fondly illustrating his explanations with a thread for a violin string my mother looking for him to me beamingly when we were through she questioned him do you think he understands it all he certainly does he has a good head he answered with a wink and she flushed with happiness end of chapter 2 book 1 chapter 3 the rise of david levinsky this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the rise of david levinsky by abraham kahan book 1 home and school chapter 3 the tuition fee at a school for religious instructions or header was from eight to ten rubles five dollars for a term of six months my mother could not afford it on the other hand she would not hear of sending me to the free header of our town because of its reputation for poor instruction so she importuned and harassed two distant relatives of ours until they agreed to raise part of the sum between them the payments were made with anything but promptness the result being that i was often turned out of school mother however would lose no time in bringing me back she would implore the schoolmaster to take pity of the poor helpless woman that she was assuring him with some weird oaths that she would pay him every penny if that failed she would burst into a flood of threats and imprecations daring him to let a fatherless boy grow up in ignorance of the word of god this was followed by similar sins at the houses of my cousins until finally i was allowed to resume my studies sometimes at the same header sometimes at some other one there were scores of such private schools in our town and before i got through my elementary religious education i had became acquainted with a considerable number of them sometimes when a teacher or his wife tried to oust me i would clutch at the table and struggle sullenly until they yielded i may explain that instruction in these headers was confined to the hebrew old testament and rudiments of the talmud the exercises lasting practically all day and part of the evening the classroom was at the same time the bedroom living room and kitchen of the teacher's family his wife and children were always around these header teachers were usually a haggard-looking lot with full beards and voices hoarse with incessant shouting a special man generally came for an hour to teach the boys to write as he was to be paid separately i was not included the feeling of envy abasement and self-pity with which i used to watch the other boys ply their quills is among the most painful memories of my childhood during the penmanship lesson i was generally kept busy in other directions the teacher's wife would make me help her with her housework go her errands or mind the baby in one instance i became so attached to the baby that when i was expelled i missed it keenly i seized every opportunity to watch the boys write and would practice the art with chalk on my mother's table or bed on the door of our basement room or many a gate or fence sometimes a boy would let me write a line or two in his copybook sometimes too i would come to school before the schoolmaster had returned from the morning service at the synagogue and practice with pen and ink following the copy of some of my classmates one of my teachers once caught me in the act he held me up as an ink thief and forbade me come to school before the beginning of exercises 
Otherwise, my teacher scarcely ever complained of my behavior. As to the progress I was making in my studies, they admitted, some even with enthusiasm, that mine was a good head. Nevertheless, to be beaten by them was an everyday experience with me. Overworked, underfed, and goaded by the tongue lashing of their wives, these enervated drudges were usually out of sorts. Bursts of ill temper, in the form of invective, hair pulling, ear pulling, pinching, caning, nape cracking, or chin smashing, were part of the routine, and very often I was the scapegoat for the sins of other boys. When a pupil deserved punishment, and the schoolmaster could not afford to inflict it because the culprit happened to be the pet of a well-to-do family, the teacher's anger was almost sure to be vented on me. If I happened to be somewhat absent-minded, the only offense I was ever guilty of, or was not quick enough to turn over a leaf, or there was the slightest halt in my sing-song, I received a violent nudge or a pull by the ear. Lively, lively carcass, you! I can almost hear one of my teachers shout these words as he digs his elbow into my side. The millions one gets from your mother. This man would beat and abuse me even by way of expressing approval. A bright fellow, curse him, he would say, punching me with an air of admiration. Or, where did you get those brains of yours, you wild beast? With a violent pull at my forelock. During the winter months, when the exercises went on until nine in the evening, the candle or kerosene was paid for by the boys in rotation. When it was my turn to furnish the light, it often happened that my mother was unable to procure the required two kopecks, one cent. Then the teacher or his wife or both would curse me for a sponge and a robber and ask me why I did not go to the charity school. Almost every teacher in town was known among us boys by some nickname, which was usually borrowed from some trade. If he had a predilection for pulling a boy's hair, we would call him wig-maker or brush-maker. If he preferred to slap or calcimine the culprit's face, we would speak of him as a mason, a coachman was a teacher who did not spare the rod or the whip, a carpenter, one who used his finger as a gimlet, boring a pupil's side or cheek, a locksmith, one who had a weakness for turning the screw or pinching. The greatest locksmith in town was a man named Schmerl, but then he was more often called simply Schmerl the Pincher. He was one of my schoolmasters. He seemed to prefer the flesh of plump, well-fed boys, but as these were usually the sons of prosperous parents, he often had to forego the pleasure and to gratify his appetite on me. There was something morbid in his cruel passion for young flesh, something perversely related to sex, perhaps. He was a young man with a wide, sneering mouth. He would pinch me black and blue till my heart contracted with pain. Yet I never uttered a murmur. I was too profoundly aware of the fact that I was kept on sufferance to risk the slightest demonstration. I had developed a singular faculty for bearing pain, which I would parade before the other boys. Also, I had developed a relish for flaunting my martyrdom, for being an object of pity. Oh, how I did hate this man, especially his sneering mouth. In my helplessness, I would seek comfort in dreams of becoming a great man some day, rich and mighty, and avenging myself on him. Behold, Schmerl the Pincher is running after me, cringingly begging my pardon, and I, 
omnipotent and formidable, say to him, Do you remember how you pinched the life out of me for nothing? Away with you, you cruel beast! Or I would vision myself dropping dead under one of his onslaughts. Behold him trembling with fright, the heartless wretch serves him right. If my body happened to bear some mark of his cruelty, I would conceal it carefully from my mother, lest she should quarrel with him. Moreover, to betray school secrets was considered a great sin. One night, as I was changing my shirt, anxiously maneuvering to keep a certain spot on my left arm out of her sight, she became suspicious. Hold on. What are you hiding there? she said, stepping up and inspecting my bare arm. She found an ugly blotch. Why is me? A lamentation upon me, she said, looking aghast. Who's been pinching you? Nobody. Is it that beast of a teacher, isn't it? No. Don't lie, Davy. It is that assassin. The cholera take him. Tell me the truth. Don't be afraid. A boy did it. What's his name? I don't know. It was a boy in the street. You are a liar. In the next morning, when I went to Heather, she accompanied me. Arrived there, she stripped me half naked, and, pointing at the discoloration on my arm, she said with ominous composure, Look, whose work is it? Mine, Schmerl answered without removing his long-stemmed pipe from his wide mouth. He was no coward. And you are proud of it, are you? If you don't like it, you can take your ornament of a son along with you. Clear out, you witch. She flew at him, and they clenched. When they had separated, some of his hair was in her hand, while her arms, as she subsequently owned to me, were marked with the work of his expert fingers. Another schoolmaster had a special predilection for digging the huge nail of his thumb into the side of his victim a peculiarity for which he had been named the Cossack, his famous thumb being referred to by boys as his spear. He had a passion for inventing new and complex modes of punishment, his spear figuring in most of them. One of his methods of inflicting pain was to slap the boy's face with one hand and to prod his side with the thumb on the other, the slaps and the thrusts alternating rhythmically. The heartless wretch was an abject coward. He was afraid of thunder, of rats, spiders, dogs, and, above all, of his wife, who would call him indecent names in our presence. I abhorred him, yet when he was this humiliated, I felt pity for him. His wife kept a stand on a neighboring street corner, where she sold cheap cakes and candy, and those of her husband's pupils, who were on her list of good customers, were sure of immunity from his spear. As I scarcely ever had a penny, he could safely beat me whenever he was so disposed. Chapter 4 The Cossack had a large family, and one of his daughters, a little girl named Sarah Lea was the heroine of my first romance. Sarah Lea had the misfortune to bear a striking resemblance to a sister of her father's, an offense which her mother never forgave her. She treated her as she might a stepdaughter. As for the Cossack, he may have cared for the child, but if he did, he dared not show it. Poor little Sarah Lea. She was the outcast of the family, just as I was the outcast of her father's school. She was about eleven years old, and I was somewhat younger. The similarity of our fates and of our self-pity drew us to each other. When her father beat me, I was conscious of her commiserating look, and when she was mistreated by her mother, she would cast appealing glances in my direction. 
Once, when the teacher punished me with special cruelty, her face twitched and she broke into a whimper, whereupon he gave her a kick, saying, Is it any business of yours? Thank God your own skin has not been peeled off. Once, during the lunch hour, when we were alone, Sara Leah and I, in a corner of the courtyard, she said, You are so strong, Davy. Nothing hurts you? Nothing at all. I could stand everything, I bragged. You could not, if I bit your finger. Go ahead, I said, with bravado, holding out my hand. She dug her teeth into one of my fingers. It hurt so that I involuntarily ground my own teeth, but I smiled. Does it not hurt you, Davy? she asked with a look of admiration. Not a bit. Go on. Bite as hard as you can. She did. The cruel thing. And like many an older heroine, she would not desist until she saw her lover's blood. It still doesn't hurt, does it? she asked, wiping away a red drop from her lips. I shook my head contemptuously. When you are a man, you will be strong as Samson the Strong. I was the strongest boy in her father's school. She knew that most of the other boys were afraid of me, but that didn't seem to interest her. At least, when I began to boast of it, she returned to my ability to stand punishment, as the pugilist would put it. One day, one of my schoolmates aroused her admiration by the way he played taps with his fist for a trumpet. I tried to imitate him, but failed grievously. The other boy laughed, and Sarale joined him. That was my first taste of the bitter cup called jealousy. I went home a lovelorn boy. I took to practicing taps. I was continually trumpeting. I kept at it so strenuously that my mother had many a quarrel with our roommates because of it. My efforts went for nothing, however. My rival, and with him my lady love, continued to sneer at my performance. I had only one teacher who never beat me, or any of the other boys. Whatever anger we provoked in him would spend itself in threats, and even these he often turned to a joke, in a peculiar vein of his own. If you don't behave, I'll cut you to pieces, he would say. I'll just cut you to tiny bits and put you into my pipe and you will go up in smoke. Or, I'll give you such a thrashing that you won't be able to sit down, stand up, or lie down. The only thing you'll be able to do is to fly to the devil. This teacher used me as a living advertisement for his school. He would take me from house to house, flaunting my recitations and interpretations. Very often, the passage which he thus made me read was a lesson I had studied under one of his predecessors, but I never gave him away. Every header had its king. As a rule, it was the richest boy in the school, but I was usually the power behind the throne. Once, one of these potentates, it was at the school of that kindly man, mimicked my mother hugging her pot of pea mush. If you do it again, I'll kill you, I said. If you lay a finger on me, he retorted, the teacher will kick you out. Your mother doesn't pay him anyhow. I flew at him. His majesty tearfully begged for mercy. Since then he was under my thumb and never omitted to share his ring-shaped rolls or apples with me. Often, when a boy ate something that was beyond my mother's means, a cookie or a slice of buttered white bread, I would eye him enviously till he complained that I made him choke. Then I would go on eyeing him until he bribed me off with a piece of the tidbit. If staring alone proved futile, I might try to bring him to terms by naming all sorts of loathsome objects. 
At this it frequently happened that the prosperous boy threw away his cookie from sheer disgust, whereupon I would be mean enough to pick it up and to eat it in triumph, calling him something equivalent to sissy. The compliments that were paid my brains were ample compensation for my mother's struggles. Sending me to work was out of the question. She was resolved to put me in a Talmudic seminary. I was the crown of her head, and she was going to make a fine Jew of me. Nor was she a rare exception in this respect, for there were hundreds of other poor families in our town who would starve themselves to keep their sons studying the word of God. Whenever one of the neighbors suggested that I be apprenticed to some artisan, she would flare up. On one occasion a suggestion of this kind led to a violent quarrel. One afternoon, when we happened to pass by a bookstore, she stopped me in front of the window and, pointing at some huge volumes of the Talmud, she said, This is the trade I am going to have you learn, and let our enemies grow green with envy. End of chapter 4 and book 1book two chapter one the rise of david levinsky this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the rise of david levinsky by abraham kahan book two enter satan chapter one the talmudic seminary or yeshiva in which my mother placed me was a celebrated old institution attracting students from many provinces like most yeshivas it was sustained by donations and instruction in it was free moreover out-of-town students found shelter under its roof sleeping on the benches or floors of the same rooms in which the lectures were delivered and studied during the day also, they were supplied with a pound of rye bread each for breakfast. As to the other meals, they were furnished by the various households of the Orthodox community. I understand that some school teachers in certain villages of New England get their board on the rotation plan, dining each day in the week with another family. This is exactly the way a poor Talmud student gets his sustenance in Russia, the system being called eating days. One hour a day was devoted to penmanship and the sorry smattering of Russian, the cost of tuition and writing materials being paid by a modern philanthropist. I was admitted to that seminary at the age of 13. As my home was in the city, I neither slept in the classroom nor ate days. The lectures lasted only two hours a day, but then there was plenty to do, studying them and reviewing previous work. This I did in an old house of prayer where many other boys and men of all ages pursued similar occupations. It was known as the preacher's synagogue and was famed for the large number of noted scholars who had passed their young days reading Talmud in it. The Talmud is a voluminous work of about twenty ponderous tomes. To read these books, to drink deep of their sacred wisdom, is accounted one of the greatest good deeds in the life of a Jew. It is, however, as much a source of intellectual interest as an act of piety. If it be true that our people represent a high percentage of mental vigor, the distinction is probably due, in some measure, to the extremely important part which Talmud studies have played in the spiritual life of the race. A Talmudic education was until recent years practically the only kind of education a Jewish boy of old-fashioned parents received. I spent seven years at it, 
not counting the several years of Talmud which I had had at the various headers. What is the Talmud? The bulk of it is taken up with debates of ancient rabbis. It is primarily concerned with questions of conscience, religious duty, and human sympathy, in short, with the relations between man and God, and those between man and man. But it practically contains a consideration of almost every topic under the sun, mostly with some verse of the Pentateuch for a pretext, all of which is analyzed and explained in the minutest and keenest fashion, discussions of abstruse subject being sometimes relieved by an anecdote or two, a bit of folklore, worldly wisdom, or small talk. Scattered through its numerous volumes are priceless gems of poetry, epigram, and storytelling. It is at once a fountain of religious inspiration and a brain sharpener. Can you fathom the sea? Neither can you fathom the depth of the Talmud, as we would put it. We were sure that the highest mathematics taught in the Gentile universities were child's play as compared to the Talmud. In the preacher's synagogue, then, I spent seven years of my youthful life. For hours and hours together I would sit at a gaunt reading desk, swaying to and fro over some huge volume, reading its ancient text and interpreting it in Yiddish. All this I did aloud in the peculiar Talmud sing-song, a trace of which still persists in my intonation, even when I talk cloaks and bank accounts and in English. The Talmud was being read there, in a hundred variations of the same sing-song, literally every minute of the year, except the hours of prayer. There were plenty of men to do it during the day and the evening, and at least ten men, a sacred number, to keep the holy word echoing through the night. The majority of them were simply scholarly businessmen who would drop in to read the sacred books for an hour or two, but there was a considerable number of such as made it the occupation of their life. These were supported either by the congregation or by their own wives who kept shops, stalls, inns, or peddled, while their husbands spent sixteen hours a day studying Talmud. One of these was a man named Reb, Rabbi, Sender, an insignificant, ungainly little figure of a man with a sad, childlike little face flanked by a pair of thick, heavy, dark brown side-locks that seemed to weigh him down. His wife kept a trimming store, or something of the sort, and their only child, a girl older than I, helped her attend to business as well as to keep house in the single-room apartment, which the family occupied in the rear of the little shop. As he invariably came to the synagogue for the morning prayer and never left it until after the evening service, his breakfasts and dinners were brought to the house of worship. His wife usually came with the meal herself. Waiting on one's husband and giving him strength to learn the law was a good deed. She was a large woman with an interesting dark face, and poor Reb Sender cut a sorry figure by her side. Men of his class are described as having no acquaintance with the face of a coin. All the money he usually handled was the penny or two which he needed to pay for his bath of a Friday afternoon. Occasionally he would earn three or four kopecks by participating in some special prayer for a sick person, for instance. These pennies he invariably gave away. Once he gave his muffler to a poor boy. His wife subsequently nagged him to death for it. The next morning he complained of her to one of the other scholars. 
"Still," he concluded, "if you want to serve God, you must be ready to suffer for it. A good deed that comes easy to you is like a donation which does not cost you anything." I made his acquaintance by asking him to help me out with an obscure passage. This he did with such simple alacrity and kindly modesty as to make me feel a chum of his. I warmed to him, and he reciprocated my feelings. He took me to his bosom. He often offered me to go over my lesson with me, and I accepted his services with gratitude. He spoke in a warm, mellow basso that had won my heart from the first. His sing-song lent peculiar charms to the pages that were read in a duet. As he read and interpreted the text, he would wave his snuff-box by way of punctuating and emphasizing his words, much as the conductor of an orchestra does his baton, now gently, insinuatingly, now with a passionate jerk, now with a sweeping majestic movement. One cannot read Talmud without gesticulating, and Reb Sender would scarcely have been able to gesticulate without his snuff-box. It was of tortoise shell, with a lozenge-shaped bit of silver in the center. It gradually became dear to me as part of his charming personality. Sometimes, when we were reading together, that glistening spot in the center of the lid would fascinate my eye so that I lost track of the subject in hand. He often hummed some liturgical melody of a well-known synagogue chanter. One afternoon he sang something to me with his snuff-box for a baton, and then asked me how I liked it. I composed it myself, he explained boastfully. I did not like the tune. In fact, I failed to make out any tune at all. But I was overflowing with a desire to please him, so I said with feigned enthusiasm, Did you really? Why, it's so beautiful, so sweet. Reb Sanders' face shone. After that, he often submitted his compositions to me, though he was too shy to sing them to older people. They were all supposed to be liturgical tunes, or at least some hop for the day of the rejoicing of the law. When I hailed the newly composed air with warm approval, he would show his satisfaction, either with shamefaced reserve or with childlike exuberance. If, on the other hand, I failed to conceal my indifference, he would grow morose, and it would be some time before I succeeded in coaxing him back to his usual good humor. Nor were his melodies the only things he confided to me. When I was still a mere boy, fourteen or fifteen years old, he would lay bare to me some of the most intimate secrets of his heart. You see, my wife thinks me a fool, he once complained to me. She thinks I don't see it. Do you understand, David? She looks up to me for my learning, but otherwise she thinks I have no sense. It hurts, you know. He was absolutely incapable of keeping a secret, or of saying or acting anything that did not come from the depths of his heart. He often talked to me of God and his throne, of the world to come, and of the eternal bliss of the righteous, quoting from a certain book of exhortations, and adding much from his own exalted imagination. And I would listen thrilling and make a silent vow to be good and to dedicate my life to the service of god study the word of god david dear he would say taking my hand into his there is no happiness like it what is wealth a dream of fools what is this world a mere curl of smoke in the wind to scatter only the other world has substance and reality. Only good deeds and holy learning have tangible worth. Beware of Satan, Davy. When he assails you, just say no. Turn your heart to steel and say no. 
Do you hear, my son? The anecdotes and sayings of the Talmud, its absurdities, no less than its gems of epigrammatic wisdom, were minds of poetry, philosophy, and science to him. He was a dreamer with a noble imagination, with a soul full of beauty. This unsophisticated, simple-hearted man, with the mind of an infant, was one of the most quick-witted, nimble-minded scholars in town. His great delight was to tackle some intricate maze of Talmudic reasoning. This he would do with ferocious zest, like a warrior attacking the enemy, flashing his tortoise snuff-box as if it were his sword. When away from his books, or when reading some of the fantastic tales in them, he was meek and gentle as a little bird. No sooner did he come across a fine bit of reasoning than he would impress me as a lion. On one occasion, after Rep. Sander got through a celebrated tangle with me, arousing my admiration by the ingenuity with which he discovered discrepancies and by the adroitness with which he explained them away, he said, I do enjoy reading with you. Sometimes, when I read by myself, I feel lonely. Anyhow, I love to have you around, David. If you went to study somewhere else, I should miss you very much. On another occasion, he said, You are like a son to me, Davy. Be good, be genuinely pious, for my sake, if for nothing else. Above all, don't be double-faced. Never say what you do not mean. Do not utter words of flattery. As I now analyze my reminiscences of him, I feel that he was a yearning, lonely man. He was in love with his wife, and in spite of her devotion to him, he was lovelorn. Poor Reb Sander, he was anything but a handsome man, while she was well-built and pretty. And so, it may be that she showed more reference for his learning and piety than love for his person. He was continually referring to her, apparently thirsting to discuss her demeanor toward him. The Lord of the universe has been exceptionally good to me, he once said to me. May I not forfeit his kindness for my sins? He gives me health and my daily bread, and I have a worthy woman for a wife. Indeed, she is a woman of rare merits, so clever, so efficient, and so good. She nags me but seldom, very seldom. He paused to take snuff, and then remained silent, apparently hesitating to come to the point. Finally, he said, In fact, she is so wise, I sometimes wish I could read her thoughts. I should give anything to have a glimpse into her heart. She has so little to say to me. She thinks I am a fool. There is a sore in here, pointing at his heart. We have been married over twenty-two years, and yet, would you believe it, I still feel shy in her presence, as if we were brought together for the first time by a matchmaker, don't you know? But then you are too young to understand these things. Nor indeed ought I to talk to you about them, for you are only a child. But I cannot help. If I did not unburden my mind once in a while, I might not be able to stand it. That afternoon he composed what he called a very sad tune and hummed it to me. I failed to make out the tune, but I could feel its sadness. I loved him passionately. As for the other men of the synagogue, if they did not share my ardent affection for him, they all, with one exception, liked him. The exception was a middle-aged little Talmudist with a tough little beard who held everybody in terror by his violent temper and pugnacity. He was a pious man, but his piety never manifested itself with such genuine fervor as when he exposed the impiety of others. He was forever picking quarrels, 
forever challenging people to debate with him, forever offering to show that their interpretation of this passage or that was all wrong. The sound of his acrimonious voice or venomous laughter grated on Reb Sender's nerves, but he bore him absolutely no ill will. Nor did he ever utter a word of condemnation concerning a certain other scholar, an inveterate tale-bearer and gossip-monger, though a good-natured fellow, who not infrequently sought to embroil him with some of his warmest friends. One Talmudist, a corpulent old man, whose seat was next to Reb Sanders, was more inclined to chat than to study. Now and again he would break in upon my friend's reading with some piece of gossip, and the piteous air with which Reb Sander would listen to him, casting yearning glasses at his book as he did so, was as touching as it was amusing. My mother usually brought my dinner into the synagogue. She would make her entrance softly, so as to take me by surprise, while I was absorbed in my studies. It did her heart good to see me read the holy book. As a result, I was never so diligent as I was at the hour when I expected her arrival with the dinner pot. Very often I discovered her tiptoeing in or standing at a distance and watching me admiringly. Then I would take to singing and swaying to and fro with great gusto. She often encountered Rep. Sander's wife at the synagogue. They did not take to each other. On one occasion my mother found Rep. Sander's daughter at the house of prayer. Having her father's figure and features, the girl was anything but prepossessing. My mother surveyed her from head to foot. That evening when I was eating my supper at home, my mother said, Look here, Davy, I want you to understand that Rep. Sander's wife is up to some scheme about you. She wants you to marry that monkey of hers. That's what she is after. I was not quite fifteen. Leave me alone, I retorted, coloring. Never mind blushing. It is she who tells the Sander to be so good to you. The foxy thing. She thinks I don't see through her. That scarecrow of a girl is old enough to be your mother, and she has not a penny to her marriage portion, either. A fine match for a boy like you? Why, you can get the best girl in town. She said it aloud, by way of flaunting my future before our roommates. Two of the three families who shared the room with us, by the way, were the same as when I was a little boy. Moving was a rare event in the life of the average Antomir family. Red Esther was still there. She was one of those who heard my mother's boastful warning to me. She grinned. After a little, as I was crossing the room, she sang out with a giggle, Bridegroom! I'll break your bones, I returned, pausing. She stuck out her tongue at me. I still hated her, but somehow she did not seem to be the same as she had been before. The new lines that were developing in her growing little figure, and, more particularly, her own consciousness of them, were not lost upon me. A new element was stealing into my rancor for her, a feeling of forbidden curiosity. At night... When I lay in bed, before falling asleep, I would be alive to the fact that she was sleeping in the same room, only a few feet from me. Sometimes I would conjure up the days of our childhood when Red Aster caused me to sin against my will, whereupon I would try to imagine the same scenes, but with the present fifteen-year-old Esther in place of the five-year-old one of yore. The world girl had acquired a novel sound to me, one full of disquieting charm. The same was true of such words as sister, niece, or bride, but not of woman. 
Somehow sisters and nieces were all young girls, whereas a woman belonged to the realm of middle-aged humanity, not to my world. Naftali went to the same seminary. He was two grades ahead of me. He eight days for his father had died and his mother had married a man who refused to support him. He was my great chum at the seminary. The students called him Tidy Naftali, or simply the Tidy One. He was a slender, trim lad, his curly brown hair and his nearsighted eyes emphasizing his Talmudic appearance. He was the cleanliest and neatest boy at the yeshiva. These often aroused sardonic witticism from some of the other students. Scrupulous tidiness was so uncommon a virtue among the poorer classes of Antomer that the painstaking care he bestowed upon his person and everything with which he came in contact struck many of the boys as a manifestation of girl-like squeamishness. As for me, it only added to my admiration to him. His conscience seemed to be as clean as his fingernails. He wrote a beautiful hand. He could draw and carve, and he was a good singer. His interpretations were as clear-cut as his handwriting. He seemed to be a jack of all trades and master of all. I admired and envied him. His reticence piqued me and intensified his power over me. I strove to emulate his cleanliness, his graceful Talmud gestures, and his handwriting. At one period I spent many hours a day practicing calligraphy with some of his lines for a model. Oh, I shall never be able to write like you, I once said to him in despair. Let's swap then, he replied gaily. Give me your mind for learning, and I shall let you have my handwriting. Pshaw, yours is a better mind than mine, too. No, it is not, he returned, and assumed his reading. Besides, you are ahead of me in piety and conduct. He shook his head deprecatingly and went on reading. He was one of the noted men of diligence at the seminary. With his near-sighted eyes close to the book, he would read all day and far into the night in ringing, ardent sing-songs that I thought fascinating. The other reticent Talmudists I knew usually read in an undertone, humming their recitatives quietly. He seldom did. Sparing as he was on his voice in conversation, he would use it extravagantly when intoning his Talmud. It is with a peculiar sense of duality one reads this ancient work. While your mind is absorbed in the meaning of the words you utter, the melody in which you utter them tells your heart a tale of its own. You live in two distinct worlds at once. Naphtali had little to say to other people, but he seemed to have much to say to himself. His sing-songs were full of meaning, of passion, of beauty. Quite often, he would sing himself hoarse. Regularly, every Thursday night, he and I had our vigil at the preacher's synagogue, where many other young men would gather for the same purpose. We would sit up reading side by side until the worshippers came to morning service. To spend the whole night by his side was one of the joys of my existence in those days. Reb Sender was somewhat jealous of him. Soon after graduation, Naftali left Antomir for a town in which lived some of his relatives. I missed him as I would a sweetheart. End of chapter 1 Read by Mark Chulsky, Massachusetts Book 2, Chapter 2 The Rise of David Levinsky this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Kahan. Book 2. Enter Satan. Chapter 2. I was nearly 16. I had graduated from the seminary. 
and was pursuing my studies at the preacher's synagogue exclusively as an independent scholar. I was overborne with a sense of my dignity and freedom. I seemed to have suddenly grown much taller. If I caught myself walking fast or indulging in some boyish prank, I would check myself, saying in my heart, You must not forget that you are an independent scholar. You are a boy no longer. I was free to loaf, but I worked harder than ever. I was either in an exalted state of mind or pining away under a spell of yearning and melancholy, of causeless, meaningless melancholy. My Talmudic sing-song reflected my moods. Sometimes it was a spirited recitative ringing with cheery self-consciousness and the joy of being a lad of sixteen. At other times it was a solemn song, aglow with devotional ecstasy. When I happened to be dejected in the commonplace sense of the world, it was a listless murmur, doleful or sullen. But then the very reading of the Talmud was apt to dispel my gloom my voice would gradually rise and ring out, vibrating with intellectual passion. The intonations of the other scholars, too, echoed the voices of their hearts, some of them sonorous with religious bliss, others sad, still others happy-go-lucky. Although absorbed in my book, I would have a vague consciousness of the connection between the various sing-songs and their respective performers. I would be aware that the bass voice, with the flourishes in front of me, belonged to the stuttering widower from Vitebsk, that the squeaky, jerky intonation to the right came from the red-headed fellow whom I loathed for his thick lips, or that the sweet, unassertive cadences that came floating from the east wall were being uttered by Reb Rachmiel, the man of Akumen, whose father-in-law had made a fortune as a war contractor in the late conflict with Turkey. All these voices blended in a symphonic source of inspiration for me. It was divine music in more senses than one. The ancient rabbis of the Talmud, the Tanaim of the earlier period, and the Amoraim of later generations, were living men. I could almost see them, each of them individualized in my mind by some of his sayings, by his manner in debate, by some particular word he used, or by some particular incident in which he figured. I pictured their faces, their beards, their voices. Some of them had won a warmer corner in my heart than others, but they were all superior human beings, godly, unearthly, denizens of a world that had been ages ago and would come back in the remote future when Messiah should make his appearance. Added to the mystery of that world was the mystery of my own sing-song. Who is there? I seemed to be wondering my tune of recitative sounding like the voice of some other fellow. It was as if somebody were hidden within me. What did he look like? If you study the Talmud, you please God even more than you do by praying or fasting. As you sit reading the great folio, he looks down from heaven upon you. Sometimes I seemed to feel his gaze shining down upon me as though casting a halo over my head. My relations with God were of a personal and of a rather familiar character. He was interested in everything I did or said. He watched my every move or thought. He was always in heaven, yet somehow he was always near me, and I often spoke to him as I might to Reb Sender. If I caught myself slurring over some of my prayers, or speaking ill of another boy, or telling a falsehood, I would say to him audibly, Oh, forgive me once more, 
You know that I want to be good. I will be good. I know I will. Sometimes I would continue to plead in this manner till I broke into sobs. At other times, as I read my Talmud, conscious of his approval of me, tears of bliss would come into my eyes. I loved him as one does a woman. Often, while saying my prayers, I would fall into a veritable delirium of religious infatuation. Sometimes this fit of happiness and yearning would seize me as I walked in the street. O oh, master of the world, master of the universe, I love you so, I would sigh. Oh, how I love you. I also had talks with the evil spirit, or Satan. He, too, was always near me, but he was always trying to get me into trouble. You won't catch me again, scoundrel you, I would assure him with sneers and leers, or get away from me, heartless mischief-maker you. You are wasting your time, I can tell you that. My bursts of piety usually lasted a week or two. Then there was apt to set in a period of apathy, which was sure to be replaced by days of penance and a new access of spiritual fervor. One day, as Reb Sander and I were reading a page together, a very pretty girl entered the synagogue. She came to have a letter written for her by one of the scholars. I continued to read aloud, but I did so absently now, trailing along after my companion. My mind was upon the girl, and I was casting furtive glances. Reb Sander paused with evident annoyance. What are you looking at, David? He said with a tug at my arm. Shame. You are yielding to Satan. I colored. He was too deeply interested in the Talmudic argument under consideration to say more on the matter at this minute. But he returned to it as soon as we had reached the end of the section. He spoke earnestly, with fatherly concern. You are growing, David. You are a boy no longer. You are getting to be a man. This is just the time when one should be on his guard against Satan. I sat looking down my brain in a daze of embarrassment. Remember, David, he who looks even at the little finger of a woman is as guilty as though he looked at a woman that is wholly naked. He quoted the Talmudic maxim in a tone of passionate sternness, beating the desk with his snuff-box at each word. As to his own conduct, he was one of three or four men at the synagogue of whom it was said that they never looked at women, and, to a very considerable extent, his reputation was not unjustified. You must never tire fighting Satan, David. He proceeded, fight him with might and main. As I listened, I was tingling with a mute wall to be good, yet at the same time the vision of a woman that is wholly naked was vividly before me. He caused me to bring a certain ancient work, one not included in the Talmud in which he made me read the following. Rabbi Messiah, the son of Hovosh, had never set eyes on a woman. Therefore, when he was at the synagogue studying the law, his visage would shine as the sun, and its features would be the features of an angel. One day, as he thus sat reading, Satan chanced to pass by, and, in a fit of jealousy, Satan said, can it really be that this man has never sinned? He is a man of spotless purity, answered God. Just grant me the liberty, Satan urged, and I will lead him to sin. 
You will never succeed. Let me try. Proceed. Satan then appeared in the guise of the most beautiful woman in the world, the one the like of whom had not been born since the days of Naomi, the sister of Tuvalkain, the woman who had led angels astray. When Rabbi Messiah espied her, he faced about. So Satan, still in the disguise of a beautiful woman, took up a position on the left side of him, and when he turned away once more he walked over to the right side again. Finally, Rabbi Messiah had nails and fire brought him and gouged out his own eyes. At this God called for angel Raphael and bade him cure the righteous man. Presently, Raphael came back with the report that Rabbi Messiah would not be cured lest he should again be tempted to look at pretty women. Go tell him in my name that he shall never be tempted again, said God. And so the holy man regained his eyesight and was never molested by Satan again. The painful image of poor Rabbi Messiah gouging out his eyes supplanted the nude figure of the previous quotation in my mind. Rep. Sander pursued his exhortative talk. He dwelt on the duties of man to man. If a man is tongue-tied, don't laugh at him, but rather feel pity for him as you would for a man with broken legs nor should you hate a man who has a weakness for telling falsehoods. This, too, is an affliction, like stuttering or being lame. Say to yourself, poor fellow, he is given to lying. Above all, you must fight conceit, envy, and every kind of ill-feeling in your heart. Remember, the sum and substance of all learning lies in the words, Love thy neighbor as thyself. Another thing, remember that it's not enough to abstain from lying by word of mouth, for the worst lies are often conveyed by a false look, smile, or act. Be genuinely truthful then, and if you feel that you are good, don't be too proud of it. Be modest, humble simple control your anger he worked me up to a veritable frenzy of penitence i will i will i said tremulously and if i ever catch myself looking at a woman again i will gouge out my eyes like rabbi messiah Shh! don't say that my son about a quarter of an hour later as i sat reading by myself I suddenly sprang to my feet and walked over to Rep. Sender. "'You are so dear to me,' I gasped out. "'You are a man of perfect righteousness. I love you so. I should jump into fire or into water for your sake.' "'Shh,' he said, taking me gently by the hand and pressing me down into a seat by his side. "'You are a good boy. As to my being a man of perfect righteousness, alas!' I am far from being one. We are all sinful. Come, let us read another page together. Satan kept me rather busy these days. It was not an easy task to keep one's eyes off the girls who came to the preacher's synagogue, and when none was around, I would be apt to think of one. I would even picture myself touching a feminine cheek with the tip of my finger. Then my heart would sink in despair, and I would hurl curses at Satan. Eighty black years on you, vile wretch you! I would whisper, gnashing my teeth, and fall to reading with ferocious zeal. In the relations between men and women, it's largely cause of forbidden fruit and the mystery of distance. The great barrier that religion, law, and convention have laced between the sexes added to the joys and poetry of love, but it's responsible also for much of the suffering, degradation, and crime that spring from it. In my case, his barrier was of special magnitude. 
dancing with a girl or even taking one out for a walk was out of the question, nor was the injunction confined to men who devoted themselves to the study of holy books. It was the rule of ordinary decency for any Jew except one who lived like a Gentile, that is, like a person of modern culture. Indeed, there were scores of towns in the vicinity of Antomer where one could not take a walk even with one's own wife without incurring universal condemnation. There was a dancing school or two in Antomer, but they were attended by young mechanics of the coarser type. To be sure, there were plenty of young Jews in our town who did live like Gentiles, who called the girls of their acquaintance young ladies, took off their hats to them, took them out for a walk in the public park and danced with them just like the nobles or the army officers of my birthplace. But then these fellows spoke Russian instead of Yiddish, and altogether they belonged to a world far removed from mine. Many of these modern young Jews went to high school and wore pretty uniforms with silver-plated buttons and silver lace. To me they were apostates, sinners in Israel, and yet I could not think of them without a lurking feeling of envy. The Gentile books they studied and their social relations with girls who were dressed like young noble women piqued my keenest curiosity and made me feel small and wretched. The Orthodox Jewish faith practically excludes women from religious life. Attending divine service is not obligatory for her and those of the sex who wish to do so are allowed to follow the devotions not in the synagogue proper, but through little windows or peepholes in the wall of an adjoining room. In the eye of the spiritual law that governed my life, women were intended for two purposes only, for the continuation of the human species and to serve as an instrument in the hands of Satan for tempting the stronger sex to sin. Marriage was simply a duty imposed by the Bible, Love? So far as it meant attraction between two persons of the opposite sex who were not man and wife, there was no such word in my native tongue. One loved one's wife, mother, daughter, or sister. To be in love with a girl who was an utter stranger to you was something unseemly, something which only Gentiles or modern Jews might indulge in. But at present all this merely deepened the bewitching mystery of the forbidden sex in my young blood. And Satan, wide awake and sharp-eyed as ever, was not slow to perceive the change that had come over me and made the most of it. There was no such thing as athletics or outdoor sports in my world. The only physical exercise known to us was the swinging like a pendulum in front of your reading desk from nine in the morning to bedtime every day, and an all-night vigil every Thursday in addition. Even the most innocent frolic among the boys was suppressed as an offense to good Judaism, all of which tended to deepen the mystery of girlhood and to increase the chances of Satan. I must explain that although women could not attend divine service except through a peephole, they were free to visit the house of worship on all sorts of other errands. So some of them would come with food for the scholars, others with candles for the chandeliers, while still others wanted letters read or written. One of the several rabbis of the town was in the habit of spending his evenings reading Talmud in the preacher's synagogue, so housewives of the neighborhood or their daughters would bring some spoon pot or chicken to have them passed upon according to the dietary laws of moses and the talmud i would scrutinize the faces and figures of these girls i would draw comparisons make guesses as to whether they were engaged to be married 
I did not have to speculate upon whether they were already married, because a young matron who would visit our synagogue was sure to have her hair covered with a wig. It became one of my pastimes to make forecasts as to the looks of the next young woman to call at the synagogue, whether she would be pretty or homely, tall or short, fair or dark, plump or spare. I was interested in their eyes, but somehow I was still more interested in their mouths. Some mouths would set my blood on fire. I would invent all sorts of romantic episodes with myself as the hero. I would portray my engagement to some of the pretty girls I had seen, our wedding, and, above all, our married life. The worst of it was that these images often visited my brain while I was reading the holy book. Satan would choose such moments of all others, because in this manner he would involve me in two great sins at once. For in addition to the wickedness of indulging in salacious thoughts, there was the offense of desecrating the holy book by them. Rip Sander's daughter was about to be married to a tradesman of Talmudic education. I did not care for her in the least, yet her approaching wedding aroused a lively interest in me. Red Esther had gone out to service. She came home but seldom, and when she did, we scarcely ever talked to each other. The coarse brightness of her complexion and the harsh femininity of her laughter repelled me. I do hate her, I once said to myself as I heard that laugh of hers. And yet you would not mind kissing her, would you, now? A voice retorted. I had to own that I would not. And then I cudgeled my brains over the amazing discrepancy of the thing. Kissing meant being fond of one. I enjoyed kissing my mother, for instance. Now I certainly was not fond of Esther. I was sure that I hated her. Why, then, was I impelled to kiss her? How could I hate and be fond of her at once? I went on, reasoning it out, Talmud fashion, till I arrived at the conclusion that there were two kinds of kisses, the kiss of affection and the kiss of Satan. I submitted it as a discovery to some of the other young Talmudists, but they scouted it as a truism. A majority of us were modest of speech and conduct, but there were some who were not. End of chapter 2 Book 2, Chapter 3 The Rise of David Levinsky This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Kahan Book 2 Enter Devil Chapter 3 When I was a little over 18, the number of steady readers at the old synagogue was increased by the advent of a youth from the Polish provinces. His appearance produced something of a sensation, for in addition to being the son of a rich merchant and the prospective son-in-law of a celebrated rabbi, he was the possessor of a truly phenomenal memory. He was well versed in the entire Talmud and could recite by heart about five hundred leaves or one thousand pages of it. He was generally called the Paul. He was tall and supple, fair complexioned and well groomed, with a suggestion of self satisfaction and aloofness in the very sinuosity of his figure. His velvet skull cap, which was always pushed back on his head, exposed to a view a forelock of golden hair. His long skirted, well fitting coat was of the richest broadcloth I had ever seen. He wore a watch and chain that were said to be worth a small fortune. I hated him. He was repugnant to me for his Polish accent, for his good clothes, for his well-fed face, 
for his haughty manner, for the servile attention that was showered on him, and, above all, for his extraordinary memory. I had always been under the impression that the boys of well-to-do parents were stupid. Brains did not seem to be in their line. That this young man, who was so well supplied with world's goods, should possess a wonderful mind as well, jarred on me as an injustice to us poor boys. I would seek comfort in the reflection that the essence of scholarship lay in profundity of acumen rather than in the ability to rattle off pages like so many psalms. Yet those five hundred leaves of his gave me no peace. Five hundred! The figure haunted me. Finally I set myself the task of memorizing five hundred leaves. It was a gigantic undertaking, although my memory was rather above the average. I worked with unflagging assiduity for weeks and weeks. Nobody was to know of my purpose until it had been achieved. I worked so hard and was so absorbed in my task that my interest in girls lost much of its usual acuteness. At times I had a sense of my own holiness. When I walked through the streets, on my way to or from the synagogue, I kept reciting some of the pages I had mastered. While in bed for the night, I whispered myself to sleep reciting Talmud. When I ate, some bit of Talmud was apt to be running through my mind. If there was a hitch and I could not go on, my heart would sink within me. I would stop eating and make an effort to recall the passage. It was inevitable that the new character of my studies should sooner or later attract Reb Sender's attention. My secret hung like a veil between us. He was jealous of it. Ultimately he questioned me, beseechingly, and I was forced to make a clean breast of it. Reb Sender beamed. The veil was withdrawn. Presently his face fell again. What I don't like about it is your envy of the pole, he said gravely. Don't take it ill, my son, but I'm afraid you are envious and begrudging. Fight it, Davy. Give up studying by heart. It's not with a pure motive you are doing it. Your studies are poisoned with hatred and malice. Do you want to gladden my heart, Davy? I do. I will. What do you mean? Just step up to the pole and beg his pardon for the evil thoughts you have harbored about him. A minute later, I stood in front of my hated rival, thrilling with the ecstasy of penitence. I have sinned against you. Forgive me, I said with downcast eyes. The pole was puzzled. I envied you, I explained. I could not bear to hear everybody speak of the five hundred leaves you know by heart, so I wanted to show you that I could learn by heart just as much, if not more. A suggestion of a sneer flitted across his well-fed face. It stung me as if it were some loathsome insect. His golden forelock exasperated me. And I could do it, too, I snapped. I have learned more than fifty leaves already. It is not so much of a trick as I thought it was. Is it not? The Paul said with a full groan sneer. You need not be so stuck up, anyhow, I shot back and turned away. Before I had reached the Reb Sender, who had been watching us, I rushed back to the pole. I just want to say this, I began in a towering rage. With all your boasted memory, you would be glad to change brains with me. His shoulders shook with soundless mirth. Laugh away, but let Reb Sender examine both of us. Let him select a passage and see who of us can delve deeper into it, you or I. 
memory alone is nothing. Isn't it? Then why are you green with envy of me? And once more he burst into a laugh with a graceful jerk of his head which set my blood on fire. You are a pampered idiot. You are green with envy. I'll break every bone in you. We flew at each other, but Rap Sander and two other scholars tore us apart. Shame, the Talmudists cried, shrugging their shoulders in disgust. Just like Gentiles, someone commented. It's an outrage to have the holy place desecrated in this manner. What has got into you? Rep. Sander said to me as he led me back to my desk. I resumed studying by heart with more energy than ever. That's all right. I thought to myself, I'll have that silk stocking of a fellow lick the dust of my shoes. I now took special measures to guard my secret even from Reb Sender. One of these was to take a book home and to work there, staying away from synagogue as often as I could invent a plausible pretext. I was lying right and left. Satan chuckled in my face, but I did not care. I promised myself to settle my accounts with the uppermost later on. The only thing that mattered now was to beat the ball. The sight of me learning the word of God so diligently was a source of indescribable joy to my mother. She struggled to suppress her feeling, but from time to time a sigh would escape her, as though the rush of happiness was too much for her heart. Alas! This happiness of her was not to last much longer. End of chapter 3, end of book 2book three chapter one the rise of david levinsky this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the rise of david levinsky by abraham kahan book three i lose my mother chapter one it was purim the Feast of Esther. Our schoolboys were celebrating the downfall of Haman, and they were doing it in the same warlike fashion in which American boys celebrate their forefathers' defiance of George the Third. The synagogues roared with the booming of firecrackers, the report of toy pistols, the whir-whir of Purim rattles. It was four weeks to the great eight-day festival of Passover, and my mother went to work in a bakery of unleavened bread. She toiled from eighteen to twenty hours a day, so that she often dozed off over her rolling pin from sheer exhaustion. But then she earned far more than usual. Including tips from customers, the baker merrily acted as a contractor for the families whose flour he transformed into flat, round, tasteless Passover cakes or matzos. She saved up during the period a little over twenty rubles. With a part of the sum she ordered a new coat for me and bought me a new cap. I remember that coat very well. It was of a dark cotton stuff neat at the waist and with absurdly long skirts, of course. The Jewish Passover often concurs with the Christian Easter. This was the case in the year in question. One afternoon, it was the seventh day of our festival, I chanced to be crossing the horse market. As it was not market day, it was deserted save for groups of young Gentiles, civilians and soldiers, who were rolling brightly colored Easter eggs over the ground. My new long-skirted coat and sidelocks provoked their mirth until one of them hit me a savage blow in the face, splitting my lower lip. Another rowdy snatched off my new cap, just because our people considered it a sin to go bareheaded. 
and as i made my way bleeding with one hand to my lip and the other over my bare head the company sent a shower of broken eggs and a chorus of jeers after me it was only a short distance from abner's court when i entered our basement and faced my mother she stared at me for a moment as though dumbfounded and then slapping her hands together she sobbed why is me darkness is me what has happened to you when she had heard my story she stood silent a while looking aghast and then left the house i am going to kill him i am just going to kill him she said in measured accents which still ring in my ears the bookbinder's wife the retired soldier and i ran after her imploring her not to risk her life on such a foolhardy errand but she took no heed of us foolish woman you don't even know who did it urged the soldier i'll find out she answered the bookbinder's wife seized her by an arm but she shook her off i pleaded with her with tears in my eyes go back she said to me trying to be gentle while her eyes were lit with an ominous look these were the last words i ever heard her utter fifteen minutes later she was carried into our basement unconscious her face was bruised and swollen and the back of her head was broken she died the same evening i have never been able to learn the ghastly details of her death the police and an examining magistrate were said to be investigating the case but nothing came of it there was no lack of excitement among the jews of antomer the funeral was expected to draw a vast crowd but the epidemic of anti-jewish atrocities of eighteen hundred eighty one and eighty two were fresh in one's mind so word was passed round not to irritate the gentiles the younger and modern element in town took exception to this timidity they insisted upon a demonstrative funeral they were organizing for self-defense in case the procession was interfered with but the council of older people prevailed as a consequence the number of mourners following the hearse was even smaller than it would have been if my mother had died a natural death and the few who did take part in the sad procession were unusually silent a jewish funeral without a chorus of sobbing women was inconceivable in antomer indeed a pious matron who happens to come across such a scene will join in the weeping whether she had ever heard of the deceased or not on this occasion however sobs were conspicuous by their absence shh shh none of you wailing an old man kept admonishing the women i spent this seven days of mourning in our basement where i received visits from neighbors from the families of my two distant relatives from reb sender and other talmudists of my synagogue among these was the pole this time my rival begged my forgiveness i granted it of course but i felt that we never could like each other there was a great wave of sympathy for me offers of assistance came pouring in in all sorts of forms had there been a yiddish newspaper in town and such things as public meetings the outburst might have crystallized into what to me would have been a great fortune as it was public interest in me died before anything tangible was done still there were several prosperous families of the old-fashioned class each of which wanted to provide me with excellent board but then rep sander's wife in a fit of compassion and carried away by the prevailing spirit of the moment claimed the sole right to feed me i'll take his mother's place she said whatever the upper one gives us will be enough for him too her husband was happy while i lacked the courage to overrule them 
As to lodgings, it was deemed most natural that I should sleep in some house of worship, as thousands of Talmud students did in Antomer and other towns. To put up with a synagogue bench for a bed and to eat days was even regarded as a desirable part of a young man's Talmud education. And so I selected a pew in the preacher's synagogue for my bed. I was better off than some others who lived in houses of God, for I had some of my mother's bedding, while they mostly had to sleep on hay pillows with a coat for a blanket. It was not until I found myself lying on this improvised bed that I realized the full extent of my calamity. During the first seven days of mourning, I had been aware, of course, that something appalling had befallen me but I had scarcely experienced anything like keen anguish. I had been in an excited, hazy state of mind, more conscious of being the central figure of a great sensation than of my loss. As I went to bed on the synagogue bench, however, instead of in my old bunk at what had been my home, the fact that my mother was dead and would never be alive again smote me with crushing violence. It was as though I had just discovered it. I shall never forget that terrible night. At the end of the first thirty days of mourning I visited mother's grave. Mama! Mama! I shrieked, throwing myself upon the mound in a wild paroxysm of grief. The dinners which Rep. Sender's wife brought to the synagogue for her husband and myself were never quite enough for two and for supper, which he had at home, she would bring me some bread and cheese or herring. Poor Rep. Sender could not look me in the face. The situation grew more awkward every day. It was long before his wife began to drop hints that I was hard to please, that she did far more than she could afford for me, and that I was an ingrate. The upshot was that she allowed me to accept days from other families. But the well-to-do people had by now forgotten my existence, and the housewives, who were still vying with one another in offering me meals, were mostly of the poorer class. These strove to make me feel at home at their houses, and yet, in some cases at least, as I ate, I was aware of being watched lest I should consume too much bread. As a consequence, I often went away half-hungry all of which quickened my self-pity and the agony of my yearnings for mother. I grew extremely sensitive and more quarrelsome than I am naturally. I quarreled with one of my relatives, a woman, and rejected the day which I had had in her house, and shortly after abandoned one of my other days. Reb Sander kept tab of my missing days, and tried to make up for them by sharing his dinner with me. His wife, however, who usually waited for the dishes and so was present while I ate, was anything but an encouraging witness of her husband's hospitality. The food would stick in my throat under her glances. I was repeatedly impelled abruptly to leave the meal, but refrained from doing so for Reb Sander's sake. I obtained two new days. One of these I soon forfeited, having been caught stealing a hunk of bread, but I kept the matter from Reb Sender. To conceal the truth from him, I would spend the dinner hour in the street or in a little synagogue in another section of the city. Tidy Naftali had recently returned to Antomer, and this house of worship was his home now. His vocal cords had been ruined by incessantly reading Talmud at the top of his lungs. He now spoke or read in a low, hoarse voice. He still spent most of his time at a reading desk, but he had to content himself with whispering. I found a new day, but lost three of my old ones. Naftali had as little to eat as I, yet he scarcely ever left his books. One late afternoon... I sat by his side while he was reading in a spiritless whisper. Neither of us had lunched that day, 
His curly head was propped upon his arm, his near-sighted eyes closed to the book. He never stirred. He was too faint to sway his body or to gesticulate. I was musing warily, and it seemed as though my hunger was a living thing and was taking part in my thoughts. Do you know, Naphtali, I said, it is pleasant even to famish in company. If I were alone, it would be harder to stand it. The misery of the many is a consolation. He made no answer. Minutes passed. Presently he turned from his desk. Do you really think there is a God? He asked irrelevantly. I stared. Don't be shocked. It is all bosh. And he fell to swaying over his book. I was dumbfounded. Why do you keep reading Talmud, then? I asked, looking aghast. Because I am a fool. He returned going on with his reading. A minute later he added, But you are a bigger one. I was hurt and horrified. I tried to argue, but he went on murmuring, his eyes on the folio before him. Finally I snapped. You are a horrid atheist and a sinner in Israel. You are desecrating the holy place. And I rushed from the little synagogue. His shocking whisper, do you really think there is a God? Haunted me all that afternoon and evening. He appeared like another man to me. I was burning to see him again and to smash his atheism to prove to him that there was a God. But as I made a mental rehearsal of my argument, I realized that I had nothing clear or definite to put forth. So I cursed Naphtali for an apostate registered a vow to shun him, and was looking forward to the following day when I should go to see him again. My interest in the matter was not keen, however, and soon it died down altogether. Nothing really interested me except the fact that I had not enough to eat, that mother was no more, and I was all alone in the world. The shock of the catastrophe had produced a striking effect on me. My incessant broodings and the corroding sense of my great irreparable loss and of my desolation had made a nerveless, listless wreck of me, a mere shade of, of my former self. I was incapable of sustained thinking. My communions with God were quite rare now nor did he take as much interest in my studies as he used to. Instead of the divine presence shining down on me while I read, the face of my martyred mother would loom before me. Once or twice in my hungry rambles I visited Abner's court and let my heart be racked by the sight of what had once been our home, mother's and mine. I said prayers for her three times a day with great devotion, with a deep yearning, but this piety was powerless to restore me to my former feeling for the Talmud. I distinctly recall how I would shut my eyes and vision my mother looking at me from her grave, her heart contracted with anguish and pity for her famished orphan. It was an excruciating vision, yet I found comfort in it. I would mutely complain of the world to her. It would give me satisfaction to denounce the whole town to her. Ah, I have got you, I seem to say to the people of Antomir. The ghost of my mother and the whole other world see you in all your heartlessness. You can't wriggle out of it. This was my revenge. I reveled in it. But nothing daunted. The people of Antomir would go about their business as usual, and my heart would sink with a sense of my helplessness. I was restless. I coveted diversion, company, and I saw a good deal of Naphtali. As for his free thought, it soon, after we had two mild quarrels over it, began to bore me. It appeared that the huge tomes of the Talmud were not the only books he read these days. 
he spent much time clandestinely on little books written in the holy tongue on any but holy topics they were taking up with such things as modern science poetry fiction and above all criticism of our faith he made some attempts to lure me into an interest in these books but without avail the only thing connected with them that appealed to me were the anecdotes that naphtali would tell me in his laconic way concerning their authors i scarcely ever listened to these stories without invoking imprecations upon the infidels but i enjoyed them all the same they were mostly concerned with their apostasy but there were many that were not some of these or rather the fact that i had first heard them from naphtali in my youth were destined to have a peculiar bearing on an important event in my life on something that occurred many years later when i was already a prosperous merchant in new york they were about dr rachelis a famous hebrew writer who practiced medicine in odessa and his son-in-law a poet named abraham tefkin dr rachelis's daughter was a celebrated beauty and the poet's courtship of her had been in the form of a long series of passionate letters addressed not to his lady love but to her father this love story made a strong impression on me the figures of the beautiful girl and of the enamored young poet as i pictured them were vivid in my mind did he write of his love in those letters i demanded shyly he did not write of onions did he naphtali retorted after a little i asked but how could she read those letters she certainly does not read holy tongue go ask her you are a funny fellow did tefkin get the girl he did and they have been married for many years why did you wonder if you mightn't have a chance you are impossible naphtali he smiled end of chapter one book three chapter two the rise of david levinsky this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the rise of david levinsky by abraham kahan book three i lose my mother chapter two one afternoon naphtali called me at the preacher's synagogue have you got all your days he asked in his whisper why he had discovered a treasure a pious rich elderly woman whose latest hobby was to care for at least eighteen poor talmudists eighteen being the numerical value of the letters composing the hebrew word for life her name was shifra minsker she belonged to one of the oldest families in antomer and her husband was equally well born her religious zeal was of recent origin in fact and even now she wore her hair gentile fashion it was a great sin but she had never worn a wig in her life and putting on one now seemed to be out of the question this hair of hers was of a dark brown hue threaded with silver and it grew in a tousled abundance of unruly wisps that seemed to be symbolic of her harum scarum character she was as pugnacious as she was charitable and as quick to make up a quarrel as to pick one her husband michael minsker was a worldly man with only a smattering of talmud and their younger children were being educated at the russian schools but they all humored her newly adopted old-fashioned ways to a certain extent at least while she tolerated their gentile ones as she did her own uncovered hair relegating her household affairs to a devoted old servant with whom she was forever wrangling 
Shifra spent most of her time raising contributions to her various charity funds, looking after her Talmud students, quarreling with her numerous friends, and begging their forgiveness. If she was unable to provide meals for a student in the houses of some people of her acquaintance, she paid for his board out of her own purse. Her husband was an exporter of grain, and his business often took him to Königsberg, Prussia, for several weeks at a time. Occasions of this kind were hailed by Shifra as a godsend, in the literal sense of the term, for in his absence she could freely spend on her beneficiaries and even feed some of them at her own house. When I was introduced to her as the son of the woman who had been killed on the horse market, and she heard that I frequently had nothing to eat, she burst into tears and berated me soundly for not having not at her door sooner. It's terrible, it's terrible, she moaned, breaking into tears again. In fact, I too deserve a spanking to think that I did not look him up at once when that awful thing happened. As a matter of fact, she had not done so because at the time of my mother's death, her house had been agog with a trouble of its own, but of this presently. She handed me a three-rouble bill and set about filling up the gaps in my eating calendar and substituting fat days for lean ones. She often came to see me at the synagogue, never empty-handed. Now she had a silver coin for me, now a pair of socks, a shirt, or perhaps a pair of trousers, which some member of her family had discarded. Often, too, she would bring me a quarter of a chicken, cookies, or some other article of food from her own table. My days of hunger were at an end. I lived in clover. Now I can work, I thought to myself, with the satisfaction of a well-filled stomach. And work I will. I'll show people what I can do. I applied myself to my task with ardor, but it did not last long. My former interest in the Talmud was gone. The spell was broken irretrievably. Now that I did not want for food, my sense of loneliness became keener than ever. Indeed, it was a novel sense of loneliness, quite unlike the one I had experienced before. My surroundings had somehow lost their former meaning. Life was devoid of savor, and I was thirsting for an appetizer, as it were, for some violent change, for piquant sensations. Then it was that the word America first caught my fancy. The name was buzzing all around me. The great immigration of Jews to the United States, which had received its first impulse two or three years before, was already in full swing. It may not be out of order to relate briefly how it had all come about. An anti-Semitic riot broke out in a southern town named Elizabeth Grad in the early spring of 1881. Occurrences of this kind were in those days quite rare in Russia, and when they did happen, they did not extend beyond the town of their origin. But the circumstances that surrounded the Elizabeth Grad outbreak were of a specific character. It took place one month after the assassination of the Tsar, Alexander II. The actual size and influence of the underground revolutionary organization, being an unknown quantity, St. Petersburg was full of the rumblings of a general uprising. The Elizabeth Grad riot, however, was not of a revolutionary nature. Yet the police, so far from suppressing it, encouraged it. The example of the Elizabeth Grad rabble was followed by the riffraff of other places. The epidemic quickly spread from city to city, whereupon the scenes of lawlessness in the various cities were marked by the same method in the mob's madness, by the same connivance on the part of the police, 
and by many other traits that clearly pointed to a common source of inspiration. It has long since become a well-established historical fact that the anti-Jewish disturbances were encouraged, even arranged by the authorities, as an outlet for the growing popular discontent with the government. Count von Pleve was then at the head of the police department in the Ministry of the Interior. This bit of history repeated itself on a larger scale 22 years later, when Russia was in the paroxysm of a real revolution, and when the ghastly massacres of Jews in Kishinev, Odessa, Kiev, and other cities were among the means employed in an effort to keep the masses busy. Count von Pleve then held the office of Prime Minister. To return to 1881 and 1882. Thousands of Jewish families were left homeless. Of still greater moment was the moral effect which the atrocities produced on the whole Jewish population of Russia. Over five million people were suddenly made to realize that their birthplace was not their home, a feeling which the great Russian Revolution has suddenly changed. Then it was that the cry to America was raised. It spread like wildfire even over those parts of the pale of Jewish settlement which lay outside the riot zone. This was the beginning of the great new exodus that has been in progress for decades. My native town and the entire section to which it belongs had been immune from the riots. Yet it caught the general contagion, and at the time I became one of Schiffer's wards Hundreds of its inhabitants were going to America, or planning to do so. Letters, full of wonders from emigrants already there, went the rounds of eager readers and listeners until they were worn to shreds in the process. I succumbed to the spreading fever. It was one of these letters from America, in fact, which put the notion of immigrating to the New World definitely in my mind. An illiterate woman brought it to the synagogue to have it read to her, and I happened to be the one to whom she addressed her request. The concrete details of that letter gave New York tangible form in my imagination. It haunted me ever after. The United States lured me not merely as a land of milk and honey, but also, and perhaps chiefly, as one of mystery, of fantastic experiences, of marvelous transformations. To leave my native place and to seek my fortune in that distant weird world seemed to be just the kind of sensational adventure my heart was hankering for. When I unburdened myself of my project to Reb Sender, he was thunderstruck. To America, he said, Lord of the world, but one becomes a Gentile there. Not at all, I sought to reassure him. There are lots of good Jews there, and they don't neglect their Talmud either. The amount that was necessary to take me to America loomed staggeringly large. Where was it to come from? I thought of approaching Shifra, but the idea of her helping me abandon my Talmud and go to live in a godless country seemed preposterous. So I began by saving the small allowance which I received from her, and by selling some of the clothes and food she brought me. For the evening meal I usually received some rye bread and a small coin for cheese or herring, so I invariably added the coin to my little hoard, relishing the bread with thoughts of America. While I was thus pinching and saving pennies, I was continually casting about for some more effective way of raising the sum that would take me to New York. I confided my plan to Naftali. Not a bad idea, he said, but you will never raise the money. You are a master of dreams, David. I'll get the money, and what is more, when I am in America, I shall bring you over there too. May your words pass from your lips into the ear of God. I thought you did not believe in God. How long will you believe in him after you get to America? 
End of chapter 2 and of book 3, I Lose My Mother. Read by Mark Cholsky in Massachusetts. Book 4, Chapter 1. The Rise of David Levinsky. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Kahan. Book 4. Matilda. Chapter 1. I could scarcely think of anything but America. I read every letter from there that I could obtain. I was constantly seeking information about the country and the opportunities it held out to a man of my type, and cudgeling my brains for some way of scraping together the formidable sum. I was restless, sleepless, and finally, when I caught a slight cold, my health broke down so completely that I had to be taken to the hospital. Shifra visited me every day calling me poor orphan boy and quarreling with the superintendent over me. One afternoon, after I had been discharged, when she saw me at the synagogue, feeble and emaciated, she gasped. You are a cruel, heartless man, she flared up, addressing herself to the beetle. The poor boy needs a good, soft bed, fine chicken soup, and real care. Why didn't you let me know at once? Come on, David. Where to? I inquired timidly. None of your business. Come on. I am not going to take you to the woods. You may be sure of that. I want you to stay in my house until you are well rested and strong enough to study. Don't you like it? She added with a wink to the beetle. It appeared that her husband was away on one of his prolonged business excursions. Otherwise, installing in her modern home an old-fashioned, ridiculous young creature like a Talmud student would have been out of the question. I followed her with fast-beating heart. I knew that her family was modern, that her children spoke Russian and behaved like Gentiles, that there was a grown young woman among them and that her name was Matilda. The case of this young woman had been the talk of the town the year before. She had been persuaded to marry a man for whom she did not care, and shortly after the wedding and after a sensational passage at arms between his people and hers, she made her father pay him a small fortune for divorcing her, Matilda's family being one of the upper ten in our town. Its members were frequently the subject of envious gossip, and so I had known a good deal about them even before Schiffer befriended me. I had heard, for example, that Matilda had received her early education in a boarding school in Germany, in accordance with a custom that had been in existence among people of her father's class until recently that she had subsequently studied Russian and other subjects under Russian tutors at home, and that her two brothers, who were younger than she, were at the local Russian gymnasium or high school. I had heard also that Matilda was very pretty, that she was well-dressed, went without saying. All this both fascinated and cowed me. Suddenly she proposed as though bethinking herself of something. "'Wait, don't stir,' she said, rushing back. Ten or fifteen minutes later she returned, saying, "'I was not long, was I? I just went to get the beadle's forgiveness, had insulted him for nothing, but he's a dummy, all the same. Come on, David.' Arrived at her house, she introduced me to her old servant in the kitchen. He will stay a week with us, perhaps more, she explained. I want you to build him up, fatten him up, lick up a sour goose. Do you hear? The servant, a tall, spare woman, with an extremely dark face tinged with blue, began by darting hostile glances at me. Look at the way she is staring at him, she growled. He is the son of the woman who was murdered at the horse market. 
The old servant started. Is he? she said, aghast. Are you pleased now? Will you take good care of him? May the uppermost give him a good appetite. As Shifra led me from the kitchen into another room, she told me, she took a fancy to you. It will be all right. She towed me into a vast sitting room, so crowded with new furniture that it had the appearance of a furniture store. There were many rooms in the apartment, and they all produced a similar impression. I subsequently learned that the superabundance of sofas, chests of drawers, chairs, or bric-a-brac stands was due to Schiffer's passion for bargains, a weakness which made her the fair game of tradespeople and artisans. Several of her wardrobes and bureaus were packed full of all sorts of things for which she had no earthly use, and many of which she had smuggled in when her husband and the children were out. Ensconced in a corner of an enormous green sofa in the big crowded sitting room with a book in her lap, we found a young woman with curly brown hair and sparkling brown eyes set in a small oval face. She looked no more than twenty, but when her mother addressed her as Matilda, I knew that I was facing the heroine of the sensational divorce. She was singularly interesting, but pretty she certainly was not. Her gentile name had a world of charm for my ear. One of the trifles that clung to my memory is the fact that upon seeing her I felt something like amazement at her girlish appearance. I had had a notion that a married woman, no matter how young, must have a married face, something quite distinct from the countenance of a maiden, while this married woman did not begin to look married. Matilda got up, cast a frowning side glance at her mother, and walked over to one of the four immense windows illuminating the room. Less than a minute later she turned around and crossed over to her mother's side. She was small but well made, and her movements were brisk, firm, elastic. Come on, mother, there is something I want to tell you, she said, a jerk of her curly head indicating the adjoining room. I have no secrets. Shifra growled. What do you want? A snappish, whispered conference ensued, the trend of which was at once betrayed in an acrimonious retort by Shifra. Just keep your foolish nose out of my affairs, will you? When I say he is going to stay here for some time, I mean it. Don't you mind her, David? Mother! 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 Matilda trilled with a gesture of disgust and flounced out of the room. I felt my face turning all colors, and at the same time her mother, 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 instead of mama, 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 was echoing in my brain enchantingly. Presently a fair-complexioned youth of eighteen or nineteen came in, apparently attracted by his mother's angry voice. He wore a blue coat, with silver lace and silver buttons, the uniform of a Russian high school, which sent a flutter of mixed envy and awe through me. He threw a frowning glance at me and withdrew. Two smaller children, a uniformed boy and a little girl, made their appearance, talking in Russian noisily. At sight of me, they fell silent, looked me over, from my side locks to the edge of my long skirted coat, and then took to whispering and giggling. Clear out, you devils! Shifra shouted, stamping her foot. Shoo! A young chambermaid passed through the room, and Shifra stopped her long enough to introduce me and to command her to look after me as if I were one of the family. Even better! Chapter 2. The spacious sitting-room was used as a breakfast-room as well. It was in this room, on the enormous green sofa, that my bed was made for the night. 
It was by far the most comfortable bed I had ever slept in. Early the next morning, after I finished my long prayer and had put away my phylacteries, the young chambermaid removed the bedding and the swarthy old servant served me my breakfast. Go wash your hands and eat in good health. Eat hearty and may it well agree with you, she said with a compound of deep commiseration, reverence, and disdain. I went to the kitchen, where I washed my hands, and, while wiping them, muttered the brief prayer which one offers before eating. As I returned to the sitting-room, I found Matilda there. She was seated at some distance from the table upon which my breakfast was spread. She wore a sort of white kimono. One did not have to stand on ceremony with a fellow who did not even wear a stiff collar and a necktie, nor did I know enough to resent her costume. She did not order anything to eat for herself, not even a glass of tea. It seemed as though she had come in for the express purpose of eyeing me out of countenance. If she had, she succeeded but too well. Her silent glances fell on me like splashes of hot water. I was so disconcerted I could not swallow my food. There were centuries of difference between her and myself, not to speak of the economic chasm that separated us. To me she was an aristocrat, while I was a poor, wretched day-eater, a cross between a beggar and a recluse. I dared not even look at her. Talmud students were expected to be the shyest creatures under the sun. On this occasion, I certainly was. The other children entered the room. They were dressing themselves, eating and studying their Gentile lessons all at once. Matilda had a mild altercation with Yefim, her 18-year-old brother, ordered breakfast for herself, and seemed to have forgotten my existence. Her mother came in and took to cloying me with food. At about four o'clock in the afternoon, I was alone in the drawing room. I stood at the piano, the first I had ever laid eyes on, timidly sounding some of the keys when I heard approaching voices. With my heart in my mouth, I rushed over to the nearest window, where I paused, feigning interest in some passing peasant teams. Presently Matilda made her appearance, accompanied by two girl friends. The three young women were chattering in Russian, a language of which I understood scarcely three dozen words. I could conjecture, however, that the subject of their talk was no other than my own quailing personality. Suddenly Matilda addressed herself to me in Yiddish. Look here, young man. Don't you know it's a bad manners for a gentleman to stand with his back to ladies? I faced about, all flushed and scared. That's better, she said gaily. Never mind staring at the floor. Give us a look, will you? Don't act as a shy bridegroom. I made no answer. The room seemed to be in a whirl. Why don't you speak? Matilda insisted, concealing her quizzical purpose under a well-acted air of gravity. Her two friends roared, and spurred on by their merriment, she continued to make game of me. Won't you give us one look, at least? Do, please. Come on. My mother will never find out you have been guilty of a great sin like that. I was dying to get up and fling out of the room, but I felt glued to the spot. Their cruel sport, which made me faint with embarrassment and misery, had something inexpressibly alluring in it. One of the two girls said something in Russian of which I caught the word kiss, and which was greeted by a new outburst of laughter. I was terror-stricken. Well, pious Jew, Matilda resumed, 
Suppose a girl were to give you a kiss, what would you do? Commit suicide, would you? Well, never fear. We won't be as cruel as all that. I tell you what, though. I'll hide your side locks behind your ears. I just want to see how you would look without them. At this she stepped up close to me and reached out her hands for my two appendages. I pushed her off. Please let me alone, I protested. Oh, at last we have heard his voice. Bravo! We are making headway, aren't we? At this point her mother's angry voice made itself heard. Matilda desisted with a merry remark to her friends. The next morning, when she and I were alone, she tantalized me again. She made another attempt to tuck my side-locks behind my ears. As we were alone, I had more courage. If you don't stop, I'll go away from here, I said in a rage. What do you want of me? As I thus gave vent to my resentment, I instinctively felt that, so far from causing her to avoid me, it would quicken her rumpish interest in me, and I hoped it would. Shh! Don't yell, she said, startled. Can't you take a joke? A nice joke, that. Very well. I won't do it again. I didn't know you were a touch-me-not. After a pause, she resumed in grave, friendly accents. Come, don't be angry. I want to talk to you. Look here. Is there any sense in your wasting your life the way you do? Look at the way you are dressed, the way you live generally. Besides, the idea of a young man like you not being able to speak a word of Russian. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Why, mother says you are remarkably bright. Isn't it a pity that you should throw it all away? Why don't you try to study Russian, geography, history? Why don't you try to become an educated man? The idea, I said with a laugh. My confusion was gone, partly at least. I looked her full in the face. She flared up. The idea, she mocked me. Rather say, the idea of a bright young fellow being so ignorant. Did you ever hear of provoking things like that? There was a good deal of her mother's helter-skelter explosiveness in her. Now that I had scanned her features in the light of the fact that she was a married woman, I read that fact into them. She did look married, I remarked to myself. Her exposed hair gave her an effect of aristocratic wickedness and wantonness, which repelled and drew me at once. She was a girl, and yet she was a married woman. This duality of hers deepened the fascinating mystery of the distance between us. She proceeded to draw me out. She made me tell her the story of my young life, and I obeyed her, but too willingly. I told her my whole tale of war, reveling in my own rehearsal of my sufferings and more, especially in the expressions of horror and heartfelt pity which it elicited from her. My God, my God, she cried, gasping and wringing her hands, poor boy. Or, oh, I can't hear it. I can't hear it. It is enough to drive one crazy. At one point, as I described the pangs of hunger which I had often borne, there were tears in her interesting eyes. When I had finished my story, flushed with the sense of my histrionic success, she ordered tea and preserves as though to indemnify me for my past sufferings. All the more reason for you to study Russian and to become an educated man, she said, as she put sugar into my glass. She cited the cases of former Talmudists, poor and friendless like myself, who had studied at the universities, fighting every inch of their way till they had achieved success as physicians, lawyers, writers. She spoke passionately, often with the absurd acerbity of her mother. It's a crime for a young man like you to throw himself away on that idiotic Talmud of yours, she said, pacing up and down the room fiercely. 
All this sounded shockingly wicked, and yet it did not shock me in the least. I have a plan, I said. When she heard what I wanted to do, she shook her head and frowned. She said, in substance, that America was a land of dollars, not of education, and that she wanted me to be an educated man. I assured her that I should study English in America, and, after I had laid up some money, prepare for college there. She could have made me promise anything. But colleges, in which the instruction was not in Russian, failed to appeal to her imagination. Still, when she saw that my heart was set on the project, she yielded. She seemed to like the fervor with which I defended my cause and the notion of my going to a faraway land was apparently beginning to have its effect. I was the hero of an adventure. Gradually she became quite enthusiastic about my plan. I tell you what, I can raise the money for you, she said with a gesture of sudden resolution. How much is it? When I said forlornly that it would come to about eighty rubles, she declared gravely, that's all right. I shall get it for you. Only say nothing to mother about it. I thought myself in a flurry of joy over this windfall. But a little later, when I was left to myself, I became aware that the flurry I was in was a quite a different nature. When I tried to think of America, I found that my ambition in that direction had lost its former vitality. I was deeply in love with Matilda. End of chapter 2 Book 4, Chapter 3 The Rise of David Levinsky This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Kahan Book 4 Matilda Chapter 3 She continued to treat me in a patronizing, playful way, but we were supposed to be great friends, and I asked myself no questions. The money is assured, she once announced. You shall get it in a few days. You may begin to pack your great baggage, she jested. My heart sank with me, but I feigned exultation. Do you deserve it, pious soul that you are? she laughed. And casting a glance at my side locks, she added, I do wish you would cut off those horrid things of yours. You won't take them to America, will you? I smiled. Small as was my stock of information of the new world, I knew enough of it to understand in a general way that side locks were out of place there. She proceeded to put my side locks behind my ears, and this time I did not object. She then smoothed them down, the touch of her fingers thrilling me through and through. Then she brought a hand glass and made me look at myself. Do you see the difference? she demanded. If you were not rigged out like the savage that you are, you wouldn't be a bad-looking fellow, after all. Why, girls might even fall in love with you. But then, what does a pious soul like you know about such things as love? Oh, do you know I don't? I ventured to say blushing like a poppy. Do you, really? She said with mischievous surprise. I nodded. Well, well, so you are not quite so saintly as I thought you were. Perhaps you even been in love yourself, have you? Tell me. I kept silent. My heart was throbbing wildly. Do you love me? I nodded once more. My heart stood still. Kiss me, then. She put my arms around her, made me clasp her to my breast, and we kissed passionately. I suddenly felt ten years older. 
She broke away from me, jumping around, slapping her hands and bubbling over with triumphant mirth as she shouted, There is a pious soul for you, there is a pious soul for you. A thought of little red Esther of my childhood days flashed through my brain, of the way she would force me to sin and then gloat over my fall. A penny for your piety, Matilda added gravely. When you are in America, you will dress like a Gentile and even shave. Then you won't look so ridiculous. Good clothes would make another man of you. At this she looked me over in a business-like sort of way. Pretty good figure, that, she concluded. In the evening of that day, when there was company in the house, she bore herself as though she did not know me. But the next morning, after the children had gone to school and her mother was away on her various missions, she made me put on the glittering coat and cap of her brother's Sunday uniform. It's rather small for you, but it's becoming all the same, she said enthusiastically. If Mama came in now, she would not know you. But then there would be a nice how do you do if she did. She gave a titter which rolled through my very heart. Well, Mr. Gymnasist, are you really in love with me? Don't make fun of me, pray, I implored her. It hurts, you know. Very well, I shan't. But you haven't answered my question. What question? What a poor memory you have. And yet mother says you have a good head. Try to remember. I do remember your question. Then what's your answer? Yes. Yes, she mocked me. That's not the way gentlemen declare their love. What else shall I say? What else? Well, say, I am ready to die for you. You are the sunshine of my life. You are the sunshine of my life, I echoed with a smile that was a combination of mirth and resentment. You are my happiness, my soul. The world would be dark without you. I am no baby to parrot somebody else's words. Then you don't love me. Yes, I do. But I hate to be made fun of. Don't. Please don't. I said it with a beseeching, passionate tremor in my voice, and all at once I clasped her violently to me and was about to kiss her. She put up her lips responsively, but suddenly she wrenched herself back. Easy, easy, you saintly Talmudist, she said good-naturedly. You must not forget that you are not a gymnasist, that to kiss a woman is a sin, a great sin. You'll be bitten with rods of iron in the world to come. Well, good-bye, she concluded bravely. I must go. Take off that coat and cap. Mama may come in at any moment. She showed me where to hang them. Chapter 4 In my incessant reveries of her, I developed the theory that if I abandoned my plan about going to America, she would have her father send me to college with a view to my marrying her. Indeed. Matches of this kind were not an unusual arrangement in our town, nor are they in the Jewish districts of New York, Philadelphia, Boston, or Chicago, for example. My bed was usually made on the enormous green sofa in the spacious sitting room. One night, when I was asleep on that great sofa, I was suddenly aroused by the touch of a hand. Shh! I heard Matilda's whisper. I want to talk to you. I can't sleep anyhow. I don't know why. So I was thinking of all kinds of things till I came to your plan about America. It's foolish. Why go so far? Perhaps something can be done to get you into high school and then into the university. I have guessed it right then. I exclaimed within myself. The room was pitch dark. Her white kimono was all I could see of her. She explained certain details. She spoke in a very low undertone with great earnestness. I took her by the hand and drew her down to a seat on the edge of the sofa beside me. She offered no resistance. She continued to talk, 
partly in the same undertone, partly in whispers, with her hand remaining in mine. I was aflame with happiness, yet I listened intently. I felt sure that she was my bride-to-be, that it was only a matter of days when our engagement would be celebrated. My heart went out to her with a passion that seemed to be sanctioned by God and man. I strained down her head and kissed her. But that was the stainless kiss of a man yearning upon the lips of his betrothed. I clasped her flimsily garmented form, kissed her again and again, let her kiss and bite me, and still it all seemed legitimate, or nearly so. I saw in it an emphatic confirmation of my feeling that she did not regard herself a stranger to me. That mattered more than anything else at this moment. "'You are a devil,' she whispered, slapping me on both cheeks. "'A devil with side-locks!' And she broke into a suppressed laugh. "'I'll study as hard as I can,' I assured her, with boyish exultation. "'You'll see what I can do. The Gentile books are child's play in comparison with the Talmud.' I went into details. She took no part in my talk, but she let me go on. I became so absorbed in what I was saying that my caresses ceased. I sat up and spoke quite audibly. Shh! She cautioned me in an irritated whisper. I dropped my voice. She listened for another minute or two, and then, suddenly rising, she said, Oh, you are a Talmud student, after all. And her indistinct kimono vanished in the darkness. I felt crushed, but I was sure that the words Talmud student, which are Yiddish for Nini, merely referred to my rendering our confab dangerous by speaking too loud. The next afternoon she kissed me once more, calling me Talmud student again, but she was apparently getting somewhat fidgety about our relations. She was more guarded, more on the alert for eavesdroppers, as though somebody had become suspicious, my Gentile education she never broached again. Finally, when a letter came from her father announcing his speedy return, and Shifra hastened to terminate my stay at the house, Matilda was obviously glad to have me go. I shall bring you the money to the synagogue, she whispered as I was about to leave. I was stunned. I left in a turmoil of misery and perplexity, yet not in despair. When I returned to the synagogue, everybody and everything in it looked strange to me. Reb Sender was dearer than ever, but that was chiefly because I was longing for a devoted friend. I was dying to relieve my fevered mind by telling him all and seeking advice, but I did not. Are you still weak? he asked tenderly, looking close into my eyes. Oh, it's not that, Rap Sender. Is it the death of your dear mother, peace upon her? Uh, yes, of course. That and lots of other things. It will all pass. She will have a bright paradise, and the upper one will help you. Don't lose heart, my boy. I ran over to Naftali's place. We talked of Shifra and her children, at least I did. He asked about Matilda, and I answered reluctantly. Now and again I felt impelled to tell him all. It would have been such a relief to ease my mind of its cruel burden and to hear somebody's, anybody's opinion about it. But his laconical questions and answers were anything but encouraging. I spent many an hour in his company, but he was always absorbed in the Talmud, or in some of his infidel books. The specific character of my restlessness was lost upon him. I was in the grip of a dull, enervating, overpowering agony that seemed to be weighing my heart down and filling my throat with pent-up sobs. I was writhing inwardly, praying for Matilda's mercy. It was the most excruciating pain I had ever experienced. I remember it distinctly in every detail. If I now wished to imagine a state of mind driving one to suicide, I could not do it better than by recalling my mental condition in those days. 
In point of fact, I took pride in my misery. I am in love. I am no mere slouch of a Talmud student, I would say to myself. In the evening of the fourth day, as I was making a pretense at reading Talmud, a poor boy came in to call me out. In the alley outside the house of worship, I found Matilda. She had the money with her. I don't think I want it now, I said. I don't care to go to America. Why? she asked impatiently. Oh, take it and let me be done with it, she said, forcing a small packet into my hand. I have no time to bother with you. Go to America. I wish you good luck. But I will miss you. I shan't be able to live without you. What? Are you crazy? she said sternly. You forget your place, young man. She stalked hastily away, her form, at once an angel of light and the messenger of death, being swallowed up by the gloom. Ten minutes later, when I was at my book again, my heart bleeding and my head in a daze, I was called out once more. Again, I found her standing in the lane. I did not mean to hurt your feelings, she said. I wish you good luck from the bottom of my heart. She uttered it with a warm cordiality, and yet the note of impatience which rang in her voice ten minutes before was again there. Try to become an educated man in America, she added. That's the main thing. Goodbye. You have my best wishes. Goodbye. And before I had time to say anything, she took my hand and was gone. Chapter 5 A little over three weeks had elapsed. It was two days after Passover. I had just solemnized the first anniversary of my mother's death. The snow had melted. Each of my five senses seemed to be thrillingly aware of the presence of spring. I was at the railway station. Clustered about me were Reb Sender and his wife, two other Talmudists from the preacher's synagogue, the retired old soldier with the formidable side whiskers, and Naphtali. As I write these words, I seem to see the group before me. It is one of those scenes that never grow dim in one's memory. Be a good Jew and a good man, Rep. Sander murmured to me confusedly. Do not forget that there is a God in heaven in America as well as here. Do not forget to write us. Naphtali, speaking in his hoarse whisper, half in jest, half in earnest, made me repeat my promise to send him a ship ticket from America. I promised everything that was asked of me. My head was swimming. While the first bell was sounding for the passengers to board the train, Shifra rushed in, puffing for breath. I looked at the door to see if Matilda was not following her. She was not. The group around me made way for the rich woman. Here, she said, handing me a ten-ruble bill in a package. There is boiled chicken in it, and some other things, provided you won't neglect your Talmud in America. A minute later, she drew her purse from her skirt pocket, produced a five-ruble bill, and put it into my hand. That all the other money I had for my journey had come from her daughter, she had not the remotest idea. I made my final farewells amid a hubbub of excited voices and eyes glistening with tears. End of chapter 5, end of book 4, Matilda Read by Mark Chulsky in Massachusetts The Rise of David Levinsky Book 5, Chapter 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Cahan. Book 5. I Discover America. Chapter 1. Two weeks later, I was one of a multitude of steerage passengers on a Bremen steamship on my way to New York. Who can depict the feeling of desolation, homesickness, uncertainty, and anxiety with which an emigrant makes his first voyage across the ocean. I proved to be a good sailor, but the sea frightened me. 
the thumping of the engines was drumming a ghastly accompaniment to the awesome whisper of the waves i felt in the embrace of a vast uncanny force and echoing through it all were the heart-lashing words are you crazy you forget your place young man when columbus was crossing the atlantic on his first great voyage his men doubted whether they would ever reach land so does many an american-bound emigrant to this day such at least was the feeling that was lurking in my heart while the bremen steamer was carrying me to new york day after day passes and all you see about you is an unbroken waste of water an unrelieved a hopeless monotony of water you know that a change will come but this knowledge is confined to your brain your senses are skeptical in my devotions which i performed three times a day without counting a benediction before every meal and every drink of water grace after every meal and a prayer before going to sleep i would mentally plead for the safety of the ship and for a speedy sight of land my scanty luggage included a pair of phylacteries and a plump little prayer book with the book of psalms at the end the prayers i knew by heart but by now often said psalms in addition particularly when the sea looked angry and the pitching or rolling was unusually violent i would read all kinds of psalms but my favorite among them was the one hundred and fourth generally referred to by our people as bless the lord o my soul its opening words in the original hebrew it is a poem on the power and wisdom of god as manifested in the wonders of nature some of its verses dealing with the sea it is said by the faithful every saturday afternoon during the fall and winter so i could have recited it from memory but i preferred to read it in my prayer book for it seemed as though the familiar words had changed their identity and meaning especially those concerned with the sea their divine inspiration was now something visible and audible it was not i who was reading them it was as though the waves and the clouds the whole far-flung scene of restlessness and mystery were whispering to me thou who coverest thyself with light as with a garment who stretchest out the heavens like a curtain who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters who maketh the clouds his chariot who walketh upon the wings of the wind so is this great and wide sea wherein are things creeping innumerable both small and great beasts there go the ships there is that leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein the relentless presence of matilda in my mind worried me immeasurably for to think of a woman who is a stranger to you is a sin and so there was the danger of the vessel coming to grief on my account and as though to spite me the closing verse of psalm one o four reads let the sinners be consumed out of the earth and let the wicked be no more i strained every nerve to keep matilda out of my thoughts but without avail when the discoverers of america saw land at last they fell on their knees and a hymn of thanksgiving burst from their souls the scene which is one of the most thrilling in history repeats itself in the heart of every immigrant as he comes in sight of the american shores i am at a loss to convey the peculiar state of mind that the experience created in me when the ship reached sandy hook i was literally overcome with the beauty of the landscape the immigrant's arrival in his new home is like a second birth to him imagine a newborn babe in possession of a fully developed intellect would it ever forget its entry into the world neither does the immigrant ever forget his entry into a country which is to him a new world in the profoundest sense of the term and in which he expects to pass the rest of his life i conjure up the gorgeousness of the spectacle as it appeared to me on that clear june morning the magnificent verdure of staten island the tender blue of sea and sky the dignified bustle of passing craft above all those floating squatting multitudinously windowed palaces which i subsequently learned to call fairies it was all so utterly unlike anything i had ever seen or dreamed of before it unfolded itself like a divine revelation i was in a trance or in something closely resembling one this then is america i exclaimed mutely the notion of something enchanted which the name had always evoked in me now seemed fully borne out in my ecstasy i could not help thinking of psalm 104 and opening my little prayer book i glanced over those of its verses that speak of hills and rocks of grass and trees and birds 
my transport of admiration however only added to my sense of helplessness and awe here on shipboard i was sure of my shelter and food at least how was i going to procure my sustenance on those magic shores i wished the remaining hour could be prolonged indefinitely psalm 104 spoke reassuringly to me it reminded me of the way god took care of man and beast thou openest thine hand and they are filled with good but then the very next verse warned me that thou hidest thy face they are troubled thou takest away their breath they die so i was praying god not to hide his face from me but to open his hand to me to remember that my mother had been murdered by gentiles and that i was going to a strange land when i reached the words i will sing unto the lord as long as i live i will sing praise to my god while i have my being i uttered them in a fervent whisper my unhappy love never ceased to harrow me the strange image of matilda blended in with the hostile glamour of america one of my fellow passengers was a young yiddish speaking tailor named Giselson. he was about twenty-four years old yet his forelock was gray just his forelock the rest of his hair being a fine glossy brown his own cap had been blown into the sea and the one he had obtained from the steerage steward was too small for him so that gray tuft of his was always out like a plume we had not been acquainted more than a few hours in fact for he had been seasick throughout the voyage and this was the first day he had been up and about but then i had seen him on the day of our sailing and subsequently many times as he wretchedly lay in his berth he was literally in tatters he clung to me like a lover but we spoke very little our hearts were too full for words as i thus stood at the railing prayer book in hand he took a look at the page the most ignorant man of the earth among our people can read holy tongue hebrew though he may not understand the meaning of the words this was the case with Jittleson. saying bless the lord o my soul he answered reverently why this chapter of all others because why just listen with which i took to translating the hebrew text into yiddish for him he listened with devout mien i was not sure that he understood it even in his native tongue but whether he did or not his beaming wistful look and the deep sigh he emitted indicated that he was in a state similar to mine when i say that my first view of new york bay struck me as something not of this earth it is not a mere figure of speech I vividly recall the feeling, for example, with which I greeted the first cat I saw on American soil. It was on the Hoboken Pier, while the steerage passengers were being marched to the ferry. A large, black, well-fed feline stood in a corner, eyeing the crowd of newcomers. The sight of it gave me a thrill of joy. "'Look, there is a cat,' I said to Jittleson. And in my heart I added, just like those at home, for the moment the little animal made america real to me at the same time it seemed unreal itself i was tempted to feel its fur to ascertain whether it was actually the kind of creature i took it for we were ferried over to castle garden one of the things that caught my eye as i entered the vast rotunda was an iron staircase rising diagonally against one of the inner walls a uniformed man with some papers in his hands ascended it with brisk resounding step till he disappeared through a door not many inches from the ceiling it may seem odd but i can never think of my arrival in this country without hearing the ringing footfalls of this official and beholding the yellow eyes of the black cat which stared at us at the hoboken pier the harsh manner of the immigration officers was a grievous surprise to me as contrasted with the officials of my despotic country those of a republic had been portrayed in my mind as paragons of refinement and cordiality my anticipations were rudely belied they are not a bit better than cossacks i remarked to Jittleson, but they neither looked nor spoke like cossacks so their gruff voices were part of the uncanny scheme of things that surrounded me these unfriendly voices flavored all america with a spirit of icy inhospitality that sent a chill through my very soul the stringent immigration laws that were passed some years later had not yet come into existence we had no difficulty in being admitted to the united states and when i was i was loath to leave the garden many of the other immigrants were met by relatives friends there were cries of joy tears embraces kisses 
all of which intensified my sense of loneliness and dread of the new world the agencies which two jewish charity organizations now maintain at the immigrant station had not yet been established Jittleson, who like myself had no friends in new york never left my side he was even more timid than i it seemed as though he were holding on to me for dear life this had the effect of putting me on my mettle cheer up old man i said with bravado america is not the place to be a ninny in come pull yourself together in truth i addressed these exhortations as much to myself as to him and so far at least as i was concerned my words had the desired effect i led the way out of the big immigrant station as we reached the park outside we were pounced upon by two evil-looking men representatives of boarding-houses for immigrants they pulled us so roughly and their general appearance and manner were so uninviting that we struggled and protested till they let us go not without some parting curses then i led the way across battery park and under the elevated railway to state street a train hurtling and panting along overhead produced a bewildering a daunting effect on me the active life of the great strange city made me feel like one abandoned in the midst of a jungle where were we to go what were we to do but the presence of Jittleson continued to act as a spur on me i mustered courage to approach a policeman something i should never have been bold enough to do at home as a matter of fact i scarcely had an idea what his function was to me he looked like some uniformed nobleman and impression that in itself was enough to intimidate me with his coat of blue cloth starched linen collar and white gloves he reminded me of anything but the policeman of my town i addressed him in yiddish making it as near an approach to german as i knew how but my efforts were lost on him he shook his head with a witheringly dignified grimace he then pointed his club in the direction of broadway and strutted off majestically he's not better than a cossack either was my verdict at this moment a voice hailed us in yiddish facing about we beheld a middle-aged man with huge round perpendicular nostrils and a huge round deep dimple in his chin that looked like a third nostril prosperity was written all over his smooth shaven face and broad-shouldered stocky figure he was literally aglow with diamonds and self-satisfaction but he was unmistakably one of our people it was like coming across a human being in the jungle moreover his very diamonds somehow told a tale of former want of a time when he had landed an impecunious immigrant like myself and this made him a living source of encouragement to me god himself has sent you to us i began acting as the spokesman but he gave no heed to me his eyes were eagerly fixed on Jittleson and his tatters you're a tailor aren't you he questioned him my steerage companion added i'm a lady's tailor but i have worked on men's clothing too he said a lady's tailor the well-dressed stranger echoed with ill-concealed delight very well come along i have work for you that he should have been able to read Jittleson's trade in his face and figure scarcely surprised me in my native place it seemed to be a matter of course that one could tell a tailor by his general appearance and walk besides had i not divined the occupation of my fellow-passenger the moment i saw him on deck as i learned subsequently the man who accosted us on state street was a cloak contractor and his presence in the neighborhood of castle garden was anything but a matter of chance he came there quite often in fact his purpose being to angle for cheap labor among the newly arrived immigrants we passed near bowling green the contractor and my fellow-passenger were absorbed in a conversation full of sartorial technicalities which were greek to me but which brought a gleam of joy into Jittleson's eye. My former companion seemed to have become oblivious of my existence. As we resumed our walk up Broadway, the bejeweled man turned to me. And what was your occupation? You have no trade, have you? I read Talmud, I said confusedly. I see, but that's no business in America, he declared. Any relatives here? Well, don't worry, you will be all right. If a fellow isn't lazy nor a fool, he has no reason to be sorry he came to america it'll be all right all right he said in english and i conjectured what it meant from the context in the course of the minute or two which he bestowed upon me he uttered it so many times that the phrase engraved itself upon my memory it was the first bit of english i ever acquired 
the well-dressed trim-looking crowds of lower broadway impressed me as a multitude of counts barons princes i was puzzled by their preoccupied faces and hurried step it seemed to comport ill with their baronial dress and general high-born appearance in a vague way all this helped to confirm my conception of america as a unique country unlike the rest of the world when we reached the general post office at the end of the third avenue surface line our guide bade us stop walk straight ahead he said to me waving his hand toward park row just keep walking till you see a lot of jewish people it isn't far from here with which he slipped a silver quarter into my hand and made jittleson bid me good-bye the two then boarded a big red horse-car i was left with a sickening sense of having been tricked cast off and abandoned i stood watching the receding public vehicle as though its scarlet hue were my last gleam of hope in the world when it finally disappeared from view my heart sank within me i may safely say that the half-hour that followed is one of the worst i experienced in all the thirty-odd years of my life in this country the big round nostrils of the contractor and the grey forelock of my young steerage fellow haunted my brain as hideous symbols of treachery with twenty-nine cents in my pocket four cents was all that was left of the sum which i had received from matilda and her mother i set forth in the direction of east broadway end of book five chapter one recording by dion Gines, salt lake city utah book number five chapter two of the rise of david levinsky this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the rise of david levinsky by abraham Cain. book number five i discover america chapter two ten minutes walk brought me to the heart of the jewish east side the streets swarmed with yiddish speaking immigrants the signboards were in english and yiddish some of them in russian the scurry and hustle of the people were not merely overwhelmingly greater both in volume and intensity than in my native town it was of another sort the swing and step of the pedestrians the voices and manner of the street peddlers and a hundred and one other things seemed to testify to far more self-confidence and energy to larger ambitions and wider scopes than did the appearance of the crowds in my birthplace the great thing was that these people were better dressed than the inhabitants of my town the poorest-looking man wore a hat instead of a cap a stiff collar and a necktie and the poorest woman wore a hat or a bonnet the appearance of a newly arrived immigrant was still a novel spectacle on the east side many of the passers-by paused to look at me with wistful smiles of curiosity there goes a green one some of them exclaimed the sight of me obviously evoked reminiscences in them of the days when they had been green ones like myself it was a second birth that they were witnessing an experience which they had once gone through themselves and which was one of the greatest events of their lives green one or greenhorn is one of the many english words and phrases which my mother tongue has appropriated in england and america thanks to the many millions of letters that pass annually between the jews of russia and their relatives in the united states a number of these words have by now come to be generally known among our people at home as well as here in the eighties however one who had not visited any english-speaking country was utterly unfamiliar with them and so i never heard of green one before still green in the sense of color is yiddish as well as english so i understood the phrase at once and as a contemptuous quizzical appellation for a newly arrived inexperienced immigrant it stung me cruelly as i went along i heard it again and again some of the passers-by would call me a greenhorn in a tone of blighting gaiety but these were the exception for the most part it was green one and in a spirit of sympathetic interest it hurt me all the same even those glances that offered me a cordial welcome and good wishes had something self-complacent and condescending in them poor fellow he is a green one these people seem to say we are not of course we are americanized for my first meal in the new world i bought a three-cent wedge of coarse rye bread off a huge round loaf on a stand on essex street i was too strict in my religious observances to eat it without first performing ablutions and offering a brief prayer so i approached a bewigged old woman who stood in the doorway of a small grocery store to let me wash my hands and eat my meal in her place 
She looked old-fashioned enough, yet when she heard my request, she said, with a laugh, You're a green one, I see. Suppose I am, I resented. Do the yellow ones or the black ones all eat without washing? Can't a fellow be a good Jew in America? Yes, of course he can, but, well, wait till you see for yourself. However, she asked me to come in, gave me some water and an old apron to serve me for a towel, and when I was ready to eat my bread, she placed a glass of milk before me, explaining that she was not going to charge me for it. In America, people are not foolish enough to be content with dry bread, she said sententiously. While I ate, she questioned me about my antecedents. I remember how she impressed me as a strong, clever woman of few words as long as she catechized me, and how disappointed I was when she began to talk of herself. The astute, knowing mien gradually faded out of her face, and I had before me a gushing, boastful old bore. My intention was to take a long stroll, as much in the hope of coming upon some windfall as for the purpose of taking a look at the great American city. Many of the letters that had come from the United States to my birthplace before I sailed had contained a warning not to imagine that America was a land of gold, and that treasure might be had in the streets of New York for the picking. But these warnings only had the effect of lending vividness to my image of an American street, as a thoroughfare strewn with nuggets of the precious metal. Symbolically speaking, this was the idea one had of the land of Columbus. It was a continuation of the widespread effect produced by stories of Cortez and Pizarro in the sixteenth century, confirmed by the successes of some Russian immigrants of my time. I asked the grocery woman to let me leave my bundle with her, and, after considerable hesitation, she allowed me to put it among some empty barrels in her cellar. I went wandering over the ghetto. Instead of stumbling upon nuggets of gold, I found signs of poverty. In one place I came across a poor family who, as I learned upon inquiry, had been dispossessed for non-payment of rent. A mother and her two little boys were watching their pile of furniture and other household goods on the sidewalk, while the passers-by were dropping coins into a saucer placed on one of the chairs to enable the family to move into new quarters. What puzzled me was the nature of the furniture— for my birthplace, chairs and a couch like those I now saw on the sidewalk would be a sign of prosperity, but then anything was to be expected of a country where the poorest devil wore a hat and a starched collar. I walked on. The exclamation, a green one, or a greenhorn, continued. If I did not hear it, I saw it in the eyes of the people who passed me. When it grew dark and I was much in need of rest, I had a street peddler direct me to a synagogue. I expected to spend the night there. What could have been more natural? At the house of God I found a handful of men in prayer. It was a large, spacious room, and the smallness of their number gave it an air of desolation. I joined in the devotions with great fervor. My soul was sobbing to heaven to take care of me in the strange country. The service over, several of the worshippers took up some Talmud folio or other holy book and proceeded to read them aloud in the familiar sing-song. The strange surroundings suddenly began to look like home to me. One of the readers, an elderly man with a pinched face and forked little beard, paused to look me over. A green one, he asked genially. He told me that the synagogue was crowded on Saturdays, while on weekdays people in America had no time to say their prayers at home, much less to visit a house of worship. It isn't Russia, he said with a sigh. Judaism has not much of a chance here. When he heard that I intended to stay at the synagogue overnight, he smiled ruefully. One does not sleep in an American synagogue, he said. It is not Russia. Then scanning me once more, he added, with an air of compassionate perplexity, Where will you sleep, poor child? I wish I could take you to my house, but, well, America is not Russia. There is no pity here, no hospitality. My wife would raise a rumpus if I brought you along. I should never hear the last of it. With a deep sigh and nodding his head plaintively, he returned to his book, swaying back and forth, but he was apparently more interested in the subject he had broached. When we were at home, he resumed, she, too, was a different woman. She did not make life a burden to me as she does here. Have you no money at all? I showed him the quarter I had received from the cloak contractor. Poor fellow, is that all you have? There are places where you can get a night's lodging for fifteen cents, but what are you going to do afterward? I am simply ashamed of myself. Hospitality, he quoted from the Talmud, is one of the things which the giver enjoys in this world, and the fruit of which he relishes in the world to come. To think that I cannot offer a Talmudic scholar a night's rest. Alas, America has turned me into a mound of ashes. You were well off in Russia, weren't you? I inquired in astonishment. 
for indeed i had never heard of anything but poor people emigrating to america i used to spend my time reading talmud at the synagogue was his reply many of his answers seemed to fit not the question asked but one which was expected to follow it you might have thought him anxious to forestall your next query in order to save time and words had it not been so difficult for him to keep his mouth shut she he said referring to his wife had a nice little business she sold feed for horses and she rejoiced in the thought that she was married to a man of learning true she has a tongue that she always had but over there it was not so bad she has become a different woman here alas america is a topsy-turvy country he went on to show how the new world turned things upside down transforming an immigrant shoemaker into a man of substance while a former man of leisure was forced to work in a factory here in like manner his wife had changed for the worse for lo and behold instead of supporting him while he read talmud as she used to do at home she persisted in sending him out to peddle america is not russia she said a man must make a living here but alas it was too late to begin now he had spent the better part of his life at his holy books and was fit for nothing else now his wife however would take no excuses he must peddle or be nagged to death and if he ventured to slip into some synagogue of an afternoon and read a page or two he would be in danger of being caught red-handed so to say for indeed she often shadowed him to make sure that he did not play truant alas america was not russia a thought crossed my mind that if reb sender were here he too might have to go peddling poor reb sender the very image of him with a basket on his arm broke my heart america did seem to be the most cruel place on earth i am telling you all this that you may see why i can't invite you to my house explained the peddler all i did see was that the poor man could not help unburdening his mind to the first listener that presented himself he pursued his tale of woe he went on complaining of his own fate quite forgetful of mine instead of continuing to listen i fell to gazing around the synagogue more or less furtively one of the readers attracted my special attention he was a venerable-looking man with a face which as i now recall it reminded me of thackeray only he had a finer head than the english novelist at last the hen-picked man discovered my inattention and fell silent a minute later his tongue was at work again you are looking at that man over there aren't you he asked who is he when the lord of the world gives one good luck he gives one good looks as well why is he rich his son-in-law is but then his daughter cherishes him as she does the apple of her eye and well when the lord of the world wishes to give a man happiness he gives him good children don't you know he rattled on betraying his envy of the venerable-looking man in various ways and telling me all he knew about him that he was a widower named even that he had been some years in america that his daughter furnished him all the money he needed and a good deal more so that he lived like a monarch even would not live in his daughter's house however because her kitchen was not conducted according to the laws of moses and everything else in it was too modern so he roomed and boarded with pious strangers visiting her far less frequently than she visited him and never eating at her table he is a very proud man my informant said one must not approach him otherwise than on tiptoe i threw a glance at even his dignified sing-song seemed to confirm my interlocutor's characterization of him perhaps you will ask me how his son-in-law takes it all the voluble talmudist went on well his daughter is a beautiful woman and well favored the implication was that her husband was extremely fond of her and let her use his money freely they are awfully rich and they live like veritable gentiles which is a common disease among the jews of america but then she observes the commandment honor thy father that she does again he tried to read his book and again the temptation to gossip was too much for him he returned to even's pride dwelling with considerable venom upon his love of approbation and vanity may the uppermost not punish me for my evil words but to see him take his roll of bills out of his pocket and pay his contribution to the synagogue one would think he was some big merchant and not a poor devil sponging on his son-in-law a few minutes later he told me admiringly how even often loaned him a half a dollar to enable him to do some reading for the house of god i tell my virago of a wife i have sold fifty cents worth of goods he explained to me sadly after a while the man with the thackeray face closed his book kissed it and rose to go on his way out he unceremoniously paused in front of me a silver snuff-box in his left hand and fell to scrutinizing me 
he had the appearance of a well-paid rabbi of a large prosperous town he is going to say a green one i prophesied to myself all but shuddering at the prospect and sure enough he did but he took his time about it which made the next minute seem a year to me he took snuff with tantalizing deliberation next he sneezed with great zest and then he resumed sizing me up the suspense was insupportable another second and i might have burst out for mercy's sake say a green one and let us be done with it but at that moment he uttered it of his own accord a green one i see where from and grasping my hand he added in hebrew peace be to ye his first questions about me were obsequiously answered by the man with a forked beard whereupon my attention was attracted by the fact that he addressed him by his gentile name that is as mr even and not by his hebrew name as he would have done in our birthplace surely america did not seem to be much of a god-fearing country when mr even heard of my talmud studies he questioned me about the tractates i had recently read and even challenged me to explain an apparent discrepancy in a certain passage for the double purpose of testing my talmud brains and flaunting his own i acquitted myself creditably it seems and i felt that i was making a good impression personally as well anyhow he invited me to supper in a restaurant on our way there i told him of my mother's violent death vaguely hoping that it would add to his interest in me it did even more than i had expected to my pleasant surprise he proved to be familiar with the incident it appeared that because our section lay far outside the region of pogroms or anti-jewish riots the killing of my mother by a gentile mob had attracted considerable attention i was thrilled to find myself in the limelight of world-wide publicity i almost felt like a hero so you are her son he said pausing to look me over as though i had suddenly become a new man my poor orphan boy he caused me to recount the incident in every detail in doing so i made it as appallingly vivid as i knew how he was so absorbed and moved that he repeatedly made me stop in the middle of the sidewalk so as to look me in the face as he listened oh but you must be hungry he suddenly interrupted me come on arrived at the restaurant he ordered supper for me then he withdrew commending me to the care of the proprietress until he should return he had no sooner shut the door behind him than she took to questioning me was i a relative of mr even if not then why was he taking so much interest in me she was a vivacious well-fed young matron with cheeks of a flaming red and with the consciousness of business success all but spurting from her black eyes from what she assisted by one of the other customers present told me about my benefactor i learned that his son-in-law was the owner of the tenement house in which the restaurant was located as well as of several other buildings they also told me of the landlord's wife of her devotion to her father and of the latter's piety and dignity it appeared however that in her filial reverence she would draw the line upon his desire not to spare the rod upon her children which was really the chief reason why he was a stranger at her house i had been waiting about two hours and was growing uneasy when mr even came back explaining that he had spent the time taking his own supper and finding lodgings for me he then took me to store after store buying me a suit of clothes a hat some underclothes handkerchiefs the first white handkerchiefs i ever possessed collars shoes and a necktie he spent a considerable sum on me as we passed from block to block he kept saying now you won't look green or that will make you look american at one point he added not that you are a bad-looking fellow as it is but then one must be presentable in america at this he quoted from the talmud an equivalent to the saying that one must do in rome as the romans do when all our purchases had been made he took me to a barber shop with bathrooms in the rear give him a haircut and a bath he said to the proprietor cut off his side locks while you are at it one may go without them and yet be a good jew he disappeared again but when i emerged from the bathroom i found him waiting for me i stood before him necktie and collar in hand not knowing what to do with them till he showed me how to put them on don't worry david he consoled me when i came here i too had to learn these things when he was through with the job he took me in front of a looking-glass quite an american isn't he he said to the barber beamingly and a good-looking fellow too when i took a look at the mirror i was bewildered i scarcely recognized myself i was mentally parading my modern make-up before matilda a pang of yearning clutched my heart it was a momentary feeling for the rest i was all in a flutter with embarrassment and a novel relish of existence 
it was as though the haircut and the american clothes had changed my identity the steamer getelson and the man who had snatched him up now appeared to be something of the remote past the day had been so overcrowded with novel impressions that it seemed an age he took me to an apartment in a poor tenement house and introduced me to a tall bewhiskered morose-looking elderly man and a smiling woman of thirty-five explaining that he had paid them in advance for a month's board and lodging when he said this is mr levinsky i felt as though i was being promoted in rank as behooved my new appearance mr struck me as something like a title of nobility it thrilled me but somehow it seemed ridiculous too indeed it was some time before i could think of myself as a mr without being tempted to laugh and here's some cash for you he said handing me a five-dollar bill and some silver in addition and now you must shift for yourself that's all i can do for you nor indeed would i do more if i could a young man like you must learn to stand on his own legs understand if you do well come to see me understand there was an eloquent pause which said that if i did not do well i was not to molest him then he added aloud there is only one thing i want you to promise me don't neglect your religion nor your talmud do you promise that david i did there was a note of fatherly tenderness in the way this utter stranger called me david it reminded me of reb sender i wanted to say something to express my gratitude but i felt a lump in my throat he advised me to invest the five dollars in dry goods and take up peddling then wishing me luck he left my landlady who had listened to mr evans parting words with pious nods and rapturous grins remarked that one would vainly search the world for another man like him and proceeded to make my bed on a lounge the room was a kitchen the stove was a puzzle to me i wondered whether it was really a stove is this used for heating i inquired yes for heating and cooking she explained with smiling cordiality and she added with infinite superiority america has no use for those big tile ovens when i found myself alone in the room the feeling of desolation and uncertainty which had tormented me all day seized me once again i went to bed and began to say my bed prayer i did so mechanically my mind did not attend to the words i was murmuring instead it was saying to god lord of the universe you have been good to me so far i went out of that grocery store in the hope of coming upon some good piece of luck and my hope was realized be good to me in the future as well i shall be more pious than ever i promise you even if america is a godless country i was excruciatingly homesick my heart went out to my poor dead mother then i reflected that it was my story of her death that had led even to spend so much money on me it seemed as if she were taking care of me from her grave it seemed too as though she died so that i might arouse sympathy and make a good start in america i thought of her and all of antomir and my pangs of yearning for her were tinged with my pangs of unrequited love for matilda End of chapter two book number five chapter three of the rise of david levinsky this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the rise of david levinsky by abraham kane book number five i discover america chapter three my landlady was a robust little woman compact and mobile as a billiard ball continually bustling about chattering and smiling or laughing she was a good-natured silly creature and her smile which automatically shut her eyes and opened her mouth from ear to ear accentuated her kindliness as well as her lack of sense when she did not talk she would hum or sing at the top of her absurd voice the then popular american song climbing up the golden stairs she told me the very next day that she had been married less than a year and one of the first things i noticed about her was the pleasure it gave her to refer to her husband or to quote him her prattle was so full of my husband says says my husband that it seemed as though the chief purpose of her jabber was to parade her married state and to hear herself talk of her spouse the words my husband were music to her ears they actually meant behold i am an old maid no longer she was so deeply impressed by the story of my meeting with mr even whose son-in-law was her landlord and by the amount he had spent on me that she retailed it among her neighbors some of whom she invited to the house in order to exhibit me to them her name was mrs deanstog which is yiddish for tuesday 
now tuesday is a lucky day so i saw a good omen in her and thanked god her name was not monday or wednesday which according to the talmud are unlucky one of the first things i did was to make up a list of english words and phrases which our people in this country had adopted as part and parcel of their native tongue this i felt was an essential step toward shedding one's greenhorn hood an operation every immigrant is anxious to dispose of without delay the list included floor ceiling window dinner supper hat business job clean plenty never ready anyhow never mind hurry up all right and about a hundred other words and phrases i was quick to realize that to be stylishly dressed was a good investment but i realized too that to use the yiddish word for collar or clean instead of their english correlatives was worse than to wear a dirty collar i wrote down the english words in hebrew characters and from my landlady's dictation so that never mind for example became never mind when i came home with a basket containing my first stock of wares mrs deanstog ran into ecstasies over it she took to fingering some of my collar buttons and garters and when i protested she drew away pouting still the next morning as i was leaving the house with my stock she wished me good luck ardently and when i left the house she ran after me shouting wait mr levinsky i'll buy something of you for a lucky start she picked out a paper of pins and as she paid me the price she said devoutly may this little basket become one of the biggest stores in new york my plan of campaign was to peddle in the streets for a few weeks that is until my greenness should wear off and then to try to sell goods to tenement housewives i threw myself into the business with enthusiasm but with rather discouraging results i earned what i then called a living but i made no headway as a consequence my ardor cooled off it was nothing but a daily grind my heart was not in it my landlord who was a truck driver but who dreamed of business thought that i lacked dash pluck tenacity and the proprietor of the peddler supply store in which i bought my goods seemed to be of the same opinion for he often chafed me on the smallness of my bill on one occasion he said if you want to make a decent living you must put all other thoughts out of your mind and think of nothing but your business only my smiling little landlady was always chirping words of encouragement assuring me that i was not doing worse than the average beginner this and her cordial good-natured manner were a source of comfort to me we became great friends she taught me some of her broken english and i let her talk of her husband as long as she wanted one of her weaknesses was to boast of holding him under her thumb though in reality she was under his ceaselessly gay in his absence she would become shy and reticent the moment he came home I never saw him talk to her save to give her some order which she would execute with feverish haste. Still, in his surly, domineering way, he was devoted to her. I was ever conscious of my modern garb, and as I walked through the streets I would repeatedly throw glances at store windows trying to catch my reflection in them, or else I would pass my fingers across my temples to feel the absence of my side-locks. It seemed a pity that Matilda could not see me now. One of the trifles that have remained embedded in my memory from those days is the image of a big, florid-faced huckster shouting at the top of his voice, Strawberries! Strawberries! Five cents a quart! I used to hear and see him every morning through the windows of my lodging, and to this day, whenever I hear the sing-song of a strawberry peddler, I scent the odors of New York as they struck me upon my arrival in 1885, and I experienced the feeling of uncertainty homesickness and love-sickness that never left my heart at that period i often saw antomir in my dreams the immigrants from the various russian galician and roumanian towns usually had their respective synagogues in new york philadelphia boston or chicago so i sought out the houses of worship of the sons of antomir there were scores perhaps hundreds of small congregations on the east side each of which had the use of a single room for the service hours on saturdays and holidays in a building rented for all sorts of gatherings weddings dances lodge meetings trade union meetings and the like the antomir congregation however was one of those that could afford a whole house all to themselves our synagogue was a small rickety frame structure it was for a saturday morning service that i visited it for the first time i entered it with a throbbing heart i prayed with great fervor when the devotions were over i was disappointed to find that the congregation contained not a single worshipper whom i had known or heard of at home indeed many of them did not even belong to antomir 
when i told them about my mother there was a murmur of curiosity and sympathy but their interest in me soon gave way to their interest in the information i could give each of them concerning the house and street that had once been his home upon the advice of my landlord the truck driver and largely with his help i soon changed the character of my business i rented a pushcart and tried to sell remnants of dress goods linen and oilcloth this turned out somewhat better than basket peddling but i was one of the common herd in this branch of the business as well often i would load my pushcart with cheap hosiery collars brushes hand mirrors notebooks shoelaces and the like and sometimes with several of these articles at once but more often with one at a time in the latter case i would announce to the passers-by the glad news that i had struck a miraculous bargain at a wholesale bankruptcy sale for instance and exhort them not to miss their golden opportunity i also learned to crumple up new underwear or even to wet it somewhat and then shout that i could sell it so cheap because it was slightly damaged i earned enough to pay my board but i developed neither vim nor ardor for the occupation i hankered after intellectual interest and was unceasingly homesick i was greatly tempted to call on mr even but deferred the visit until i should make a better showing i hated the constant chase and scramble for bargains and i hated to yell and scream in order to create a demand for my wares by the sheer force of my lungs many an illiterate dolt easily outshouted me and thus dampened what little interest i had mustered one fellow in particular was a source of discouragement to me he was a half-witted hideous-looking man with no end of vocal energy and senseless fervour he was a veritable engine of imbecile vitality he would make the street ring with deafening shrieks working his arms and head sputtering and foaming at the mouth like a madman and it produced results his nervous fit would have a peculiar effect on the pedestrians one could not help pausing and buying something of him the block where we usually did business was one of the best but i hated him so violently that i finally moved my pushcart to a less desirable locality i came home in despair oh it takes a blockhead to make a success of it i complained to mrs deanstog why why she consoled me it is a sin to be grumbling like that there are lots of peddlers who have been years in america and who would be glad to earn as much as you do it'll be all right don't worry mr levinsky it was less than a fortnight before i changed my place of business once again the only thing by which these few days became fixed in my memory was the teeth of a young man named volodsky and the peculiar tale of woe he told me he was a homely commonplace-looking man but his teeth were so beautiful that their glistening whiteness irritated me somewhat they were his own natural teeth but i thought them out of place amid his plain features or amid the features of any other man for that matter they seemed to be more suited to the face of a woman his pushcart was next to mine but he sold or tried to sell hardware while my cart was laden with other goods and as he was moreover as much of a failure as i was there was no reason why we should not be friends so we spent the day in heart-to-heart -heart talks of our hard luck and homesickness his chief worry was over the dower money which he had borrowed of his sister at home to pay his passage she gave it to me cheerfully he said in a brooding listless way she thought i would send it back to her at once people over there think treasure really can be had for the picking in america well i have been over two years here and have not been able to send her a cent her letters make holes in my heart she has a good marriage chance so she says and unless i send her the money at once it will be off her lamentations will drive me into the grave chapter four i soon had to move from the dienstags to make room for a relative of the truck drivers who had arrived from england my second lodgings were an exact copy of my first a lounge in a kitchen serving as my bed to add to the similarity my new landlady was incessantly singing only she had three children and her songs were all in yiddish her ordinary speech teemed with oaths like strike me blind may i not be able to move my arms or my legs may i spend every cent of it on doctor's bills may i not be able to get up from this chair a great many of our women will spice their yiddish with this kind of imprecations but she was far above the average in this respect the curious thing about her was that her name was mrs levinsky though we were not related in the remotest degree whatever enthusiasm there was in me found vent in religion i spent many an evening at the antomir synagogue reading talmud passionately this would bring my heart in touch with my old home with dear old reb sender with the grave of my poor mother it was the only pleasure i had in those days 
and it seemed to be the highest I had ever enjoyed. At times I would feel the tears coming to my eyes for the sheer joy of hearing my own sing-song, my old Antomir sing-song. It was like an echo from the preacher's synagogue. My former self was addressing me across the sea in this strange, uninviting, big town where I was compelled to peddle shoe-black or oilcloth and to compete with a yelling idiot. I would picture my mother gazing at me as I stood at my pushcart. I could almost see her slapping her hands in despair. As for my love, it had settled down to a chronic dull pain that asserted itself on special occasions only. I was so homesick that my former lodging in New York, to which I had become so used, now seemed like home by comparison. I missed the Dean's togs keenly, and I visited them quite often. I wrote long, passionate letters to Reb Sender, in a conglomeration of the Talmudic jargon, bad Hebrew, and good Yiddish, referring to the Talmud studies I pursued in America, and pouring out my forlorn heart to him. His affectionate answers brought me inexpressible happiness. But many of the other peddlers made fun of my piety, and it could not last long. Moreover, I was in contact with life now, and the daily surprises it had in store for me dealt my former ideas of the world blow after blow. I saw the cunning and the meanness of some of my customers, of the tradespeople of whom I bought my wares, and of peddlers who did business by my side. Nor was I unaware of certain unlovable traits that were unavoidably developing in my own self under these influences. And while human nature was thus growing smaller, the human world as a whole was growing larger, more complex, more heartless, and more interesting. The striking thing was that it was not a world of piety. I spoke to scores of people, and saw tens of thousands. Very few of the women who passed my pushcart wore wigs, and men who did not shave were an exception. Also, I knew that many of the people with whom I came in daily contact openly patronized Gentile restaurants, and would not hesitate even to eat pork. The Orthodox Jewish faith, as it is followed in the old ghetto towns of Russia or Austria, has still to learn the art of trimming its sails to suit new winds. It is exactly the same as it was a thousand years ago. It does not attempt to adopt itself to modern conditions as the Christian church is continually doing. It is absolutely inflexible. If you are a Jew of the type to which I belonged when I came to New York, and you attempt to bend your religion to the spirit of your new surroundings, it breaks. It falls to pieces. The very clothes I wore and the very food I ate had a fatal effect on my religious habits. A whole book could be written on the influence of the starched collar and a necktie on a man who was brought up as I was. It was inevitable that, sooner or later, I should let a barber shave my sprouting beard. "'What do you want those things for?' Mrs. Levinsky once said to me, pointing at my nascent whiskers. "'Oh, go take a shave and don't be a fool. It will make you ever so much better looking. May my luck be as handsome as your face will then be.' Never, I retorted, testily, yet blushing. She gave a sarcastic snort. They all speak like that at the beginning, she said. The girls will make you shave if nobody else does. What girls? I asked with a scowl, but blushing once again. What do I know what girls? She laughed. That's your own lookout, not mine. I did not like her. She was provokingly crafty and cold, and she had a mean smile and a dishonest face that often irritated me. She was ruddy-faced and bursting with health, taller than Mrs. Deanstog, yet too short for her great breadth of shoulder and the enormous bulk of her bust. I thought she looked absurdly dumpy. What I particularly hated in her was her laughter, which sounded for all the world like the gobble of a turkey. She was constantly importuning me to get her another lodger who would share her kitchen lounge with me. Rent is so high, I am losing money on you. May I have a year of darkness if I am not? She would din in my ears. She was intolerable to me, but I liked her cooking, and I hated to be moving again, so I remained several months in her house. It was not long before her prediction as to the fate of my beard came true. I took a shave. What actually decided me to commit so heinous a sin was a remark dropped by one of the peddlers that my down-covered face made me look like a green one. It was the most cruel thing he could have told me. I took a look at myself as soon as I could get near a mirror, and the next day I received my first shave. What would Reb Sender say, I thought. When I came home that evening, I was extremely ill at ease. Mrs. Levinsky noticed the change at once, but she also noticed my embarrassment, so she said nothing. But she was continually darting furtive glances at me, and when our eyes met she seemed to be on the verge of bursting into one of her turkey laughs. I could have murdered her. 
End of chapter 4 and end of book 5 I Discover America Book 6, Chapters 1 and 2 of The Rise of David Levinsky. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Kahan. Book 6, A Greenhorn No Longer. Chapters 1 and 2. Chapter 1. I bought my goods in several places and made the acquaintance of many peddlers. One of these attracted my attention by his popularity among the other men and by his peculiar talks of women. His name was Max Margolis. We used to speak of him as Big Max, to distinguish him from a little Max, till one day a peddler who was a good chess player and was then studying algebra changed the two names to Maximum Max and Minimum Max, which the other peddlers pronounced Maxi Max and Mini Max. Some of the other fellows, too, were addicted to obscene storytelling, but these mostly made, or pretended to make, a joke of it. The man who had changed Max's sobriquet, for instance, never tired of composing smutty puns, while another man, who had a married daughter, was continually hinting with merry bravado at his illicit successes with Gentile women. Maximum Max, on the other hand, would treat his lascivious topics with peculiar earnestness, and even with something like sadness, as though he dwelt on them in spite of himself, under the stress of an obsession. Otherwise, he was a jovial fellow. He was a tall, large-boned man, loosely built. His lips were always moist, and when closed, they were never in tight contact. He had the reputation of a liar, and as is often the case with those who suffer from that weakness, people liked him. Nor, indeed, were his fibs, as a rule, made out of whole cloth. They usually had a basis of truth. When he told a story and he felt that it was producing no effect, he would play it up, as newspaper men would put it, often quite grotesquely. Altogether, he was so inclined to overemphasize and embellish his facts that it was not always easy to say where truth ended and fiction began. Somehow it seemed to me as though the moistness and looseness of his lips had something to do with his mendacity. He was an ignorant man barely able to write down an address. Max was an installment peddler, his chief business being with frequenters of dance halls, to whom he sold clothing, dress goods, jewelry, and when there was a marriage among them, furniture. Many a young housewife who had met her predestined one in one of these halls wore a marriage ring and had her front room furnished with a parlor set bought of Max Margolis. He was as popular among the dancers as he was among the men he met at the stores. He was married, Max, yet it was as much by his interest in the dancers as by his business interest that he was drawn to the dance halls. He took a fancy to me, and he often made me listen to his discourses on women. The youngest married man usually appealed to me as being old enough to be my father, and as Maximum Max was not only married, but eleven years my senior, there seemed to be a great chasm between us. That he should hold this kind of conversations with an unmarried youngster like myself struck me as something unnatural, doubly indecent. As I listened, I would feel awkward, but would listen nevertheless. One day he looked me over, much as an expert in horse flesh would a colt, and said, with the utmost seriousness, Do you know, Levinsky, you have an awfully fine figure. You are a good-looking chap all around, for that matter. A fellow like you ought to make a hit with women. Why don't you learn to dance? The compliment made me wince and blush. Perhaps if he had put it in the form of a jest, I should have even liked it. As it was, I felt like one stripped in public. Still, I recalled with pleasure that Matilda had said similar things about my figure. "'Why don't you learn to dance, Levinsky?' he repeated. I laughed, waving the suggestion aside as a joke. "'On another occasion,' he said, "'every woman can be won, absolutely every one, provided a fellow knows how to go about it.' As he proceeded to develop his theory, he described various types of women and the various methods to be used with them. "'Of course the man must not be repulsive to her,' he said." That evening, when Mrs. Levinsky's husband, their three children, and myself sat around the table and she was serving us our supper, she appeared in a new light to me. She was nearly twice my age, and I hated her not only for her meanness and low cunning, but also for her massive, broad-shouldered figure and for her turkey laugh. But she was a full-blooded, healthy female, after all. So, as I looked at her bustling between the table and the stove, Max's rule came back to me. I could almost hear his voice. Every woman can be one, absolutely every one. 
mrs levinsky's oldest child was a young man of nearly my age yet i looked her over lustfully and when i found that her florid skin was almost spotless her lips fresh and her black hair without a hint of gray i was glad presently while removing my plate she threw the trembling bulk of her great firm bust under my very eyes i felt disturbed some morning when we are alone i said to myself i shall kiss those red lips of hers from that moment on she was my quarry as her husband worked in a sweatshop while I peddled, he usually got up at least an hour before me, and it was considered perfectly natural that Mrs. Levinsky should be hovering about the kitchen while I was sleeping or lying awake on the kitchen lounge. Also, that after her husband left for the day, I should go around half-naked, washing and dressing myself, in the same crowded little room in which she was then doing her work, as scantily clad as I was, and with the sleeves of her flimsy blouse rolled up to her armpits. I had never noticed these things before, but on the morning following the above supper I did. As I opened my eyes and saw her bare, fleshy arms held out toward the little kerosene stove, I thought of my resolve to kiss her. She was humming something in a very low voice. To let her know that I was awake, I stretched myself and yawned audibly. Her voice rose. It was a song from a well-known Jewish play she was singing. "'Good morning, Mrs. Levinsky,' I greeted her, in a familiar tone which she now heard for the first time from me. You seem to be in good spirits this morning. She was evidently a taken aback. I was the last man in the world she would have expected to address a remark of this kind to her. How can you see it? she asked, with a side glance to me. Have I no ears? Don't I hear your beautiful singing? Beautiful singing, she said without looking at me. After a considerable pause, I said awkwardly, You know, Mrs. Levinsky, I dreamed of you last night. Did you? Aren't you interested to know something more about it? I dreamed of telling you that you are a good-looking lady, I pursued with a fast-beating heart. What has got into the fellow? she asked of the kerosene stove. He is a greenhorn no longer as true as I am alive. You won't deny that you are good-looking, will you? What is that to you? And again addressing herself to the kerosene stove. What do you think of that fellow? A pious Talmudist, indeed. Strike me blind if I ever saw one like that. And she uttered a gobble-like chuckle. I saw the encouragement in her manner. I went on to talk of her songs and the Jewish theater, a topic for which I knew her to have a singular weakness. The upshot was that I soon had her telling me of a play she had recently seen. As she spoke, it was inevitable that she should come up close to the lounge. As she did so, her fingers touched my quilt, her bare, sturdy arms paralyzing my attention. The temptation to grasp them was tightening its grip on me. I decided to begin by taking hold of her hand. I warned myself that it must be done gently, with romance in my touch. I shall just caress her hand, I decided, not hearing a word of what she was saying. I brought my hand close to hers. My heart beat violently. I was just about to touch her fingers, but I let the opportunity pass. I turned the conversation on to her husband, on his devotion to her, on their wedding. She mocked my questions, but answered them all the same. He must have been awfully in love with you, I said. What business is that of yours? Where did you learn to ask such questions? At the synagogue? Of course he loved me. What would you have? That he should have hated me? Why did he marry me then? Of course he was in love with me, else I would not have married him, would I? Are you satisfied now? She boasted of the rich and well-connected suitor she had rejected. I felt that I had sidetracked my flirtation. Touching her hand would have been out of place now. A few minutes later, when I was saying my morning prayers, I carefully kept my eyes away from her lest I should meet her sneering glance. When I had finished my devotions and had put my phylacteries into their little bag, I sat down to breakfast. I don't like this woman at all, I said to myself, looking at her. In fact, I abhor her. Why, then, am I so crazy to carry on with her? It was the same question that I had once asked myself concerning my contradictory feelings for Red Esther, but my knowledge of life had grown considerably since then. In those days I had made the discovery that there were kisses prompted by affection and kisses prompted by Satan. I now added that even love of the flesh might be of two distinct kinds. There is love of body and soul, and there is a kind of love that is of the body only, I theorized. There is love, and there is lust. I thought of my feelings for Matilda. That certainly was love. Various details of my relations with Matilda came back to me during these days. One afternoon, as I was brooding over these recollections, while passively awaiting customers at my cart, I conjured up that night scene when she sat on the great green sofa and I went into ecstasies, speaking of my prospective studies for admission to a Russian university. I recalled how she had been irritated with me for talking too loud and how, calling me a Talmud student, 
or ninny she had abruptly left the room i had thought of the scene a hundred times before but now a new interpretation of it flashed through my mind it all seemed so obvious i had certainly been a ninny an idiot i burst into a sarcastic titter at matilda's expense and my own of course i was a ninny i scoffed at myself again and again i saw matilda from a new angle it was as if she had suddenly slipped off her pedestal instead of lamenting my fallen idol however i gloated over her fall and instead of growing cold to her i felt that she was nearer to me than ever nearer and dearer chapter two one morning after breakfast when i was about to leave the house and mrs levinsky was detaining me trying to exact a promise that i should get somebody to share the lounge with me i said i'll see about it i must be going good-bye at this i took her hand ostensibly in farewell good-bye she said coloring and trying to free herself good-bye i repeated shaking her hand gently and smiling upon her she wrenched out her hand i took hold of her chin but she shook it free don't she said shyly turning around what's the matter i said gaily she faced about again i'll tell you what the matter is she said if you do that again you will have to move if you think i am one of those landladies you know the kind i mean you are mistaken she uttered it in calm rather amicable accents so i replied why why of course i don't indeed you are the most respectable and the most sweet-looking woman in the world i stepped up close to her and reached out my hand to seize hold of her bare arm none of that mister she flared up drawing back keep your hands where they belong if you try that again i'll break every bone in your body may both my hands be paralyzed if i don't Shh! i implored which only added fuel to her rage Shh! nothing i'll call in all the neighbors of the house and tell them the kind of pious man you are saying his prayers three times a day indeed i sneaked out of the house like a thief i was wretched all day wondering how i should come to supper in the evening i wondered whether she was going to deliver me over to the jealous wrath of her husband i should have willingly forfeited my trunk and settled in another place but mrs levinsky had an approximate knowledge of the places where i was likely to do business and there was danger of a scene from her maximum max's theory did not seem to count for much but then he had said that one must know how to go about it perhaps i had been too hasty late in the afternoon of that day mrs levinsky came to see me pretending to be passing along on some errand she paused in front of my cart accosting me pleasantly i'll bet you are angry with me she said smiling broadly i'm not angry at all i answered with feigned moroseness but you certainly have a tongue Whew! and well you can't take a joke i did not mean to hurt your feelings mr levinsky may my luck be as good as is my friendship for you i certainly wish you no evil may god give me all the things i wish you i just want you to behave yourself that's all i am so much older than you anyhow look for somebody of your own age you're not angry with me are you she added suavely she simply could not afford to lose the rent i paid her since then she held herself at a respectable distance from me i called on smiling mrs dinestog my former landlady in whose house i was no stranger i timed this visit at an hour when i knew her to be alone in this venture i met with scarcely any resistance at first she let me hold her hand and caress it and tell her how soft and tender it was do you think so she said coyly her eyes clouding with embarrassment i don't think they are soft at all they would be if i did not have so much washing and scrubbing to do then she added sadly america has made a servant of me a land of gold indeed when i was in my father's house i did not have to scrub floors i attempted to raise her wrist to my lips but she checked me she did not break away from me however she held me off but she did not let go of the index finger of my right hand which she clutched with all her might playfully as we struggled we both laughed nervously at last i wrenched my finger from her grip and before she had time to thwart my purpose she was in my arms i was aiming a kiss at her lips but she continued to turn and twist trying to clap her hand over my mouth as she did so and my kiss landed on one side of her chin just one more dearest i raved only one on your sweet little lips my dove only one only one she yielded our lips joined in a feverish kiss then she thrust me away from her and after a pause shook her finger at me with a good-natured gesture as much to say you must not do that bad boy you I went away in high feather I called on mrs. Dinestog again the very next morning she received me well but the first thing she did after returning my greeting was to throw the door wide open and to offer me a chair in full view of the hallway oh shut the door I whispered in disgust don't be foolish she shook her head 
just one kiss i begged her you are so sweet she held firm i came away sorely disappointed but convinced that her inflexibility was a mere matter of practical common sense i kept these experiences and reflections to myself nor did an indecent word ever cross my lips in the street while attending to my business i heard uncouth language quite often the other pushcart men would utter the most revolting improprieties in the hearing of the women peddlers or even address such talk to them as a matter of course nor was it an uncommon incident for a peddler to fire a volley of obscenities at a departing housewife who had priced something on his cart without buying it these things scandalized me beyond words i could never get accustomed to them look at levinsky standing there quiet as a kitten the other peddlers would twit me one would think he is so innocent he doesn't know how to count too shy young fellows are the worst devils in the world they were partly mistaken during the first few weeks of our acquaintance at least for the last thread that bound me to chastity was still unbroken it was rapidly wearing away though end of chapter two book six chapter three of the rise of david levinsky this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Kahan Book Six A Greenhorn No Longer Chapter Three The last thread snapped. It was the beginning of a period of unrestrained misconduct. Intoxicated by the novelty of yielding to Satan, I gave him a free hand, and the result was months of debauchery and self disgust. The underworld women I met, the humdrum filth of their life, and their matter of fact, business like attitude toward it never ceased to shock and repel me. I never left a creature of this kind without abominating her and myself, yet I would soon, sometimes during the very same evening, call on her again or on some other woman of her class. Many of these women would simulate love, but they failed to deceive me. I knew that they lied and shammed to me just as I did to my customers, and their insincerities were only another source of repugnance to me. But I frequented them, in spite of it all, in spite of myself. I spent on them more than I could afford. Sometimes I would borrow money or pawn something for the purpose of calling on them. The fact that these wretched women were not segregated as they were in my native town probably had something to do with it. Instead of being confined to a fixed, out-of-the-way locality, they were allowed to live in the same tenement houses with respectable people, beckoning to men from the front steps, under open protection from the police. Indeed, the police, as silent partners in the profits of their shame, plainly encouraged this vice traffic all of which undoubtedly helped to make a profligate of me, but, of course, it would be preposterous to charge it all, or even chiefly, to the police. My wild oats were flavored with a sense of my failure as a businessman, by my homesickness and passion for Matilda. My pushcart bored me. I was hungry for intellectual interest, for novel sensations. I was restless. Sometimes I would stop from business in the middle of the day to plunge into a page of Talmud at some nearby synagogue, and sometimes I would lay down the holy book in the middle of a sentence and betake myself to the residence of some fallen woman. In my loneliness I would look for some human element in my acquaintance with these women. I would ply them with questions about their antecedents, their family connections, as my mother had done the girl from that street. As a rule my questions bored them and their answers were obvious fabrications, but there were some exceptions. One of these, a plump, handsome, languid-eyed female named Bertha, occupied two tiny rooms in which she lived with her ten-year-old daughter. One of the two rooms was often full of men, some of them with heavy beards, who would sit there, each awaiting his turn, as patients do in the reception room of a physician, and whiling their time away by chaffing the little girl upon her mother's occupation and her own future. Some of the questions and jokes they would address to her were of the most revolting nature, whereupon she would reply, Oh, go to hell! or stick out her tongue resentfully. One day I asked Bertha why she was giving her child this sort of bringing up. I once tried to keep her in another place with a respectable family, she replied ruefully, but she would not stay there. Besides, I missed her so much I could not stand it. Another fallen woman who was frank with me proved to be a native of Antomir. When she heard that I was from the same place, she flushed with excitement. Go away, she shouted. You're fooling me. We talked of the streets, lanes, and yards of our birthplace, she hailing every name I uttered with outbursts of wistful enthusiasm. I wondered whether she knew of my mother's sensational death, but I never disclosed my identity to her, though she on her part told me with impetuous frankness the whole story of her life. 
you are a talmudist aren't you she asked how do you know how do i know as if it could not be seen by your face a little later she said i am sorry you came here honest you should have stayed at home and stuck to your holy books it would have been a thousand times better than coming to america and calling on girls like myself honest she was known as argentine rachel it was from her that i first heard of the relations existing between the underworld and the police of new york but then my idea of the russian police had always been associated in my mind with everything cruel and dishonest so the corruption of the new york police did not seem to be anything unusual one day she said to me if you want a good street corner for your cart i can fix it for you i know cuff button leary who is he why have you never heard about him is he a big police officer bigger the police are afraid of him why because he is the boss he is the district leader what he says goes she went on to explain that he was the local chieftain of the dominant politician party as she termed it what is a politician party i asked she tried to define it and failing in her attempt she said with a giggle oh you are a boob you certainly are a green one why it's an organization a lot of people who stick together don't you know she talked on and the upshot was that i formed a conception of political parties as of a kind of competing business companies whose specialty it was to make millions by ruling some big city levying tribute on fallen women thieves and liquor dealers doing favors to friends and meeting out punishment to foes i learned also that district leader leary owed his surname to a celebrated pair of diamond cuff buttons said to have cost him fifteen thousand dollars from which he was never separated and by the blaze of which he could be recognized at a distance well shall i speak to him about you she asked i gave her an evasive answer why don't you want to have favors from a girl like me she laughed i colored whereupon she remarked reflectively i don't blame you either she never tired talking of our birthplace aren't you homesick she once demanded not a bit i answered with bravado then you have no heart i have been away five times as long as you yet i am homesick really honest she was as repellent to me as the rest of her class i could never bring myself to accept a cup of tea from her hands and yet i could not help liking her spirit she was truthful and affectionate this and above all her yearning for our common birthplace appealed to me strongly i was very much inclined to think that in spite of the horrible life she led she was a good girl to hold this sort of opinion about a woman of her kind seemed to be an improper thing to do i knew that according to the conventional idea concerning women of the street they were all the most hideous creatures in the world in every respect so i would tell myself that i must consider her too one of the most hideous creatures in the world in every respect but i did not for i knew that at heart she was better than some of the most respectable people i had met it was one of the astonishing discrepancies i had discovered in the world also it was one of the things i had found to be totally different from what people usually thought they were i was gradually realizing that the average man or woman was full of all sorts of false notions end of chapter three book six chapter four of the rise of david levitsky this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the rise of david levinsky by abraham kahan book six a greenhorn no longer chapter four i enrolled in a public evening school i threw myself into my studies with unbonded enthusiasm after all it was a matter of book learning something in which i felt at home some of my classmates had a much better practical acquaintance with english than i but few of these could best the mental training that my talmud education had given me as a consequence i found things irksomely slow still the teacher a young east side dude hazel-eyed apple-faced and girlish of feature and voice was a talkative fellow with oratorical proclivities and his garrulousness was of great value to me he was of german descent and as i subsequently learned from private conversations with him his mother was american born like himself so english was his mother tongue in the full sense of the term he would either address us wholly in that tongue or intersperse it with interpretations in labored german which thanks to my native yiddish i had no difficulty in understanding his name was bender at first i did not like him 
yet i would hang on his lips striving to memorize every english word i could catch and watching him intently not only his enunciation but also his gestures manners and mannerisms and accepting it all as part and parcel of the american way of speaking sign language which was the chief means of communication in the early days of mankind still holds its own it retains sway over nations of the highest culture with tongues of unlimited wealth and variety and the gestures of the various countries are as different as their spoken languages the gesticulations and facial expressions with which an american will supplement his english are as distinctly american as those of a frenchman are distinctly french one can tell the nationality of a stranger by his gestures as readily as by his language in a vague general way i had become aware of this before probably from contact with some american-born jews whose gesticulations when they spoke yiddish impressed me as utterly un yiddish and so i studied bender's gestures almost as closely as i did his words even the slight lisp in his s i accepted as part of the real yankee utterance nor indeed was this unnatural in view of the th sound that stumbling block of every foreigner whom it must needs strike as a full-grown lisp bender spoke with a nasal twang which i am now inclined to think he paraded as an accessory to the over-dignified drawl he affected in the classroom but then i had noticed this kind of twang in the delivery of other americans as well so altogether english impressed me as the language of a people afflicted with defective organs of speech or else it would seem to me that the americans had normal organs of speech but that they made special efforts to distort the t into a th and the v into a w one of the things I discovered was the unsmiling smile. I often saw it on Bender and on other Native Americans, on the principal of the school, for instance, who was an Anglo-Saxon. In Russia, among the people I knew at least, one either smiled or not. Here I found a peculiar kind of smile that was not a smile. It would flash up into a lifeless flame and forthwith go out again, leaving the face cold and stiff. They laugh with their teeth only, I would say to myself but of course i saw real smiles too on americans and i instinctively learned to discern the smile of mere politeness from the sort that came from one's heart nevertheless one evening when we were reading in our school book that kate had a smile for everybody and i saw that this was stated in praise of kate i had a disagreeable vision of a little girl going around the streets and grinning upon everybody she met i abhorred the teacher for his girlish looks and affectations but his twang and th made me literally pant with hatred at the same time i strained every nerve to imitate him in these very sounds it was a hard struggle and when i had overcome all difficulties at last and my girlish looking teacher complimented me enthusiastically upon my thick and thin my aversion for him suddenly thawed out two of my classmates were a grisly heavy-set man and his sixteen-year-old son both trying to learn english after a long day's work on one occasion when it was the boy's turn to read and he said bat for bath the teacher bellowed imperiously stick out the tip of your tongue this way the boy tried and failed oh you have the brain of a horse his father said impatiently in yiddish let me try mr teacher and screwing up his bewhiskered face he yelled bat then he shot out half an inch of thick red tongue the teacher grinned struggling with a more pronounced manifestation of his mirth his tongue missed the train i jested in yiddish one of the other pupils translated it into english whereupon bender's suppressed laughter broke loose and i warmed to him still more election day was drawing near the streets were alive with the banners transparencies window portraits of rival candidates processions fireworks speeches i heard scores of words from the political jargon of the country i was continually asking questions inquiring into the meaning of the things i saw or heard around me each day brought me new experiences fresh impressions keen sensations an american day seemed to be far richer in substance than an antimere year i was in an everlasting flutter i seemed to be panting for breath for the sheer speed with which i was rushing through life what was the meaning of all this noise and excitement everybody i spoke to said it was all humbug people were making jokes at the expense of all politicians irrespective of parties one is as bad as the other i heard all around me they are all thieves argentine rachel's conception of politics was clearly the conception of respectable people as well rejoicing of the law is one of our great autumn holidays it is a day of picturesque merrymaking and ceremony when the stringent rule barring women out of a synagogue is relaxed on that day which was a short time before election day i saw an east side judge a gentile at the synagogue of the sons of antomir he was very short and the high hat he wore gave him a droll dignity 
he went around the house of worship kissing the babies in their mother's arms and saying pleasant things to the worshipers every little while he would instinctively raise his hand to his hat and then reminding himself that one did not bear one's head in a synagogue he would feverishly drop his hand again this part of the scene was so utterly so strikingly un-russian that i watched it open-mouthed a great friend of the jewish people isn't he the worshipper who stood next to me remarked archly he is simply in love with this i chimed in with a laugh by way of showing off my understanding of things american it's jewish votes he is after still he's not a bad fellow the man by my side remarked if you have a trial in his court he'll decide it in your favor how is that i asked perplexed and how about the other fellow he can't decide in favor of both can he there is no can't in america the man by my side returned with a sage smile i pondered the riddle until i saw the light i know what you mean i said he does favors only to those who vote for his party you have hit it upon my word you're certainly no longer a green one voting alone may not be enough though another worshipper interposed if you ever happen to have a case in his court take a lawyer who is close to the judge understand all such talks notwithstanding the campaign or the spectacular novelty of it thrilled me bender delivered a speech to our class but all i could make of it was that it dealt with elections in general and that it was something solemn and lofty like a prayer or a psalm election day came round i did not rest i was continually snooping around watching the politicians and their customers as we called the voters traffic in votes was quite an open business in those days and i saw a good deal of it on a side street in the vicinity of a certain polling place or even in front of the polling place itself under the very eyes of policemen i saw the bargaining the haggling between buyer and seller i saw money passed from the one to the other i saw a healer put a ballot into the hand of a man whose vote he had just purchased the present system of voting had not yet been introduced and then march him into a polling place to make sure that he deposited the ballot for which he had paid him i saw a man beaten black and blue because he had cheated the party that had paid him for his vote i saw leary blazing cuff buttons and all he was a broad-shouldered man with rather pleasing features i saw him listening to a whispered report from one of the men whom i had seen buying votes there was no such thing as political life in the russia of that period the only political parties in existence there were the secret organizations of revolutionists of people for whom government detectives were incessantly searching so that they might be hanged or sent to siberia as a consequence a great many of our immigrants landed in america absolutely ignorant of the meaning of citizenship and the first practical instructors on the subjects into whose hands they fell were men like cuff button leary or his political underlings these taught them that a vote was something to be sold for two or three dollars with the prospect of future favors into the bargain and that a politician was a specialist in doing people favors 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 i heard the word so often in connection with politics that the two words became inseparable in my mind a politician was a master of favors as my native tongue would have it i attended school with religious devotion this and the rapid progress i was making endeared me to bender and he gave me special attention he taught me grammar which i relished most keenly the prospect of going to school in the evening would loom before me during the hours of boredom or distress i spent at my cart as a promise of divine pleasure some english words inspired me with hatred as though they were obnoxious living things the disagreeable impression they produced on me was so strong that it made them easy to memorize so that i welcomed them in spite of my aversion or rather because of it the list of these words included satisfaction think and because at the end of the first month i knew infinitely more english than i did russian one evening i asked bender to tell me the real difference between i wrote and i have written he had explained it to me once or twice before but i was none the wiser for it what do you mean by real difference he demanded i have told you haven't i that i wrote is the perfect tense while i have written is the imperfect tense this was in accordance with the grammatical terminology of the days i know i replied in my wretched english but what is the difference between these two tenses that's just what bothers me well he said grandly the perfect refers to what was while the imperfect means something that has been but when do you say was and when do you say has been that's just the question you're a nuisance levinsky was his final retort i was tempted to say and you are a blockhead but i did not of course at the bottom of my heart i had a conviction that one who had not studied the talmud could not be anything but a blockhead the first thing he did the next evening was to take up the same subject with me the rest of the class watching the two of us curiously 
i could see that his performance of the previous night had been troubling him and that he was bent upon making a better showing he spent the entire lesson of two hours with me exclusively trying all sorts of elucidations and illustrations all without avail the trouble with him was that he pictured the working of a foreigner's mind with regard to english as that of his own it did not occur to him that people born to speak another language were guided by another language logic so to say and that in order to reach my understanding he would have to impart his ideas in terms of my own linguistic psychology still one of his numerous examples gave me a glimmer of light and finally it all became clear to me i expressed my joy so boisterously that it brought a roar of laughter from the other men he made a pet of me i became the monitor of his class that is i would bring in and distribute the books and he often had me escort him home so as to talk to me as we walked he was extremely companionable and loquacious he had a passion for sharing with others whatever knowledge he had or for simply hearing himself speak upon reaching the house in which he lived we would pause in front of the building for an hour or even more or else we would start on a ramble usually through grand street to east river and back again through east broadway his favorite topics during these walks were civics american history and his own history diligence perseverance tenacity he would drawl out with nasal dignity get these three words engraved on your mind levinsky diligence perseverance tenacity and by way of illustration he would enlarge on how he had fought his way through city college how he had won some prizes and beaten a rival in a race for the presidency of a literary society how he had obtained his two present occupations as customs house clerk during the day and as school teacher in the winter evenings and how he was going to work himself up to something far more dignified and lucrative he unbosomed himself to me of all his plans he confided some of his intimate secrets in me often dwelling on my young lady who was a first cousin of his and to whom he had practically been engaged since boyhood all this his boasts not accepted were of incalculable profit to me it introduced me to detail after detail of american life it accelerated the process of getting me out of my greenhorn hood in the better sense of the phrase bender was an ardent patriot he was sincerely proud of his country he was firmly convinced that it was superior to any other country absolutely in every respect one evening in the course of one of those rambles of ours he took up the subject of political parties with me he explained the respective principles of the republicans and the democrats being a democrat himself he eulogized his own organization and assailed its rival but he did it strictly along the lines of principle and policy the principles of a policy are its soul he thundered probably borrowing the phrase from some newspaper and he proceeded to show that the democratic soul was of superior quality he went into the question of state rights of personal liberty of jeffersonian ideals it was all an abstract formula and i was so overwhelmed by the image of a great organization fighting for lofty ideals that the concrete question of political baby kissing of cuff button leary's power and of the scenes i had witnessed on election day escaped me at the moment i merely felt that all i had heard about politics and political parties from argentine rachel and from other people was the product of untutored brains that looked at things from the special viewpoint of the gutter presently however the screaming discrepancy between cuff button leary's rule and jeffersonian ideals did occur to me i conveyed my thoughts to bender as well as i could he flared up nonsense he said mr leary is the best man in the city he is a friend of mine and i am proud of it ask him for any favor and he will do it for you if he has to get out of bed in the middle of the night he spends a fortune on the poor he has the biggest heart of any man in all new york i don't care who he is he helps a lot of people out of trouble but he can't help everybody can he that's why you hear so many bad things about him he has a lot of enemies but i love him just for the enemies he has made people say he collects bribes from disreputable women i ventured to urge it's a lie it's all rumors he shouted testily on election day i saw a man who was buying votes whisper to him whisper to him whisper to him ha 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 well is that all the evidence you have got against mr leary i suppose that's the kind of evidence you have about the buying of votes too i'm afraid you don't quite understand what you see levinsky his answers were far from convincing i was wondering what interest he had to defend leary to deny things that everybody saw but he disarmed me by the force of his irritation bender himself was a clean honest fellow in his peculiar american way he was very religious and i knew that his piety was not a mere affectation which was another puzzle for me for all the educated jews of my birthplace were known to be atheists he belonged to a reformed synagogue where he conducted a bible class one evening he expanded on the beauty of the english translation of the old testament 
he told me it was the best english to be found in all literature study the bible levinsky read it and read it again the suggestion took my fancy for i could read the english bible with the aid of the original hebrew text i began with psalm 104 the poem that had thrilled me when i was on shipboard i read the english version of it before bender until i pronounced the words correctly i thought i realized their music i got the chapter by heart when i recited it before bender he was joyously surprised and called me a corker what is a corker i asked beamingly it's slang for a great fellow with which he burst into a lecture on slang i often sat up till the small hours studying the english bible i had many a quarrel with mrs levinsky over the kerosene i consumed finally it was arranged that i should pay her five cents for every night i sat up late but this merely changed the bone of contention between us instead of quarreling over kerosene we would quarrel over hours over the question whether i really had sat up late or not to this day whenever i happen to utter certain biblical words or names in their english version they seem to smell of mrs levinsky's lamp end of chapter four book six chapter five of the rise of david levinsky this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the rise of david levinsky by abraham kahan book six a greenhorn no longer chapter five evening school closed in april the final session was of a festive character bender excited and sentimental distributed some presents promise me that you will read this glorious book from beginning to end levinsky he said solemnly as he handed me a new volume of dombey and son and a small dictionary we may never meet again so you will have something to remind you that once upon a time you had a teacher whose name was bender and who tried to do his duty i wanted to thank him to say something handsome but partly because i was overcome by his gift partly because i was at a loss for words i merely kept saying sheepishly thank you thank you thank you thank you that volume of dickens proved to be the ruin of my pushcart business and caused me some weeks of the blackest misery i had ever experienced as i started to read the voluminous book i found it an extremely difficult task it seemed as though it was written in a language other than the one i had been studying during the past few months I had to turn to the dictionary for the meaning of every third word if not more often while in many cases several words in succession were greek to me some words could not be found in my little dictionary at all and in the case of many others the english definitions were as much of an enigma to me as the words they were supposed to interpret yet i was making headway i had to turn to the dictionary less and less often it was the first novel i had ever read the dramatic interest of the narrative coupled with the poetry and the humor with which it is so richly spiced was a revelation to me i had no idea that gentiles were capable of anything so wonderful in the line of book writing to all of which should be added my self-congratulations upon being able to read english of this sort a state of mind which i was too apt to mistake for my raptures over dickens it seemed to me that people who were born to speak this language were of a superior race I was literally intoxicated and drunkard like I would delay going to business from hour to hour the upshot was that I became so badly involved in debt that I dared not appear with my push cart for fear of scenes from my creditors moreover I scarcely had anything to sell finally I disposed of what little stock I possessed for one-fourth of its value and to my relief as well as to my despair my activities as a peddler came to an end I went on reading or rather studying dombey and son with such voluptuous abandon till i found myself literally penniless i procured a job with a man who sold dill pickles to jewish grocers from his description of my duties chiefly as his bookkeeper i expected that they would leave me plenty of leisure between whiles to read my dickens i was mistaken my first attempt to open the book during business hours which extended from eight in the morning to bedtime was suppressed my employer who had the complexion of a dill pickle by the way proved to be a severe taskmaster absurdly exacting and so niggardly that i dared not take a decent looking pickle for my lunch i left him at the end of the second week obtaining employment in a prosperous fish store next door my new boss was a kinder and pleasanter man but then the malodorous and clamorous chaos of his place literally sickened me i left the fishmonger and jumped my board at mrs levinsky's to go to a new jersey farm where i was engaged to read yiddish novels to the illiterate wife of a new york merchant but my client was soon driven from the place by the new jersey mosquitoes and i returned to new york with two dollars in my pocket 
I worked as an assistant in a Hebrew school where the American-born boys mocked my English and challenged me to have an American fight with them, till on my third day I administered a sound un-American thrashing to one of them and lost my job. Maximum Max got the proprietor of one of the dance halls in which he did his installment business to let me sleep in his basement in return for some odd jobs. While there, I earned from two to three dollars a week in tips and a good supper every time there was a wedding in the place, which happened two or three times a week. I had plenty of time for Dickens. I was still burrowing my way through Dombey and Son, while the affairs of the hall, weddings, banquets, balls, mass meetings, were quite exciting. I felt happy, but this happiness of mine did not last long. I was soon sent packing. This is the way it came about. It was in the large ballroom of the establishment in question that I saw a modern dance for the first time in my life. It produced a bewitching effect on me. Here were highly respectable young women who would let a man encircle their waists, each resting her arm on her partner's shoulder, and then go spinning and hopping with him, with a frank relish of the physical excitement in which they were joined. As I watched one of these girls, I seemed to see her surrender much of her womanly reserve. I knew that the dance, an ordinary waltz, was considered highly proper, yet her pose and his struck me as a public confession of unseemly mutual interest. I almost blushed for her and for the moment i was in love with her as this young woman went round and round her face bore a faint smile of embarrassed satisfaction i knew that it was a sex smile another woman danced with grave mien and i knew that it was the gravity of sex to watch dancing couples became a passion with me one evening as i stood watching the waltzing members of a wedding party a married sister of the bride's shouted to me in yiddish what are you doing here get out you're a killjoy this was her way of alluding to my unpresentable appearance. When the proprietor heard of the incident, he sent for me. He told me that I was a nuisance and bade me find another hangout for myself. The following month or two constitute the most wretched period of my life in America. I slept in the cheapest lodging houses on the Bowery and not infrequently in some express wagon. I was constantly borrowing quarters, dimes, and nickels. Maximum Max was very kind to me. As I could not meet him at the stores, where I dared not face my creditors, I would waylay him in front of his residence. I tell you what, Levinsky, he once said to me, you ought to learn some trade. It's plain you were not born to be a businessman. The black dots, meaning the words in books, take up too much room in your head. Finally, I owed him so many quarters and even half dollars that I had not the courage to ask him for more. Hunger was a frequent experience. I had been no stranger to the sensation at Antomir, at least after the death of my mother, but for some reason I was now less capable of bearing it. The pangs I underwent were at times so acute that I would pick up cigarette stubs in the street and smoke them, without being a smoker, for the purpose of having the pain supplanted by dizziness and nausea. Sometimes, too, I would burn my hand with a match or bite it as hard as I could. Any kind of suffering or excitement was welcome, provided it made me forget my hunger. When famished, I would sometimes saunter through the streets on the Lower East Side, which disreputable creatures used as their marketplace. It was mildly exciting to watch women hunt for men and men hunt for women, their furtive glances, winks, tacit understandings, bargainings, the little subterfuges by which they sought to veil their purpose from the other passers-by, the way a man would take stock of a passing woman to ascertain whether she was of the approachable class, the timidity of some of the men and the matter-of-fact ease of others, the mutual spying of two or three rivals aiming at the same quarry, the pretended abstraction of the policeman, and a hundred and one other details of the traffic. Many a time I joined in the chase without having a cent in my pocket, stopped to discuss terms with a woman in front of some window display or around some corner, only soon to turn away from her on the pretense that I had expected to be taken to her residence while she proposed going to some hotel. Thus, held by a dull, dogged fascination, I would tramp around, sometimes for hours, until feeling on the verge of a fainting spell with hunger and exhaustion, I would sit down on the front steps of some house. I often thought of Mr. Evan, but nothing was further from my mind than to let him see me in my present plight. One morning I met him face to face on the Bowery, but he evidently failed to recognize me. One afternoon I called on Argentine Rachel. Look here, Rach, I said in a studious, matter-of-fact voice. I'm dead broke today. I'll pay you in a day or two. Her face fell. I never trust. Never, she said, shaking her head mournfully. It brings bad luck anyhow. I felt like sinking into the ground. All right, I'll see you some other time, I said with an air of bravado. She ran after me. Wait a moment. What's your hurry? By way of warding off bad luck, she offered to lend me three dollars in cash, out of which I could pay her. I declined her offer. She pleaded and expostulated. 
but I stood firm and I came away in a state of the blackest wretchedness and self-disgust. I could never again bring myself to show my face at her house. A little music store was now my chief resort. It was kept by a man whom I had met at the synagogue of the Sons of Antomir, a former cantor who now supplemented his income from the store by doing occasional service as wedding bard. The musicians, singers, and music teachers who made the place their headquarters had begun by taking an interest in me, but the dimes and nickels I was now unceasingly borrowing of them had turned me into an outcast in their eyes. I felt it keenly. I would sulk around the store anxious to leave and loitering in spite of myself. There was a piano in the store upon which they often played. This, their talks of music, and their venomous gossip had an irresistible fascination for me. I noticed that morbid vanity was a common disease among them. Some of them would frankly and boldly sing their own panegyrics, while others, more discreet and tactful, let their high opinions of themselves be inferred. Nor could they conceal the grudges they bore one another, the jealousies with which they were eaten up. I thought them ludicrous, repugnant, and yet they lured me. I felt that some of those among them who were most grotesque and revolting in their selfishness had something in their makeup, certain interests, passions, emotions, visions, which placed them above the common herd. This was especially true of a spare, haggard-looking violinist, boyish of figure and cat-like of manner, with deep dark rings under his insatiable blue eyes. He called himself Octavius. He was literally consumed by the blaze of his own conceit and envy. When he was not in raptures over the poetry, subtlety, or depth of his own playing or compositions, he would give way to paroxysms of malice and derision at the expense of some other musician, from his east side rivals all the way up to Sarasate, who was then at the height of his career and had recently played in New York. Wagner was his god, yet no sooner would somebody else express admiration for Wagner music than he would offer to show that all the good things in the works of the famous German were merely so many paraphrased plagiarisms from the compositions of other men. He possessed a phenomenal memory. He seemed to remember every note in every opera, symphony, oratorio, or concerto that anybody ever mentioned, and there was not a piece of music by a celebrated man, but he was ready to prove that it had been stolen from some other celebrated man. His invective was particularly violent when he spoke of those Jewish immigrants in the musical profession whose success had extended beyond the East Side. He could never mention, without a jeer or some coarse epithet, the name of a Madison Street boy, a violinist, who was then attracting attention in Europe and who was booked for a series of concerts before the best audiences in the United States. He was a passionate phrase-maker. Indeed, it would have been difficult to determine which afforded him more pleasure his self-laudations, or the colorful, pungent, often preposterous language in which they were clothed. I am writing something with hot tears in it, I once heard him brag. They'll be so hot, they'll scald the heart of everyone who hears it, provided he has a heart. He had given me some nickels, yet his boasts would fill me with disgust. On the occasion just mentioned, I was so irritated with my poverty and with the whole world that I was seized with an irresistible desire to taunt him. As he continued to eulogize his forthcoming masterpiece, I threw out a Hebrew quotation, Let others praise thee, but not thine own mouth. He took no heed of my thrust, but since then he never looked at me, and I never dared ask him for a nickel again. He had a ferocious temper. When it broke loose, it would be a veritable volcano of revolting acrimony, his thin, firm, opening and snapping shut in a peculiar fashion, as though he were squirting venom all over the floor. He was as sensual as Maximum Max, only his voluptuous talks of women were far more offensive in form. But then his lewd drivel was apt to glitter with flashes of imagination. I do not remember ever seeing him in good humor. End of chapter 5 End of book 6 A Greenhorn No Longer Book 7 Chapters 1 and 2 of The Rise of David Levinsky. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Kahan. Book 7 My Temple. Chapter 1. One Friday evening in September, I stood on Grand Street with my eyes raised to the big open windows of a dance hall on the second floor of a brick building on the opposite side of the lively thoroughfare. Only the busts of the dancers could be seen. This, and the distance that divided me from the hall, enveloped the scene in mystery. As the couples floated by, as though borne along on waves of the music, the girls clinging to the men, 
their fantastic figures held me spellbound. Several other people were watching the dancers from the street, mostly women, who gazed at the appearing and disappearing images with envying eyes. Presently I was accosted by a dandified-looking young man who rushed at me with an exuberant, How are you? in English. He was dressed in the height of the summer fashion. He looked familiar to me, but I was at a loss to locate him. Don't you know me? Try to remember. It was Gittleson, my fellow passenger on board the ship that had brought me to America, the tailor who clung to my side when I made my entry into the New World, sixteen months before. The change took my breath away. You didn't recognize me, did you? he said with a triumphant snicker, pulling out his cuffs so as to flaunt their gold or gilded buttons. He asked me what I was doing, but he was more interested in telling me about himself. That cloak contractor who picked him up near Castle Garden had turned out to be a skinflint and a slave driver. He had started him on five dollars a week for work the market price of which was twenty or thirty. So Gittleson left him as soon as he realized his real worth, and he had been making good wages ever since. Being an excellent tailor, he was much sought after, and although the trade had two long slack seasons, he always had plenty to do. He told me that he was going to that dance hall across the street, which greatly enhanced his importance in my eyes, and seemed to give reality to the floating phantoms that I had been watching in those windows. He said he was in a hurry to go up there, as he had an appointment with a lady, this in English. Yet he went on describing the picnics, balls, excursions he attended. Thereupon I involuntarily shot a look at his jaunty straw hat, thinking of his gray forelock. I did so several times. I could not help it. Finally, my furtive glances attracted his attention. What are you looking at? Anything wrong with my hat? He asked, baring his head. His hair was freshly trimmed and dudishly dressed. As I looked at the patch of silver hair that shone in front of a glossy expanse of brown, he exclaimed with a laugh, Oh, you mean that? That's nothing. The ladies like me all the same. He went on boasting, but he did it in an inoffensive way. He simply could not get over the magic transformation that had come over him. While in his native place, his income had amounted to four rubles, about two dollars, a week. His wages here were now from thirty to forty dollars. He felt like a peasant, suddenly turned to a prince. But he spoke of his successes in a pleasing, soft voice and with a kindly, confiding smile that won my heart. Altogether, he made the impression of an exceedingly unaggressive, good-natured fellow, without anything like ginger in his makeup. After he had bragged his fill, he invited me to have a glass of soda with him. There was a soda stand on the next corner, and when we reached it, I paused, but he pulled me away. Come on, he said disdainfully. We'll go into a drug store, or, better still, let's go to an ice cream parlor. This I hesitated to do because of my shabby clothes. When he divined the cause of my embarrassment, he was touched. Come on, he said, with warm hospitality, uttering the two words in English. When I say come on, I know what I am talking about. But your lady is waiting for you. She can wait. Ladies are never on time anyhow but maybe she is. If she is, she can dance with some of the other fellows. I wouldn't be jealous. There are plenty of other ladies. I should not take fifty ladies for this chance of seeing you. Honest. He took me into a little candy store, dazzlingly lighted and mirrored, and filled with marble top tables. We seated ourselves, and he gave the order. He did so rather swaggeringly, but his manner to me was one of affectionate and compassionate respectfulness. Oh, I'm so glad to see you, he said. You remember the ship? As if one could ever forget things of that kind. I have often thought of you. I wonder what has become of him, I said to myself. He did not remember my name, or perhaps he had never known it, so I had to introduce myself afresh. 
the contrast between his flashy clothes and my frowsy, wretched-looking appearance, as I saw ourselves in the mirrors on either side of me, made me sorely ill at ease. The brilliancy of the gaslight chafed my nerves. It was as though it had been turned on for the express purpose of illuminating my disgrace. I was longing to go away, but Gittleson fell to questioning me about my affairs once more and this time he did so with such unfeigned concern that I told him the whole cheerless story of my sixteen months' life in America. He was touched. In his mild, unemphatic way, he expressed heartfelt sympathy. "'But why don't you learn some trade?' he inquired. "'You don't seem to be fit for business anyhow.' The last two words in mispronounced English. "'Everybody is telling me that. "'There you are. "'You just listen to me, Mr. Levinsky.' You won't be sorry for it. He proposed machine operating in a cloak shop, which paid even better than tailoring and was far easier to learn. Finally, he offered to introduce me to an operator who would teach me the trade and to pay him my tuition fee. He went into details. He continued to address me as Mr. Levinsky and tried to show me esteem as his intellectual superior. But in spite of himself, as it were, he gradually took a respectful, contemptuous tone with me. "'Don't be a lobster, Mr. Levinsky.' "'Lobster,' he said in English. "'This is not Russia. "'Here a fellow must be no fool. "'There is no sense in living the way you do. "'Do as Gittleson tells you, and you'll live decently, "'dress decently, and lay by a dollar or two. "'There are a lot of educated fellows in the shops.' "'He told me of some of these.' particularly of one young man who was a shopmate of his. He never comes to work without some book, he said. When there is not enough to do, he reads. When he has to wait for a new bundle, as we call it, he reads. Other fellows carry on, but he is always reading. He is so highly educated he could read any kind of book. And I don't believe there is a book in the world that he has not read. He is saving up money to go to college. On parting, he became fully respectful again. "'Do as I tell you, Mr. Levinsky,' he said. "'Take up cloak-making.' He made me write down his address. He expected that I would do it in Yiddish. When he saw me write his name and the name of the street in English, he said reverently, "'Writing English already. There is a mind for you. If I could write like that, I could become a designer.' Well. Don't lose the address. Call on me, and if you make up your mind to take up cloak-making, just say the word and I'll fix you up. When Gittleson says he will, he will. The image of that cloak operator reading books and laying by money for a college education haunted me. Why could I not do the same? I pictured myself working and studying and saving money for the kind of education which Matilda had denned into my ears. I accepted Gittleson's offer. Cloak-making or the cloak business as a career never entered my dreams at that time. I regarded the trade merely as a stepping stone to a life of intellectual interests. Chapter 2 The operator to whom Gittleson apprenticed me was a short, plump, dark-complexioned fellow named Joe. I have but a dim recollection of his features, though I distinctly remember his irresistible, wide-eyed smile and his emotional nature. He taught me to bind seams, and later to put in pockets, to stitch on under-collars, and so forth. After a while he began to pay me a small weekly wage, he himself being paid, for our joint work, by the piece. The shop was not the manufacturer's. It belonged to one of his contractors who received from him bundles of material which his employees, tailors, machine operators, pressers, and finisher girls, made up into cloaks or jackets. The cheaper goods were made entirely by operators, the better grades partly by tailors, partly by operators, or wholly by tailors. But these were mostly made inside, in the manufacturer's own establishment. The designing cutting and making of samples were inside branches exclusively. Gittleson, as a skilled tailor, was an inside man, being mostly employed on samples. My work proved to be much harder, and the hours very much longer than I had anticipated. 
I had to toil from six in the morning to nine in the evening. Joe put in even more time. I always found him grinding away rapturously when I came to the shop in the morning, and always left him toiling as rapturously when I went home in the evening. Ours is a seasonal trade. All the work of the year is crowded into two short seasons of three and two months, respectively, during which one is to earn enough to last him twelve months. Only sample makers, high-grade tailors like Gittleson, were kept busy throughout the year. But then wages were comparatively high, so that a good mechanic, particularly an operator, can make as much as $75 a week, working about 15 hours a day. However, during the first two or three weeks, I was too much borne down by the cruelty of my drudgery to be interested in the luring rewards which it held out. Not being accustomed to physical exertion of any kind, I felt like an innocent man suddenly thrown into prison and put at hard labor. I was shocked. I was crushed. I was continually looking at the clock, counting the minutes. And when I came home, I would feel so sore in body and spirit that I could not sleep. Studying or reading was out of the question. Moreover, as a peddler, I seemed to have belonged to the world of business, to the same class as the rich, the refined, while now, behold, I was a workman, a laborer, one of the masses. I pitied myself for a degraded wretch, and when some of my shopmates indulged in coarse pleasantry in the hearing of the finisher girls, it would hurt me, personally, as a confirmation of my disgrace. And this is the kind of people with whom I am doomed to associate, I would lament. In point of fact, there were only four or five fellows of this kind in a shop of fifty. Nor were some of the peddlers or music teachers I had known more modest of speech than the worst of these cloak-makers. What was more, I felt that some of my fellow employees were purer and better men than I, but that did not matter. I abhorred the shop and everybody in it as a well-bred convict abhors his jail and his fellow inmates. When the men quarreled, they would call one another, among other things, bundle-eaters. This meant that they accused one another of being ever hungry for bundles of raw material, ever eager to gobble up all the work in the shop. I wondered how one could be anxious for physical toil. They seemed to be a lot of savages. The idea of leaving the shop often crossed my mind, but I never had the courage to take it seriously. I had tried my hand at peddling and failed. Was I a failure as a mechanic as well? Was I unfit for anything? The other fellows at the shop had a definite foothold in life, while I was a waif, a ne'er-do-well, nearly two years in America, with nothing to show for it. Thoughts such as these had a cowing effect on me. They made me feel somewhat like the fresh prisoner who has been put to work at stone-breaking to have his wild spirit broken. I dared not give up my new occupation. I would force myself to work hard, and as I did so, the very terrors of my toil would fascinate me, giving me a sense of my own worth. As the jackets that bore my stitches kept piling up, the concrete result of my useful performance would become a source of moral satisfaction to me, and when I received my first wages, the first money I had ever earned by the work of my hands, it seemed as if it were the first money I had ever earned honestly. By little and little I got used to my work, and even to enjoy its processes. Moreover, the thinking and the dreaming I usually indulged in while plying my machine became a great pleasure to me. It seemed as though one's mind could not produce such interesting thoughts or images unless it had the rhythmic whir of a sewing machine to stimulate it. I now ate well and slept well. I was in the best of health and in the best of spirits. I was in an uplifted state of mind. No one seemed to be honorable who did not earn his bread in the sweat of his brow as I did. Had I then chanced to hear a socialist speech, I might have become an ardent follower of Karl Marx, and my life might have been directed along lines other than those which brought me to financial power. The girls in the shop, individually, scarcely interested me, but their collective presence was something of which I never seemed to be quite unconscious. It was as though the workday atmosphere were scented with the breath of a delicate perfume. 
a perfume that was tainted with the tang of my yearning for Matilda. Two girls who were seated within a yard from my machine were continually bandying secrets. Now one, and then the other, would look around to make sure that the contractor was not watching, and then she would bend over and whisper something into her chum's ear. This would set my blood tingling with a peculiar kind of inquisitiveness. It was reasonable to suppose that their whispered conferences mostly bore upon such innocent matters as their work, earnings, lodgings, or dresses. Nevertheless, it seemed to me that their whispers, especially when accompanied by a smile, a giggle, or a wink, conveyed some of their intimate thoughts of men. They were homely girls with pinched faces, yet at such moments they represented to me all that there was fascinating and disquieting in womanhood. The jests of the foul-mouthed rowdies would make me writhe with disgust. As a rule, they were ostensibly addressed to some of the other fellows or to nobody in particular, their real target being the nearest girls. These would receive them with gestures of protest, or with an exclamation of mild repugnance, or, in the majority of cases, pass them unnoticed, as one does some unavoidable discomfort of toil. There was only one girl in the shop who received these jests with a shame-faced grin or even with frank appreciation, and she was a perfectly respectable girl like the rest. There were some finisher girls who could not boast an unsullied reputation, but none of them worked in our shop, and, indeed, their number in the entire trade was very small. One of the two girls who sat nearest to my machine was quite popular in the shop, but that was because of her sweet disposition and sound sense rather than for her looks. She was known to have a snug little account in a savings bank. It was for a marriage portion she was saving. But she was doing it so strenuously that she stinted herself the expense of a decent dress or hat or the price of a ticket to a ball, picnic, or dancing class. The result was that while she was pinching and scrimping herself to pave the way to her marriage, she barred herself by this very process from contact with possible suitors. She was a good soul. From time to time she would give some of her money to a needy relative, and then she would try to make up for it by saving with more ardor than ever. Her name was Gussie. Joe, the plump, dark fellow who was teaching me the trade, was one of the several men in the shop who were addicted to salacious banter. One of his favorite pranks was to burlesque some synagogue chant from the solemn service of the days of awe with disgustingly coarse Yiddish in place of the Hebrew of the prayer. But he was not a bad fellow by any means. He was good-natured, extremely impressionable, and susceptible of good influences. A sad tune would bring a woebegone look into his face while a good joke would make him laugh to tears. He was fond of referring to himself as my rabbi, which is Hebrew for teacher, and that was the way I would address him, at first playfully and then as a matter of course. One day, after he had delivered himself of a quip that set my teeth on edge, I said to him appealingly, Why should you be saying these things, rabbi? If you don't like them, you can stop your God-fearing ears, he fired back good-naturedly. I retorted that it was not a matter of piety, but of common decency, and my words were evidently striking home, but the girls applauded me, which spoiled it all. If you want to preach sermons, you're in the wrong place, he flared up. This is no synagogue. Nor is it a pigsty, Gussie urged, without raising her eyes from her work. A month or two later, he abandoned these sallies of his own accord. The other fellows twitted him on his burst of righteousness and made efforts to lure him into a race of ribald punning, but he stood his ground. By and by, it leaked out that he was engaged and madly in love with his girl. I warmed to him. The young woman who had won his heart was not an employee of our shop. Indeed, love affairs between working men and working girls who are employed in the same place are not quite so common as one might suppose. The factory is scarcely a proper setting for romance. It is one of the battlefields in our struggle for existence where we treat women as an inferior being, whereas in civilized lovemaking we prefer to keep up the chivalrous fiction that she is our superior. 
The girls of our shop, hard-worked, disheveled, and handled with anything but chivalry, aroused my sympathy, but it was not the kind of feeling that stimulates romantic interest. Still, collectively, as an abstract reminder of their sex, they flavored my sordid environment with poetry. End of Book 7, Chapter 2 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Book 7, Chapters 3 and 4 of The Rise of David Levinsky This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Kahan Book 7 My Temple Chapter 3 the majority of students at the College of the City of New York was already made up of Jewish boys, mostly from the tenement houses. One such student often called at the cloak shop in which I was employed, and in which his father, a tough-looking fellow with a sandy beard, a former teamster, was one of the pressers. A classmate of this boy was supported by an aunt, a spinster who made good wages as a bunchmaker in a cigar factory. To make an educated man of her nephew was the great ambition of her life. All this made me feel as though I were bound to that college with the ties of kinship. Two of my other shopmates had sons at high school. The east side was full of poor Jews, wage earners, peddlers, grocers, salesmen, insurance agents, who would beggar themselves to give their children a liberal education. Then, too, thousands of our working men attended public evening school, while many others took lessons at home. The ghetto rang with a clamor of knowledge. To save up some money and prepare for college seemed to be the most natural thing for me to do. I said to myself that I must begin to study for it without delay. But that was impossible, and it was quite some time before I took up the course which the presser's boy had laid out for me. During the first three months, I literally had no time to open a book. Nor was that all. My work as a cloakmaker had become a passion with me, so much so that even on Saturdays when the shop was closed, I would scarcely do any reading. Instead, I would seek the society of other cloakmakers with whom I might talk shop. I was developing speed rather than skill at my sewing machine, but this question of speed afforded exercise to my brain. It did not take me long to realize that the number of cloaks or jackets which one turned out in a given length of time was largely a matter of method and system. I perceived that Joe, who was accounted a fast hand, would take up the various parts of a garment in a certain order, calculated to reduce to a minimum the amount of time lost in passing from section to section. So I watched him intently, studying his system with every fiber of my being. Nor did I content myself with imitating his processes. I was forever pondering the problem and introducing little improvements of my own. I was making a science of it. It was not merely physical exertion. It was a source of intellectual interest as well. I was wrapped up in it. If I happened to meet a cloak operator who was noted for extraordinary speed, I would feel like an ambitious musician meeting a famous virtuoso. Some cloak operators were artists. I certainly was not one of them. I admired their work and envied them, but I lacked the artistic patience and the dexterity essential to workmanship of a high order. Much to my chagrin, I was a born bungler. But then I possessed physical strength, nervous vitality, method and inventiveness, all the elements that go to make up speed. I was progressing with unusual rapidity. Joe criticized my work severely, often calling me botcher. But I knew that this was chiefly intended to veil his satisfaction at the growing profits that my work was yielding him. I now earned about ten dollars a week, of which I spent about five saving the rest for the next season of idleness. At last, that season set in. There was not a stroke of work in the shop. I was so absorbed in my new vocation that I would pass my evenings in a cloakmaker's haunt, 
a cafe on Delancey Street, where I never tired talking sleeves, pockets, stitches, trimmings, and the like. There was a good deal of card playing in the place, but somehow I never succumbed to that temptation. But then, under the influence of some of the fellows I met there, I developed a considerable passion for the Jewish theater. These young men were what is known on the East Side as patriots, that is, devoted admirers of some actor or actress, and members of his or her voluntary claque. Several of the other frequenters were also interested in the stage, or at least in the gossip of it, so that, on the whole, there was as much talk of plays and players as there was of cloaks and cloakmakers. Our shop discussion certainly never reached the heat that usually characterized our debates on things theatrical. The most ardent of the patriots was a young contractor named Mendels. He attended nearly every performance in which his favorite actor had a part, selling dozens of tickets for his benefit performances and usually losing considerable sums on these sales loading him with presents and often running his errands. I once saw Mendel's in a violent quarrel with a man who had scoffed at his idol. Mendel's younger brother, Jake, fascinated me by his appearance, and we became great chums. He was the handsomest fellow I ever had seen, with a fine head of dark brown hair, classic features and large, soft blue eyes, too soft and too blue, perhaps. His was a manly face and figure, and his voice was a manly, a beautiful basso. But this masculine exterior contained an effeminate psychology. In my heart I pronounced him a calf, and when I had discovered the English word sissy, I thought that it just fitted him. Yet I adored him and even looked up to him, all because of his good looks. He was a Talmudist like myself and we had much in common also regarding our dreams of the future. "'Oh, I am so glad I have met you,' I once said to him. "'I am glad, too,' he returned, flushing. I found that he blushed rather too frequently, which confirmed my notion of him as a sissy. Like most handsome men, he bestowed a great deal of time on his personal appearance. He never uttered a foul word, nor a harsh one, if he heard a cloakmaker tell an indecent story, he would look down, smiling and blushing like a girl. Formerly, he had been employed in his brother's shop, while now he earned his living by soliciting and collecting for a life insurance company. Chapter 4 Jake Mendels was a devotee of Madame Klesmer, the leading Jewish actress of that period which, by the way, was practically the opening chapter in the interesting history of the Yiddish stage in America. Madame Klesmer was a tragedian and a prima donna at once, a usual combination in those days. One Friday evening we were in the gallery of her theater. The play was an historical opera, and she was playing the part of a biblical princess. It was the closing scene of an act. The whole company was on stage, swaying sidewise and singing with the princess, her head in a halo of electric light in the center. Jake was feasting his large blue eyes on her. Presently he turned to me with the air of one confiding a secret. Wouldn't you like to kiss her? And swinging around again, he resumed feasting his blue eyes on the princess. I have seen prettier women than she, I replied. Shh, let a fellow listen. She is a dear all the same. You don't know a good thing when you see it, Levinsky. Are you in love with her? Shh! Do let me listen. When the curtain fell, he made me applaud her. There were several curtain calls, during all of which he kept applauding her furiously, shouting the prima donna's name at the top of his voice, and winking to me imploringly to do the same. When quiet had been restored at last, I returned to the subject. Are you in love with her? Sure, he answered without blushing. As if a fellow could help it. If she let me kiss her little finger, I should be the happiest man in the world. And if she let you kiss her cheek? I should go crazy. And if she let you kiss her lips? What's the use asking idle questions? Would you like to kiss her neck? You ask me foolish questions. You are in love with her, 
I declared reflectively. I should say I was. It was a unique sort of love, for he wanted me also to be in love with her. If you are not in love with her, you must have a heart of iron, or else your soul is dry as a raisin. With which he took to analyzing the prima donna's charms, going into raptures over her eyes, smiles, gestures, manner of opening her mouth, and her swing and step as she walked over the stage. No, I don't care for her, I replied. You are a peculiar fellow. If I did fall in love, I said by way of meeting him halfway, I should choose Mrs. Sigalovich. She is a thousand times prettier than Mrs. Klesmer. Tut, tut. Mrs. Sigalovich was certainly prettier than the prima donna, but she played unimportant parts, so the notion of one's falling in love with her seemed queer to Jake. That night I had an endless chain of dreams, in every one of which Madame Klesmer was the central figure. When I awoke in the morning, I fell in love with her and was overjoyed. When I saw Jake Mendels at dinner, I said to him, with the air of one bringing glad news, Do you know I am in love with her? With whom? With Mrs. Sigalovich? Ah, oh, pshh! I had forgotten all about her. I mean Madame Klesmer, I said self-consciously. Somehow my love for the actress did not interfere with my longing thoughts of Matilda. I asked myself no questions. And so we went on loving jointly, Jake and I, the companionship of our passion apparently stimulating our romance as companionship at a meal stimulates the appetite of the diners. Each of us seemed to be infatuated with Madame Klesmer, yet the community of this feeling, far from arousing mutual jealousy in us, seemed to strengthen the ties of our friendship. We would hum her songs in duet, recite her lines, compare notes on our dreams of happiness with her. One day we composed a love letter to her, a long epistle full of biblical and homespun poetry, which we copied jointly, his lines alternating with mine, and which we signed, Your two lovelorn slaves, whose hearts are panting for a look of your star-like eyes, Jacob and David. We mailed the letter without affixing any address. The next evening we were in the theater, and when she appeared on the stage and shot a glance to the gallery, Jake nudged me violently. But she does not know we are in the gallery, I argued. She must think we are in the orchestra. Hearts are good guessers. Guessers nothing. Shh, let's listen. Madame Klesmer was playing the part of a girl in a modern Russian town. She declaimed her lines, speaking like a prophetess in ancient Israel, and I liked it extremely. I was fully aware that it was unnatural for a girl in a modern Russian town to speak like a prophetess in ancient Israel, but that was just why I liked it. I thought it perfectly proper that people on the stage should not talk as they would off the stage. I thought that this unnatural speech of theirs was one of the principal things an audience paid for. The only actor who spoke like a human being was the comedian and this, too, seemed to be perfectly proper, for a comedian was a fellow who did not take his art seriously, and so I thought that this natural talk of his was part of his fun-making. I thought it was something like a clown burlesquing the Old Testament by reading it not in the ancient intonations of the synagogue, but in the plain, conversational accents of everyday life. During the intermission, in the course of our talk about Madame Klesmer, Jake said, do you know, Levinsky, I don't think you really love her. I love her as much as you, and more, too, I retorted. How much do you love her? Would you walk from New York to Philadelphia if she wanted you to do so? Why would she? What good would it do her? But suppose she does want it. How can I suppose such nonsense? Well, she might just want to see how much you love her. A nice test, that. Oh, well, she might just get that kind of notion. Women are liable to get any kind of notion, don't you know? Well, if Madame Klesmer got that kind of notion, I should tell her to walk to Philadelphia herself. Then you don't love her? I love her as much as you do. But if she took it into her head to make a fool of me, 
I should send her to the eighty devils. He winced. And you call that love, don't you? He said, with a sneer in the corner of his pretty mouth. As for me, I should walk to Boston if she wanted me to. Even if she did not promise to let you kiss her? Even if she did not. And if she did? I should walk to Chicago. And if she promised to be your mistress? Oh, what's the use talking that way? He protested, blushing. Aren't you shy? A regular bride-to-be, I declare. Stop, he said, coloring once again. It dawned on me that he was probably chaste, and searching his face with a mocking look, I said, I bet you are still innocent. Leave me alone, please, he retorted softly. I have hit it, then, I importuned him, with a great sense of my own superiority. Do let me alone, will you? I just want you to tell me whether you are innocent or not. It's none of your business. Of course you are. And if I am, is it a disgrace? Who says it is? I desisted. He became more attractive than ever to me. Nevertheless, I made repeated attempts to deprave him. His chastity bothered me. The idea of breaking it down became an irresistible temptation. I would ridicule him for a sissy, appeal to him in the name of his health, beg him as one does for a personal favor all in vain he spoke better english than i with more ease and in that pretty basso of his which i envied he had never read dickens or any other english author but he was familiar with some subjects to which i was a stranger he was well grounded in arithmetic knew some geography and now with a view of qualifying for the study of medicine he was preparing with the aid of a private teacher for the regent's examination in algebra, geometry, English composition, American and English history. I thought he did not study deeply enough, that he took more real interest in his collars and neckties, the shine of his shoes, or the hang of his trousers, than he did in his algebra or history. By his cleanliness and tidiness, he reminded me of Naphtali, which indeed had something to do with my attachment for him. My relations toward him echoed with the feelings I used to have for the reticent, omniscient boy of Abner's court, and with the hoarse, studious young Talmudist with whom I would famish in company. He had neither Naphtali's brains nor his individuality, yet I looked up to him and was somewhat under his influence. I adopted many of the English phrases he was in the habit of using, and tried to imitate his way of dressing. As a consequence, he would sometimes assume a patronizing tone with me, addressing me with a good-natured sneer which I liked in spite of myself. We made a compact to speak nothing but English, and to a considerable extent, we kept it. End of chapter 4 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Book 7, Chapters 5 and 6 of The Rise of David Levinsky. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Kahan. Book 7, My Temple. Chapter 5. A few weeks of employment were succeeded by another period of enforced idleness. I took up arithmetic, but reading was still a great passion with me. My mornings and forenoons during that slack season were mostly spent over Dickens or Thackeray. I now lived in a misshapen attic room, which I rented of an Irish family, in what was then a Gentile neighborhood. I had chosen that street for the English I had expected to hear around me. I had lived more than two months in that attic, and almost the only English I heard from my neighbors were the few words my landlady would say to me when I paid her my weekly rent. Yet somehow the place seemed helpful to me, as though its very atmosphere exuded a feeling for the language I was so eager to master. I made all sorts of advances to the Irish family, all sorts of efforts to get into social relations with them, all to no purpose. 
Finally, one evening, I had a real conversation with one of my landlady's sons. My window gave me trouble, and he came up to put it in working order for me. We talked of his work and of mine. I told him of my plans about going to college. He was interested, and I thought him charmingly courteous and sociable. He remained about an hour and a half in my room. When he had departed, I was in high spirits. I seemed to feel the progress my English had made in that hour and a half. My bed was so placed that by lying prone, diagonally across it, my head toward the window and my feet suspended in the air, I would get excellent daylight. So this became my favorite posture when I read in the daytime. Thus, lying on my stomach with a novel under my eyes and the dictionary by my side, I would devour scores of pages. In a few weeks, often reading literally day and night, I read through Nicholas Nickleby and Vanity Fair. Thackeray's masterpiece did not strike me as being in the same class with anything by Dickens. It seemed to me that anybody in command of bookish English ought to be able to turn out a work like Vanity Fair, where men and things were so simple and so natural that they impressed me like people and things I had known. Indeed, I had a lurking feeling that I, too, could do it, after a while at least. On the other hand, Nicholas Nickleby and Dombey and Son were so full of extraordinary characters, unexpected wit, outbursts of beautiful rhetoric, and other wonderful things, that their author appealed to me as something more than a human being. And yet, deep down in my heart, I enjoyed Thackeray more than I did Dickens. It was at the East Side branch of the Young Men's Hebrew Association that I obtained my books. It was a sort of university settlement in which educated men and women from uptown acted as workers. The advice these would give me as to my reading, their kindly manner, their native English, and, last but not least, the flattering way in which they would speak of my intellectual aspirations, led me to spend many an hour in the place. The great thing was to hear these American-born people speak their native tongue, and to have them hear me speak it. It was the same as in the case of the chat I had with the son of my Irish landlady. Every time I had occasion to spend five or ten minutes in their company, I would seem to be conscious of a perceptible improvement in my English. Some days I would be so carried away by my reading that I never opened my arithmetic. At other times I would drift into an arithmetical mood and sit up all night doing problems. When I happened to be in raptures over some book, I would pester Jake with lengthy accounts of it, dwelling on the chapters I had read last and trying to force my exultation upon him. As a rule he was bored, but sometimes he would become interested in the plot or in some romantic scene. One evening, as we were discussing love in general, I said, Love is the greatest thing in the world. Sure it is, he answered. But if you love and are not loved in return, it is nothing but agony. Even then it is sweet, I rejoined reflectively, the image of Matilda before me. How can pain be sweet? But it can. If you were really in love with Madame Klesmer, you wouldn't think so. I love her as much as you do. You are always saying you do, but you don't. Yes, I do. And suddenly, lapsing into a confidential tone, I questioned him. By the way, Jake, is this the first time you have ever been in love? Why? I just want to know, is it? What difference does it make? Have you ever been in love before? What difference does that make? If you answer my question, I shall answer yours. Well, then, I've never been in love before. And I have. He was intensely interested, and I confided my love story in him, which served to strengthen our friendship still further. When I concluded my narrative, he said, thoughtfully, Of course you don't love Madame Klesmer. I'll tell you what, Levinsky, you are still in love with Matilda. I made no answer. Anyhow, you don't love Madame Klesmer. This time he said it without reproach. Once I was in love with somebody else, I was excused. The next season came around. I was a full-fledged helper now, and according to the customary arrangement, I received 30% of what Joe received for my work. This brought me from 20 to $25 a week, quite an overwhelming sum, according to my then standard of income and expenditures. I saved about $15 a week. I shall never forget the day when my capital reached the round figure of one hundred dollars. 
I was in a flutter. When I looked at the passers-by in the street, I would say to myself, these people have no idea that I am worth a hundred dollars. Another thing I was ever conscious of was the fact that I had earned the hundred dollars by my work. There was a touch of solemnity in my mood, as though I had performed some feat of valor or rendered some great service to the community. I was impelled to convey this feeling to Jake, but when I attempted to put it into words, it was somehow lost in a haze, and what I said was something quite prosaic. Guess how much I have in my savings bank, I began. I haven't any idea. How much? Just one hundred. Really? Honest. But then what does it amount to, after all? Of course, it is pleasant to feel that you have a trade and that you know how to keep a dollar, don't you know? So far from endearing me to the cloak trade, as might have been expected, the hundred dollars killed at one stroke all the interest I had taken in it. It lent reality to my vision of college. Cloak-making was now nothing but a temporary round of dreary toil, an unavoidable stepping-stone to loftier occupations. Another year and I should be a fully developed mechanic, working on my own hook, that is, as the immediate employee of some manufacturer or contractor. I shall soon be earning forty or fifty dollars a week, I would muse. At that rate I shall save up plenty of money in much less time than I expected. I shall spend as little as possible and study as hard as possible. The regent's examinations were not exacting in those days. I could have prepared to qualify for admission to a school of medicine, law, or civil engineering in a very short time. But I aimed higher. I knew that many of the professional men on the east side, and indeed everywhere else in the United States, were people of doubtful intellectual equipment, while I was ambitious to be a cultured man in the European way. There was an odd confusion of ideas in my mind. On the one hand, I had a notion that to become an American was the only tangible form of becoming a man of culture, for did not I regard the most refined and learned European as a greenhorn? On the other hand, the impression was deep in me that American education was a cheap machine-made product, Chapter 6 College The sound was forever buzzing in my ear. The seven letters were forever floating before my eyes. They were a magic group, a magic whisper. Matilda was to hear of me as a college man. What would she say? What do you want City College for? Jake would argue. Why not take up medicine at once? Once I am to be an educated man, I want to be the genuine article, I would reply. Every bit of new knowledge I acquired aroused my enthusiasm. I was in a continuous turmoil of exultation. My plan of campaign was to keep working until I had saved up $600, by which time I was to be eligible to admission to the junior class of the College of the City of New York, commonly known as City College, where tuition is free. The $600 was to last me two years, that is, till graduation, when I might take up medicine, engineering, or law. During the height of the cloak season, I might find it possible to replenish my funds by an occasional few days at the sewing machine, or else it ought not to be difficult to support myself by joining the army of private instructors who taught English to our working men at their homes. The image of the modest college building was constantly before me. More than once I went a considerable distance out of my way to pass the corner of Lexington Avenue and 23rd Street, where that edifice stood. I would pause and gaze at its red, ivy-clad walls, mysterious high windows, humble spires. I would stand watching the students on the campus and around the great doors, and go my way with a heart full of reverence, envy, and hope, with a heart full of quiet ecstasy. It was not merely a place in which I was to fit myself for the battle of life, nor merely one in which I was going to acquire knowledge. It was a symbol of spiritual promotion as well. University-bred people were the real nobility of the world. A college diploma was a certificate of moral as well as intellectual aristocracy. My old religion had gradually fallen to pieces, and if its place was taken by something else, if there was something that appealed to the better man in me, to what was purest in my thoughts and most sacred in my emotions, that something was the red, church-like structure on the southeast corner of Lexington Avenue and 23rd Street. 
it was the synagogue of my new life. Nor is this merely a figure of speech. The building really appealed to me as a temple, as a house of sanctity, as we call the ancient temple of Jerusalem. At least that was the term I would fondly apply to it years later in my retrospective broodings upon the first few years of my life in America. I was impatiently awaiting the advent of the slack season, and when it came at last I applied myself exclusively to the study of subjects required for admission to college. To accelerate matters, I engaged as my instructor in mathematics and geography the son of our tough-looking presser. I paid him twenty-five cents an hour. My geography lessons were rapidly dispelling the haze that had enshrouded the universe from me. I beheld the globe hanging in space, a vast, independent world, and yet a mere speck among countless myriads of other worlds. Its rotations were so vivid in my mind that I seemed to hear it hum as it spun round and round its axis. The phenomena producing day and night and the four seasons were as real to me as the things that took place in my restaurant. The earth was being disclosed to my mental vision as a whole and in detail. Order was coming out of chaos. Continents, seas, islands, mountains, rivers, countries were defining themselves out of a misty jumble of meaningless names. Light was breaking all around me. Life was becoming clearer. I was broadening out. I was overborne by a sense of my growing perspicacity. My keenest pleasure was to do geometrical problems, preferably such as contained puzzles in construction. On one occasion I sat up all night, and far into the following day, over a riddle of this kind. It was about two o'clock when I dressed and went to lunch, which was also my breakfast. The problem was still unsolved. I hurried back home as soon as I had finished my meal, went at the problem again, and did not let go until it surrendered. Odd as it may seem, I found a certain kind of similarity between the lure of these purely mental exercises and the appeal of music. In both cases, I was piqued and harassed by a personified mystery. If a tune ran in my mind, it would appear as though somebody, I knew not who, was saying something, I knew not what. What was he saying? Who was he? What had happened to him? Was he reciting some grievance, bemoaning some loss, or threatening vengeance? What was he nagging me about? Questions such as these would keep pecking at my heart, and this pain, this excruciating curiosity, I would call keen enjoyment. In like manner, every difficult mathematical problem seemed to shelter some unknown fellow who took pleasure in teasing me and daring me to find him. It was the same mischievous fellow, in fact, who used to laugh in my face when I had a difficult bit of Talmud to unravel. Why, geometry is even deeper than Talmud, I once exclaimed to Jake. Do you think so? he answered indifferently. I think an interesting geometrical problem is more delicious than the best piece of meat. Why don't you live on problems, then? Why spend money on dinners? Smart boy, aren't you? Is doing problems as sweet as being in love? he demanded, with sheepish earnestness. You are in love with Madame Klesmer. You ought to know. He made no answer. On the day when I began these studies, I had thirty-six dollars besides the hundred which I kept in the savings bank. Of this I was now spending, including tuition fees, less than six dollars a week. Every time I changed a dollar, my heart literally sank within me. Finally, when my cash was all gone, I borrowed some money of Joe, my rabbi, at the art of cloak-making. Breaking the round sum total of my savings bank account was out of the question. Joe advanced me money more than cheerfully. He was glad to have me in his debt as a pledge of my continuing to work for him. His motive was obvious, and yet I went on borrowing of him rather than draw upon my bank account. One day it crossed my mind that it would be a handsome thing if I looked up Gittleson and paid him the ten dollars I owed him. It was sweet to picture myself telling him how much his ten dollars had done and was going to do for me. I was impatient to call on him, and so I borrowed ten dollars of Joe and betook myself to the factory where I had visited Gittleson several times before. As he was a sample maker, his work knew no seasons. When I called at the factory, I found that he had given up his job there, that he had married and established a small custom tailor shop 
somewhere uptown. Nobody seemed to know where. Joe had not even heard of his marriage. Meanwhile, my enthusiasm for paying him his debt was gone, and I was rather glad that I had not found him. It was the middle of July. The great winter season was developing. I felt perfectly competent to make a whole garment unaided. It was doubtful, however, whether I should be readily accepted as an independent mechanic in the shop where I was employed now, and where one was in the habit of regarding me as a mere apprentice. So I was determined to seek employment elsewhere. Joe was suspicious. Not that I betrayed my plans in any way. He took them for granted. And so he visited me every day on all sorts of pretexts, dined me and wined me, if the phrase may be applied to a soda-water dinner, and watched my every step. Finally, I wearied of it all, and one afternoon, as we were seated in the restaurant, I picked a quarrel with him. I don't want your dinners, I burst out, and I don't want to be watched by you as if I were a recruit in the Russian army and you were my little uncle. I'll pay you what I owe you and leave me alone. As if I were uneasy about those few dollars he said ingratiatingly. I know you are not. That's just it. He took fire. What am I after then? You think I get rich on your work, don't you? Our altercation waxed violent. At one point he was about to lapse into a conciliatory tone again, but his dignity prevailed. I would not keep you if you begged me, he declared. I hate to deal with an ingrate, but I want my money at once. I shall pay it to you when work begins. No, sir, Ra. I want it at once. An ugly scene followed. He seized me by my coat lapels and threatened to have me arrested. Finally, the restaurant keeper and Gussie, the homely finisher girl whom we all respected, made peace between us, and things were arranged more or less amicably. I obtained employment in an inside place a factory owned by twin brothers named Mannheimer. I was in high feather. My sense of advancement and independence reminded me of the days when I had just been graduated from the Talmudic Academy and went on studying as an independent scholar. I had not, however, begun to work in my new place when a general strike of the trade was declared. End of Chapter 6 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Book Seven, Chapter Seven and Eight of the Rise of David Levinsky. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Kahan. Book Seven, My Temple, Chapter Seven. The Cloakmakers Union had been a weak, insignificant organization but at the call for a general strike, it suddenly burst into life. There was a great rush for membership cards. Everybody seemed to be enthusiastic, full of fight. To me, however, the strike was a sheer calamity. I laid it all to my own hard luck. It seemed as though the trouble had been devised for the express purpose of preventing me from being promoted to full pay, for the express purpose of upsetting my financial calculations in connection with my college plans. Everybody was saying that prices were outrageously low, that the manufacturers were taking advantage of the weakness of the union, and that they must be brought to terms. All this was lost upon me. The question of prices did not interest me because the wages I was going to receive were by far the highest I had ever been paid, but the main thing was that I looked upon the whole business of making cloaks as a temporary occupation. My mind was full of books and my college dreams. All I wanted was to start the season as soon as possible, to save up the expected sum and to reach the next period of freedom from physical toil when I should be able to spend day and night on my studies again. But going to work as a strike-breaker was out of the question. A new kind of public opinion had suddenly sprung up among the cloakmakers. A man who did not belong to the Union was a traitor, worse than an apostate, worse than the worst of criminals. And so, feeling like a schoolboy in Antomir when he is made to furnish the very rod with which he is to be chastised, 
i went to the headquarters of the union paid my initiation fee and became a member it was on a friday afternoon the secretaries of the organization were seated at a long table in the basement of a meeting room building on rivington street the basement and the street outside were swarming with cloak makers a number of mass meetings had been arranged to take place in several halls with well-known socialists for speakers but I had not even the curiosity to attend them. When some of my shopmates reproached me for my indifference, I said sullenly, I've joined the union. What more do you want? One of them, a Talmudist like myself, spoke of capital and labor, of the injustice of the existing economic order. He had recently, through the strike, been converted to socialism. He made a fiery appeal to me. He spoke with the exultation of a new proselyte, but his words fell on deaf ears. I had no mind for anything but my college studies. Do you think it right that millions of people should toil and live in misery so that a number of idlers might roll in luxury? He pleaded. I haven't made the world, nor can I mend it, was my retort. The manufacturers yielded almost every point. The season began with a rush. My pay envelope for the first week contained thirty-two dollars and some cents. I knew the union price, of course, and I had figured out the sum before I received it. Yet when I beheld the two figures on the envelope, the blood surged to my head. Thirty-two dollars! Why, that meant sixty-four rubles. I was tempted to write Naphtali about it. The next week brought me an even fatter envelope. I worked sixteen hours a day. Reading and studying had to be suspended till October. I lived on five dollars a week. My savings, and with them my sense of my own importance in the world, grew apace. As there was no time to go to the savings bank, I had to carry what I deemed a great sum on my person, in a money belt that I had improvised for the purpose. This was a constant source of anxiety as well as of joy. No matter how absorbed I might have been in my work or in my thought, the consciousness of having that wad of paper money with me was never wholly absent from my mind. It loomed as a badge of omnipotence. I felt in the presence of luck, which was a living spirit, a goddess. I was mostly grave. The frivolities of the other men in the factory seemed so fatuous, so revolting. A great sense of security and self-confidence swelled my heart. When I walked through the American streets, I would feel at home in them, far more so than I had ever felt before. At the same time, danger was constantly hovering about me, the danger of the street crowds seizing that magic wad from me. The image of the college building loomed as a bride-elect of mine, but that, somehow, did not seem to have anything to do with my money belt, as though I expected to go to college without encroaching upon my savings a case of eating the cake and having it. The cloakmakers were so busy they had no time to attend meetings, and being little accustomed to method and discipline, they suffered their organization to melt away. By the time the season came to a close, the union was scarcely stronger than it had been before the strike. As there was no work now and no prices to fix, one did not miss its protection. The number of men employed in the trade in those years did not exceed 7,000. The industry was still in its infancy. I resumed my studies with a passion amounting to a frenzy. I would lay in a supply of coarse rye bread, cheese, and salmon to last me two or even three days, and never leave my lair during that length of time. I dined at the Delancey Street restaurant every third or fourth day and did not go to the theater unless Jake was particularly insistent but then I religiously attended Felix Adler's ethical culture lectures at Chickering Hall on Sunday mornings. I valued them for their English rather than for anything else, but their spirit, reinforced by the effect of organ music and the general atmosphere of the place, would send my soul soaring. These gatherings and my prospective alma mater appealed to me as being of the same order of things, of the same world of refined ways, new thoughts, noble interests. If I came across a street faker and he spoke with a foreign accent, I would pass on. If, however, his English struck me as that of a real American, I would pause and listen to his lecture, sometimes for more than an hour. 
People who were born to speak English were superior beings. Even among fallen women I would seek those who were real Americans. Chapter 8 I was reading Pendennis. The prospect of returning to work was a hideous vision. The high wages in store for me had lost their magnetism. I often wondered whether I might not be able to secure some pupils in English or Hebrew and drop cloak-making at once. I dreamed of enlisting the interest of a certain Messinus, a German-American Jew who financed many a struggling college student of the ghetto. Thoughts of a college match would flash through my mind, that is, of becoming engaged to some girl who earned good wages and was willing to support me through college. This form of matrimonial arrangement, which has been mentioned in an earlier chapter, is not uncommon among our immigrants. Alliances of this sort naturally tend to widen the intellectual chasm between the two parties of the contract, and often result in some of the tragedies or comedies that fill the swift-flowing life of American ghettos. But the ambition to be the wife of a doctor, lawyer, or dentist is too strong in some of our working girls to be quenched by the dangers involved. One of the young women I had in mind was Gussie, the cloak finisher mentioned above, who saved for a marriage portion too energetically to make a marriage. She was a good girl and no fool either, and I thought to myself that she would make me a good wife, even if she was plain and had a washed-out appearance and was none too young. I was too passionately in love with my prospective alma mater to care whether I could love my fiancé or not. I have a fellow for you, I said to Gussie, under the guise of pleasantry, meeting her in the street one day. Something fine. Who is it? Yourself? she asked quickly. You have guessed it right. Have I? Then tell your fellow to go to all the black devils. Why? Because. If I could go to college. You want me to pay your bills, do you? Wouldn't you like to be the wife of a doctor? You would take rides in my carriage. You mean the other way around. You would ride in my carriage, and I should have to start a breach of promise case against Dr. Levinsky. You'll have to look for a bigger fool than I, she concluded with a smile. It was an attractive smile, full of good nature and common sense. A smile of this kind often makes a homely face pretty. Gussie's did not. The light it shed only served to publish her ugliness. But I did not care. The infatuation I had brought with me from Antomir had not yet completely faded out, anyhow. And so I harbored vague thoughts that some day, when I saw fit to press my suit, Gussie might yield. I was getting impatient. The idea of having to go back to work became more hateful to me every day. I was in despair. Finally, I decided to consider my career as a cloakmaker closed, to cut my expenses to the veriest minimum, to live on my savings, look for some source of income that would not interfere with my studies, take the college examination as soon as I was ready for it, and let the future take care of itself. In the heart of the Jewish neighborhood, I found an attic for half of what I was paying the Irish family. Moreover, it was in a neighborhood where everything was cheaper than in any other part of New York, the only one in which it was possible for a man to have a room to himself and live on four dollars a week. So I moved to that attic, a step for which, as I now think of it, I cannot be thankful to fate, for it brought me in touch with a quaint, simple man who is my warm friend to this day, perhaps the dearest friend I have had in America. The house was a rickety two-story frame structure, the smallest and oldest looking on the block. Its ground floor was used as a tailoring shop by the landlord himself, a white-headed giant of a man whom I cannot recall otherwise than as smiling wistfully and sighing. His name was Ezra Nodelman. His wife, who was a dwarf beside him, ruled him with an iron hand. Mrs. Nodelman gave me breakfasts, and I soon felt like one of the family. She was a veritable chatterbox, her great topic of conversation being her son Meyer, upon whom she doted, and his American-born wife, whose name she scarcely ever uttered without a malediction. She told me how she, Meyer's mother, her sister, and a niece, 
had turned out their pockets and pawned their jewelry to help Meyer start in business as a clothing manufacturer. He's now worth a hundred thousand dollars. May no evil eye hit him, she said. He's a good fellow, a lump of gold. If God had given him a better wife, may the plague carry off the one he has, he would be all right. She has a meatball for a face, the face of a murderess. She always was a murderess, but since Meyer became a manufacturer, there is no talking to her at all. The airs she is giving herself, and all because she was born in America, the frog that she is. I soon made Meyer's acquaintance. He was a dark man of forty, with oriental sadness in his eyes. To lend his face capitalistic dignity, he had recently grown a pair of side whiskers. But one day, a week or two after I met him, he saw a circus poster of Jojo the Human Dog, and then he hastened to discard them. I don't want to look like a man dog, he explained gaily to his mother, who was unpleasantly surprised by the change. Man dog nothing, she protested, addressing herself to me. He was as handsome as gold in those whiskers. He looked like a regular monarch in them. And then to him, I suppose it was that treasure of a wife you have who told you to have them taken off. It's a lucky thing she does not order you to have your foolish head taken off. You better shut up, Mama, he said sternly. And she did. He called to see his parents quite frequently, sometimes with some of his children, but never with his wife at least not while I lived there. Crassly illiterate, save for his ability to read some Hebrew, without knowing the meaning of the words, he enjoyed a considerable degree of native intellectual alertness, and in his crude, untutored way was a thinker. One evening he took to quizzing me on my plans, partly in Yiddish and partly in broken English, which he uttered with a strong cockney accent, a relic of the several years he had spent in London. And what will you do after you finish, he pronounced it fiendish, college, he inquired with a touch of derision. I shall take up some higher things, I rejoined reluctantly. And what do you call higher things, he pursued in his quizzical, brow-beating way. Are you going to be a philosopher? Yes, I shall be a doctor of philosophy, I answered frostily. What's that? You want to be both a doctor and a philosopher? But you know the saying, many trades, few blessings. I am not going to be a doctor and a philosopher, but a doctor of philosophy, I said with a sneer. And how much will you make? Oh, let him alone, Meyer, his mother intervened. He is an educated fellow, and he doesn't care for money at all. Doesn't care for money, eh? The younger nobleman jeered. Do you think money is really everything? I shot back. One might be able to find a thing or two which could not be bought with it. Not even at Ridley's, he jested. But he was manifestly beginning to resent my attitude and to take our passage at arms rather seriously. Footnote. Ridley's, a well-known department store in those days. End of footnote. Not even at Ridley's. You can't get brains there, can you? Well, I never learned to write, but I have a learned fellow in my office. He's chuck full of learning and that sort of thing. Yet who is working for whom? I for him or he for me? So much for education, for the stuff that's in a man's head. And now let's take charity, the stuff that's in a man's heart. I don't care what you say, but of what use is a good heart unless he has some jinglers to go with it? You can't shove your hand into your heart and pull out a few dollars for a poor friend, can you? You can help him out of your pocket, though. That is, provided it is not empty. Footnote. Jinglers. Coins. Money. End of footnote. My bewigged little landlady was feasting her eyes on her son. Meyer went on with his argument. What is a man without capital? Nothing. Nobody cares for him. He is like a beast. A beast can't talk, and he can't. Money talks, as the Americans say. His words and manner put me in a socialist mood. He was hateful to me. I listened in morose silence. He felt piqued, and he wilted. The ginger went out of his voice. 
my taciturnity continued until gradually he edged over to my side of the controversy taking up the cudgels for education and spiritual excellence with the same force with which he had a short while ago tried to set forth their futility of course it's nice to be educated he said a man without writing is just like a deaf mute what's the difference the man who can't write has speech in his mouth but he is dumb with his fingers while the deaf mute he can't talk with his mouth but he can do so with his fingers both should be pitied i do like education of course i do don't i send my boy to college i am an ignorant bore myself because my father was poor but my children shall have all the wisdom they can pile in we jews have too many enemies in the world everybody is ready to shed our blood so where would we be if many of our people were not among the wisest of the wise why they would just crush us like so many flies when i see an educated jew i say to myself that's it when he heard of my ambition to give lessons he said i tell you what i'll be your first pupil i mean it he added seriously my heart gave a leap very well i'll try my best i replied mind you i don't want to be a philosopher i just want you to fix me up in reading writing and figuring a little bit that's all you don't think it's too late do you too late i chuckled hysterically why i can sign or endorse a check and thank god for a good few dollars too but when it comes to fixing in the stuffing there is trouble i know how to write figures but not the words i can write almost any number if i was worth all the money i can put down in figures i should be richer than vanderbilt to ensure secrecy i was to give him his lessons in my attic room i don't want my kids to know their pa is learning like a little boy don't you know he explained american kids have not much respect for their fathers anyhow as a preliminary to his initial lesson nodelman offered to show me what he could do when i brought pen and ink and some paper he cleared his throat screwed up a solemn mane and took hold of the pen in trying to shake off some of the ink he sent splashes all over the table at last he proceeded to write his name he handled the pen as he would a pitchfork it was quite a laborious proceeding and his first attempt was a fizzle for he reached the end of the paper before he finished the n in nodelman he tried again and this time he was successful but it was three minutes before the task was completed it left him panting and wiping his ink-stained fingers on his hair a man who has to work as hard as that over his signature has no business to be seen among decent people he said with sincere disgust i ought to be a horse driver not a manufacturer so speaking he submitted his signature for my inspection without however letting go of the sheet tell me how rotten it is he said bashfully when i protested that it was not rotten at all he grunted something to the effect that once i was to instruct him he would expect to pay me not for empty compliments but for the truth at this he lighted a match and applied it to the sheet of paper containing his signature a signature is no joke he explained as he watched it burn put a few words and some figures on top of it and it is a note as good as cash when a fellow is a beggar he has nothing to fear but when he is in business he had better be careful when he asked me how much i was going to charge him and i said twenty-five cents an hour he smiled i'll pay you more than that you just try your best for me will you at the end of the first week he handed me two dollars for three lessons i was the happiest man in new york that day if i had had to choose between earning ten dollars a week in tuition fees and a hundred dollars as wages or profits i should without the slightest hesitation have decided in favor of the ten dollars and now behold that coveted source of income seemed nearer at hand than i had dared forecast once a start had been made i might expect to procure other pupils even if they could not afford to pay so lavish a price as two dollars for three lessons but alas my happiness was not to last long i was giving nodelman his fifth lesson we were spelling out some syllables in a first reader 
Presently he grew absent-minded, and then suddenly pushing the school book from him said, Too late, too late. Those black little dots won't get through my forehead. It has grown too hard for them, I suppose. I attempted to reassure him, but in vain. When the next cloak season came, I slunk back to work. I felt degraded, but I earned high wages and my good spirits soon returned. I firmly made up my mind, come what might, to take the college entrance examination the very next fall. I expected to have four hundred dollars by then, but I was determined to enter college even if I had much less. I shan't starve, I said to myself, and if I don't get enough to eat, hunger is nothing new to me. The very firmness of my purpose was a source of encouragement and joy. End of Book 7, Chapter 8 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Book 8, Chapter 1 of The Rise of David Levinsky This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Cahan Book 8 The Destruction of My Temple Chapter 1 An unimportant accident, a mere trifle, suddenly gave a new turn to the trend of events, changing the character of my whole life. It was the middle of April. The spring season was over, but Mannheimer Brothers, the firm by which I was employed, had received heavy duplicate orders for silk coats and, considering the time of the year, we were unusually busy. One day, at the lunch hour, as I was opening a small bottle of milk, the bottle slipped out of my hand, and its contents were spilled over the floor in some silk coats. Jeff Mannheimer, one of the twins, happened to be near me at the moment, and a disagreeable scene followed. But first a word or two about Jeff Mannheimer. He was the inside man of the firm, having charge of the mechanical end of the business as well as of the offices. He was of German parentage, but of American birth. Bald-headed as a melon, and with a tendency to corpulence, he had the back of a man of forty-five, and the front of a man of twenty-five. He was a vivacious fellow, one of those who are indefatigable and abortive attempts at being witty, one of his favorite puns being that we Russians were not Russian at all, that we were a slow lot. Altogether, he treated us as an inferior race, often lecturing us upon our lack of manners. I detested him. When he saw me drop the bottle of milk, he flew into a rage. Eh, he shouted, did you think this was a kitchen? Can't you take better care of things? As he saw me crouching and wiping the floor and the coats with my handkerchief, he added, you might as well take those coats home. The price will be charged against you. That'll make you remember that this is not a barn, but a factory. Where were you brought up? Among Indians? Some of my shopmates tittered obsequiously, which encouraged Mannheimer to further sarcasm. Why, he doesn't even know how to handle a bottle of milk. Did you ever see such a lobster? At this, there was an explosion of merriment. A lobster, one of the tailors repeated, relishingly. I could have murdered him, as well as Mannheimer. My head was swimming. I was about to say something insulting to my employer, to get up and leave the place demonstratively. But I said to myself that I should soon be through with this kind of life for good, and I held myself in leash. Two or three minutes later, I sat at a machine, eating my milkless lunch. I was trying to forget the incident, trying to think of something else, but in vain. Mannheimer's derision, especially the word lobster, was ringing in my ear. He passed out of the shop, but ten or fifteen minutes later he came back, and as I saw him walk down the aisle, I became breathless with hate. The word lobster was buzzing in my brain amid vague, helpless visions of revenge. Presently, my eye fell upon Ansel Hayeken, the designer, and a strange thought flashed upon me. He was a Russian like myself. He was an ignorant tailor, as illiterate as Mayor Nodelman, but a born artist in his line. It was largely to his skill that the firm, which was doing exceedingly well, owed the beginning of its success. It was the common talk among the hands of the factory that his Americanized copies of French models had found special favor with the buyer of a certain large department store and that this alone gave the house a considerable volume of business. Jeff Mannheimer, who superintended the work, was a commonplace man, with more method and system than taste or initiative. Hayeken was the heart, and the actual master of the establishment. 
Yet all this really wonderful designer received was $45 a week. He knew his value, and he saw that the two brothers were rapidly getting rich, but he was a quiet man, unaggressive and unassuming, and very likely he had not the courage to ask for a raise. As I now looked at him with my heart full of rancor from Mannheimer, I exclaimed to myself, What a fool! He appeared to me in a new light as the willing victim of downright robbery. It seemed obvious that the Mannheimers could not do without him, that he was in a position to dictate terms to them, even to make them accept him as a third partner. And, once the matter had presented itself to me in that light, it somehow began to vex me. It got on my nerves, as though it were an affair of my own. I complimented myself upon my keen sense of justice, but in reality this was my name for my disgust with Hayekin's passivity, and for the annoyance and the burning ill will which the rapid ascent of the firm aroused in me. I begrudged them, or rather Jeff, the money they were making through his efficiency. The idiot, I soliloquized. He ought to start on his own hook with some smart business demand for a partner. Let Jeff try to do without that lobster of a Russian. The idea took a peculiar hold upon my imagination. I could not look at Ansel Hayekin, or think of him, without picturing him leaving the Mannheimers in a lurch and becoming a fatal competitor of theirs. I beheld their downfall. I gloated over it. But Hayekin lacked gumption and enterprise. What he needed was an able partner, some man of brains and force. And so, unbeknown to Hayekin, the notion was shaping itself in my mind of becoming his manufacturing partner. The thought of Mayor Nodelman's humble beginnings, and of the three hundred odd dollars I had in my savings bank, whispered encouragement in my ear. I had heard of people who went into manufacturing with even less than that sum. Moreover, it was reasonable to expect that Hayekin had laid up some money of his own. Our precarious life among unfriendly nations had made a thrifty people of us. And for a man like Hayekin, forty-five dollars a week, every week in the year, meant superabundance. The Mannheimers were relegated to the background. It was no longer a mere matter of punishing Jeff. It was a much greater thing. I visioned myself a rich man, of course, but that was merely a detail. What really hypnotized me was the venture of the thing. It was a great, daring game of life. I tried to reconcile this new dream of mine with my college projects. I was again performing the trick of eating the cake and having it. I would picture myself building up a great cloak business and somehow contriving at the same time to go to college. The new scheme was scarcely ever absent from my mind. I would ponder it over my work and during my meals. It would visit me in my sleep in a thousand grotesque forms. Hyken became the center of the universe. I was continually eyeing him listening for his voice, scrutinizing his looks, his gestures, his clothes. He was an insignificant-looking man of thirty-two, with almost a cadaverous face and a very prominent Adam's apple. He was not a prepossessing man by any means, but his bluish eyes had a charming look of boy-like dreaminess, and his smile was even more childlike than his look. He was dressed with scrupulous neatness, and rather pretentiously, as behooved his occupation, but all this would scarcely have prevented one from telling him for a tailor from some poor town in Russia. Now and then, my project struck me as absurd, for Hayekin was in the foremost ranks of a trade in which I was one of the ruck. Should he conceive the notion of going into business on his own accord, he would have no difficulty in forming a partnership with considerable capital. Why, then, should he take heed of a piteous schemer of my caliber? But a few minutes later, I would see the matter in another light. Chapter 2 one Sunday morning in the latter part of May, I betook myself to a certain block of new tenement houses in the neighborhood of East 110th Street and Central Park, then the new quarter of the more prosperous Russian Jews. Hayekin had recently moved into one of these houses, and it was to call on him that I had made my way from downtown. I found him in the dining room, playing on an accordion, while his wife, who had answered my knock at the door, was busy in the kitchen. He scarcely knew me. To pave the way to the object of my visit, I began by inquiring about designing lessons. As teaching was not in his line, we soon passed to other topics related to the cloak trade. I found him a poor talker and a very uninteresting companion. He answered mostly in monosyllables or with mute gestures, often accompanied by his childlike grin or a perplexed stare with his bluish eyes. Gradually, I gave the conversation a more personal turn. When, somewhat flushed, I finally hinted at my plan he shrank with an air of confusion. At this juncture, his wife made her appearance, followed by her eight-year-old boy. Hayekin looked relieved. I hear you are talking business, she said, summarily taking possession of the situation. What is it all about? Completely taken aback by her domineering manner, I sought escape in embarrassed banter. You have scared me so, I said. I can't speak. I'll tell you everything. 
That's just what brings me here. Only let me first catch my breath and take a look at your stalwart little man of a boy. Her brave face relaxed into an involuntary smile. What struck me most in her was the startling resemblance she bore to her husband. The two looked like brother and sister rather than like husband and wife. You must be relatives, I observed, for something pleasant to say, and put my foot in it. Not at all, she replied with a frown. To win back her good graces, I proceeded to examine Maxie, her boy, in spelling. The stratagem had the desired effect. We got down to business again. When she heard my plan, she paused to survey me. I felt a sinking feeling at the heart. I interpreted her searching looks as saying, The nerve this snoozer has. But I was mistaken. Her pinched, sallow face grew tense with excitement, and she said with coy eagerness, How can we tell if your plan amounts to anything? If you gave us an idea of how much you could put up, it would not require a million, I hazarded. A million who talks of millions. Still, it would take a great deal of capital to start a factory that should be something like. There'll be no trouble about money, I parried, fighting shy of the more imposing term capital, which made my paltry three hundred still paltrier. There is money and money, she answered, with furtive glances at me. A nickel is also money. I am not speaking of nickels, of course. I should say not. It's a matter of many thousands of dollars. I was dumbfounded, but instantly rallied. Of course, I assented. At the same time, it depends on many things. Still, you ought to give us some idea of how much you could put in. Is it, is it say, 15,000? That she should not deem it unnatural for a young man of my station to be able to raise a sum of this size was partly due to her utter lack of experience, and partly to an impression prevalent among people of her class that nothing is impossible in the land of Columbus. I pretended to grow thoughtful, with an effect of making computations. I even produced a piece of paper and a pencil and indulged in some sham figuring. At last, I said, Well, I can't as yet tell you exactly how much. As I have said, it depends on certain things, but it'll be all right. Besides, money is not really the most important part in a scheme of this kind. A man of brains and a hustler will make a lot of money, while a fool will lose a lot. There are others who want to go into business with me, only I know Mr. Hyken is an honest man. And that's what I value more than anything else. I hate to take up with people of whom I can't be sure, don't you know? But you forget the main thing. She could not forbear to break in. Mr. Hagen is the best designer in New York. Ah, uh, everybody knows that, I conceded, deeming it best to flatter her vanity. That's just what makes it ridiculous that he should work for others, making other people rich instead of trying to do something for himself. I have some plans by which the two of us, Mr. Hagen taking charge of manufacturing, and I have the business outside, would do wonders. We would simply do wonders. There is another fine designer who is anxious to form a partnership with me, but I said to myself, I must first see if I could not get Mr. Hayekin interested. Miss Hayekin tried to guess who that other designer was, but I pleaded mysteriously certain circumstances that placed the seal of discretion on my lips. I won't tell anybody, she assured me, in a flutter of curiosity. I know you won't, but I can't, honest. I tell you, I won't say a word to anybody. Strike me dumb if I do. I can't, Miss Hyken, I besought her. Don't bother, her husband put in good-naturedly. A woman will be a woman. I went on to describe the wonders that the firm of Hyken and Levinsky would do. Miss Hyken's eyes glittered. I held her spellbound. Her husband, who had hitherto been a passive listener, as if the matter in discussion was one in which he was not concerned, began to show signs of interest. It was the longest and most eloquent speech I had ever had occasion to deliver. It seemed to carry conviction. Children often act as a barometer of their mother's moods, so when I had finished and little Maxie slipped up close to me and tacitly invited me to fondle him, I knew that I had made a favorable impression on his mother. I was detained for dinner. I played with Maxie, gave him problems in arithmetic, went into ecstasies over his cuteness. I had a feeling that the way to Miss Hyken's heart was through Maxie, but I took good care not to overplay my part. We are all actors, more or less. The question is only what our aim is, and whether we are capable of a convincing personation. At the time I conceived my financial scheme, I knew enough of human motive to be aware of this. End of chapters 1 and 2 of Book 8all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Cahan. Book 8, 
The Destruction of My Temple Chapter 3 It was a sultry, sweltering July afternoon in May, one of those escapades of the New York climate when the population finds itself in the grips of midsummer discomforts without having had time to get seasoned to them. I went into the park. I had come away from the Hayekens under the impression that if I could raise two or three thousand dollars, I might be able, by means of perseverance and diplomacy, to achieve my purpose. But I might as well have set myself to raise two or three millions. I thought of Mayor Nodelman, of Mr. Even and his wealthy son-in-law, of Maximum Max, but the idea of approaching them with my venture could not be taken seriously. The images of Guidelson and of Gussie crossed my mind almost simultaneously. I rejected them both. Guidelson and I might, perhaps, start manufacturing on a small scale, leaving Hayekin out. But Hayekin was the very soul of my project. Without him, there was no life to it. Besides, where was he, Guidelson? Was it worthwhile hunting for him? As for Gussie, the notion of marrying her for her money seemed a joke, even if she were better looking and younger. That her dower was anywhere near $3,000 was exceedingly doubtful. However, the image of her washed-out face would not leave my mind. Her hoarding might amount to over 1000 and in my despair the sum was tempting. She is a good girl, the best of all I know. I defended myself before the good spirit in me. Also, she is a most sensible girl, just the kind of wife a businessman needs. In addition, I urge the time-honored theory that a homely wife is less likely to flirt with other men and to neglect her duties than a good-looking one. I took the car downtown and made my way to Gussie's lodging that very afternoon. I did so before I had made up my mind that I was prepared to marry her. I'll call on her anyway, I decided. Then we shall see. There can be no harm in speaking to her. I was impelled by the adventure of it, more than by anything else. In spite of the unbearable heat, I almost felt sure that I should find her at home. Going out of a Sunday required presentable clothes, which she did not possess. She was saving for her dower with her usual intensity. I was not mistaken. I found her on the stoop in a crowd of women and children. I must speak to you, Gussie, I said, as she descended to the sidewalk to meet me. Let's go somewhere. I have something very important I want to say to you. Is it again something about your studying to be a smart man at my expense? She asked, rather good-naturedly. No, no, not at all. It's something altogether different, Gussie. The nervous emphasis with which I said it piqued her interest. Without going upstairs for her hat, she took me to the Grand Street dock, not many blocks away. The best spots were already engaged, but we found one that suited our purpose better than the water edge would have done. It was a secluded nook where I could give the rein to my eloquence. I told her of my talk with the Hyakins, omitting names, but inventing details and bits of local color, calculated to appeal to my listener's imagination and business sense. She followed my story with an air of stiff aloofness, but this only added fuel to the fervor with which I depicted the opportunity before me. So you have thrown that college of yours out of your mind, haven't you? She said it in a dry, non-committal way. I felt the color mounting to my face. Well, not entirely, I answered. Not entirely. I mean, well, anyhow, what do they do at college? They read books. Can I read them at home? One can find time for everything. Returning to my project, I said, It's a great chance, Gussie. It would be an awful thing if I had to let it slip out of my hand. That what I wanted was her dower, with herself as an unavoidable appendage, went without saying. It was implied as a matter of course. How much would your great designer want you to invest? she asked, with an air of one guided by mere curiosity and with a touch of irony to boot. A couple of thousand dollars might do, I suppose. A couple of thousand, she said, lukewarmly. Tell your great designer he is riding too a high a horse. Still, in order to start a decent business, I said, throwing a covert glance at her. Cloak factories have been started with a good deal less, she snapped back. On Division Street, perhaps. And what do you fellows expect to do? Start on Broadway? Well, it takes some money to get started, even on Division Street. Not 2000 It has been done with a good deal less. I know, but still, I am sure a fellow must have some money. It depends on what you call some. It was the same kind of fencing contest as that which I had had with Miss Hyken. I was sounding Gussie's purse as the designer's wife had sounded mine. Finally, she took me in hand for a severe cross-examination. She was obviously interested. I contradicted myself in some minor points, but upon the whole, I stood the test well. If it is all as you say, she finally declared, there seems to be something in it. Gussie, I said tremulously, there is a great chance for us. Wait, she interrupted me, suddenly bethinking herself of a new point. If he is as great a designer as you say he is, and he works for a big firm, how is it that he can't find a partner with big money? He could, any number of them, but he has confidence in me. 
He says he would much rather start with me on 2,000 than with somebody else on 20. He thinks I should make an excellent businessman, and that between the two of us, we should make a great success of it. Money is nothing, so he says. Money can be made, but with a fool of an outside man, even more than $20,000 might go up in smoke. That's so, Gussie assented musingly. There was a pause. Well, Gussie, I mustered courage to demand. You don't want me to give you an answer right off, do you? Things like that are not decided in a hurry. We went on to discuss the project, and some indifferent topics. It was rapidly growing dark and cool. Looming through the thickening dust, somewhat diagonally across the dock from us, was the figure of a young fellow with his head reclining on the shoulder of a woman. A little further off and nearer to the water, I could discern a white shirtwaist and the embrace of a dark coat. A song made itself heard. It was After the Ball is Over, one of the sentimental songs of the day. Tara ra boom die followed a tune usually full of joyous snap and go but now performed in a subdued brooding tempo tinged with sadness it rang in a girlish soprano the rest of the crowd listening silently by this time the gloom was so dense that the majority of us could not see the singer which enhanced the mystery of her melody and the charm of her young voice presently other voices joined in all in the same meditative somewhat doleful rhythm Gayer strains would have sounded sacrilegiously out of tune, with the darkling glint of the river, with the mysterious splash of its waves against the bobbing bulkheads of the pier, with the starry enchantment of the passing ferry boats, with the love enraptured solemnity of the spring night. I had not the heart even to think of business, much less to talk it. We fell silent, both of us, listening to the singing. Poor Cassie. She was not a pretty girl, and she did not interest me in the least. Yet, at this moment, I was drawn to her. The brooding, plaintive tones which resounded around us had a bewitching effect on me. It filled me with yearning. It filled me with love. Gussie was a woman to me now. My hand sought hers. It was an honest proffer of endearment, for my soul was praying for communion with hers. She withdrew her hand. This should not be done in a hurry, either, she explained pensively. Gussie... Dear Gussie, I said, sincerely, though not unaware of the temporary nature of my feeling. Don't, she implored me. There was something in her plea which seemed to say, You know you don't care for me. It's my money that has brought you here. Alas, it is not my lot to be loved for my own sake. Her unspoken words broke my heart. Gussie, I swear to you, you are dear to me. Can't you believe me? The singing night was too much for her. She yielded to my arms. Urged on by the chill air, we clung together in a delirium of love-making. There were passionate embraces and kisses. I felt that her thin, dried-up lips were not to my taste, but I went on kissing them with unfeigned fervor. The singing echoed dolefully. We remained in that secluded nook until the growing chill woke us from our trance. I took her home. When we reached a tiny square jammed with express wagons, we paused to kiss once more, and when we found ourselves in front of her stoop, which was now deserted, the vigorous hand-clasp with which I took my leave was symbolic of another kiss. I went away without discovering the size of her hoard. I was to call on her the next evening. As I trudged along through the swarming streets on my way home, the predominant feeling in my heart was one of physical distaste. Poor thing. I felt that marrying her was out of the question. Nevertheless, the next evening I went to see her as arranged. I found her out. Her landlady handed me a letter. It was in Yiddish. Mr. Levinsky, it read. I do not write this myself, for I cannot write, and I do not want you to think that I want to make believe that I can. A man is writing it for me for ten cents. I am telling him the words, and he is writing it just as I tell him. It was all a mistake. You know what I mean. I don't care to marry you. You are too smart for me, and too young, too. I am afraid of you. I am a simple girl, and you are educated. I must look for my equal. If I married you, both of us would be sorry for it. Excuse me, and I wish you well. Please don't come to see me any more. Gussie. The message left me with a feeling of shame, sadness, and commiseration. During that evening and the forenoon of the following day, I was badly out of spirits. There was nothing to do at the shop, yet I went there just to see Hayekin, so as to keep up his interest in my scheme. He was glad to see me. He had a message from his wife, who wanted me to call in the evening. Gussie's letter was blotted out of my memory. I was once more absorbed in my project. I spent the evening at the designer's house. Miss Hyacken made new attempts at worming out the size of my fortune, and, in addition, something concerning its origin. Is it an inheritance? She queried. An inheritance? Why, would you like me to get one? I said playfully, as though talking to a child. She could not help laughing. Well, then, is it from a rich brother or a sister? Or is it your own money? She pursued, falling in with the facetious tone that I was affecting. Any kind of money you wish, Miss Hyacken, but... 
Seriously, there will be no trouble about cash. The main point is that I want to go into manufacturing and that I should prefer to have Mr. Hayekin for my partner. There is plenty of money in cloaks, and I am bent upon making heaps, great heaps of it, for Mr. Hayekin and myself. Really, isn't it maddening to think that he should be making other people rich while all he gets is a miserable few dollars a week? It's simply outrageous. So speaking, I worked Miss Hayekin up to a high sense of the absurdity of the thing. I was rapidly gaining ground with her. And so, pending that mysterious something to which I was often alluding as the source of my prospective fortune, I became a frequent visitor at her house. Sometimes she would invite me to supper. Once or twice we spent Sunday together. As for little Maxie, he invariably hailed me with joy. I was actually fond of him, and I was glad of it. Chapter 4 the time I speak of, the late 80s and the early 90s, is connected with an important and interesting chapter in the history of the American cloak business. Hitherto in the control of German Jews, it was now beginning to pass into the hands of their Russian co-religionists, the change being effected under peculiar conditions that were destined to lead to a stupendous development of the industry. If the average American woman is, today, dressed infinitely better than she was a quarter of a century ago, and if she is now easily the best-dressed average woman in the world, the fact is due, in a large measure, to the change I refer to. The transition was inevitable. While the manufacturers were German Jews, their contractors, tailors, and machine operators were Yiddish-speaking immigrants from Russia or Austrian Galicia. Although the former were of a superior commercial civilization, it was, after all, a case of Greek meeting Greek and the circumstances were such that just because they represented a superior commercial civilization, they were doomed to be beaten. The German manufacturers were the pioneers of the industry in America. It was a new industry, in fact, scarcely twenty years old. Formerly, and as late as the seventies, women's cloaks and jackets were little known in the United States. Shawls were worn by the masses. What few cloaks were seen on women of means and fashion were imported from Germany, but the demand grew. So, gradually, some German-American merchants and an American Shaw firm bethought themselves of manufacturing these garments at home. The industry progressed. The newborn great Russian immigration, a child of the massacres of 1881 and 1882, bringing the needed army of tailors for it. There was big money in the cloak business, and it would have been unnatural if some of these tailors had not, sooner or later, begun to think of going into business on their own hook. At first, it was a hard struggle. The American business world was slow to appreciate the commercial possibilities which these newcomers represented but it learned them in course of time. It was at the beginning of this transition period that my scheme was born in my mind. Schemes of that kind were in the air. Meher Nodelman, the son of my landlady, had not the remotest inkling of my plans, yet I had consulted him about them more than once. Of course, it was all done in a purely abstract way. Like the majority of our people, he was a talkative man, so I would try to keep him talking shop. By a system of seemingly casual questioning, I would pump him on sundry details of the clothing business on the differences and similarities between it and the cloak trade, and, more especially, on how one started on a very small capital. He bragged and blustered, but oftentimes he would be carried away by the sentimental side of his past struggles. Then he would unburden himself of a great deal of unvarnished history. On such occasions, I would obtain from him a veritable treasure of information and suggestions. Some of the generalizations of this homespun and quaint thinker, too, were interesting. Talking of credit, for example, he once said, When a fellow is a beginner... It's a good thing if he has a credit face. I thought it was some kind of commercial term he was using. And when I asked him what it meant, he said, Why, some people are just born with the kind of face that makes the woolen merchant or the bank president trust them. They're not more honest than some other fellows. Indeed, some of them are plain pickpockets. But they have a credit face, so you have got to trust them. You just can't help it. And if they don't pay? Yeah, but they do. They get credit from somebody else and pay the jobber of the bank. Then they get more credit from these people and pay the other fellows. People of this kind can do a big business without a cent of capital. In Russia, a fellow who pays his bills is called an honest man, but America is miles ahead of Russia. Here, you can be the best pay in the world and yet be a crook. You wouldn't say that every man who breathes God's air is honest, would you? Well, paying your bills in America is like breathing. If you don't, you are dead. Hayekin, too, often let fall in his hesitating monosyllabic way some observation which I considered of value. Of the purely commercial side of the industry, he knew next to nothing. But then he could tell me a thing or two concerning the psychology of popular taste, the forces operating behind the scenes of fashion, the methods employed by small firms in stealing styles from larger ones, and other tricks of the trade. At last I was resolved to act. It was the height of the season for winter orders, and I decided to take time by the forelock. 
One day, when I called at the designers, and Miss Hyakin asked me for news, alluding to the thousands I was supposed to be expecting, I said, well, I have rented a shop. Rented a shop? That's what I did. It's no use missing the season. If a fellow wants to do something, there is nothing for it but to go to work and do it, else he is doomed to be a slave all his life. When I added that the shop was on Division Street, her face fell. But what difference does it make where it is? I argued with studied vehemence. It's only a place to make samples in, for a start. Mr. Hyakin is not going into a wee bit of business like that, no, sir. In the course of our many discussions, it had often happened that, after overruling me with great finality, she would end by yielding to my point of view. I hoped this would be the case in the present instance. Don't be too hasty, Miss Hyakin, I said with a smile. Wait till you know a little more about the arrangement. And dropping into the Talmudic sing-song, which usually comes back to me when my words assume an argumentative character, I proceeded. In the first place, I don't want Mr. Hyakin to leave the Mannheimers. Not yet. All I want him to do is to attend to our shop evenings. Don't be uneasy. The Mannheimers won't get wind of it. Leave that to me. Well, all I want is some samples to go around the stores with. The rest will come easy. We'll make things hum. See if we don't. When we have orders and get really started, we'll move out of Division Street. <laughs> of course we will. But would it not be foolish to open up on a large scale and have Mr. Hyagen give up his job before we have accomplished anything? I think it would. Indeed, it's my money that's going to be invested. Do you blame me for being careful, at the beginning at least? I neither want Mr. Hyagen to risk his job, nor myself to risk big money. But you haven't even told me how much you can put in, she blurted out excitedly. As much as will be necessary. But what's the use, dumping a big lot at once? Many a big business has failed, while firms who start in a modest way have worked themselves up. Why shouldn't Mr. Hyakin begin by risking his position? Why? Why? The long and short of it was that Miss Hyakin became enthusiastic for my Division Street shop, and the next day her husband took two hours off to accompany me to a nondescript woolen store on Hester Street, where we bought $50 worth of materials. The rent for the shop was 30 days a month. One month's rent for two sewing machines was $2.00. A large second-hand table for designing and cutting and some old chairs cost me $12 more, leaving me a balance of over $200. Before I went to rent the premises for a prospective shop, I had withdrawn my money from the savings bank and deposited it in a small bank where I opened a check account. Once I am to play the part of a manufacturer, it would not do to pay bills in cash, I reflected. I must pay in checks and do so like one to the manner born. At this, the magic word credit loomed in letters of gold before me. I was aware of the fascination of checkbooks. So, being armed with one, I expected to be able to buy things, in some cases at least, without having to pay for them at once. Besides, my bank might be induced to grant me a loan. Then, too, one might issue a check before one had the amount, and thereby gain a day's time. There seemed to be a world of possibilities in the long, narrow book in my breast pocket. I was ever conscious of his presence. I have a vivid recollection of the elation with which I drew and issued my first check, in payment of $30, the first month's rent, for our prospective cloak factory. Humanity seemed to have become divided into two distinct classes, those who paid their obligations in cash and those who paid in checks. I still have that first checkbook of mine. End of chapters 3 and 4 of Book 8 This recording by Five Pack Book 8, Chapter 5 of The Rise of David Levinsky. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Cahan. Book 8, The Destruction of My Temple. Chapter 5, Hayekin made up half a dozen sample garments. I took them to the department store to which the Mannheimer brothers catered but the buyer of the cloak department would not so much as let me untie my bundle. He was a middle-aged man, women buyers were rare in those days, an Irish-American of commanding figure. After sweeping me with a glance of cold curiosity, he waved me aside. My Russian name and my appearance were evidently against me. I tried the other department stores, with the same result. The larger business world of the city had not yet learned to take the Russian Jew seriously as a factor in advanced commerce. The buyer of the cloak department in the last store I visited was an American Jew, a fair-complexioned little fellow, all aglitter with neatness. At first, he took an amused interest in me. When I had packed my goods and was about to show him one of Hayekin's jackets, he checked me. Suppose we gave you an order for 500, he said with a smile. 500 jackets to be delivered at a certain date. I would deliver it, I answered boldly. Why not? I don't know why. 
Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. How can we be sure you would? Before I had time to answer, he asked me how long I had been in the country. When I told him, he complimented me on my English. I was sure it meant business. I was thrilled. Have you got a shop? He further questioned. How many hands do you employ? Seventy-five. He sized me up. Where is your place? On Division Street. <laughs> well, well. What is your rating? I did not know what he meant. So, for an answer, I made a new attempt to submit the contents of my bundle for his inspection. At this, he made a gesture of disgust and withdrew. A cold sweat broke out on my forehead. I had heard of the existence of small department stores in various sections of the city, so I went in search of them. I found myself in the vicinity of the city college. As I passed that corner, I studiously looked away. I felt like a convert Jew passing a synagogue. It was a warm day. My pack seemed to grow heavier with every block I walked, and so did my heart. I was perspiring freely. My collar wilted, all of which did anything but make me look as a man who paid his bills in checks. At last, walking up Third Avenue, I came across a place where there was quite a large display of jackets in the window. Upon my opening the door and announcing my mission, two jaunty young fellows invited me in with elaborate courtesy, almost with anxiety. My heart leaped for joy. I fell to opening my bundle. The two young men inspected every jacket, went into ecstasies over each of them, and then asked me all sorts of irrelevant questions until it dawned upon me that I was being made game of. It appeared that the father of the two young men, the proprietor of the store, manufactured his own goods, for wholesale as well as for retail trade. I received much better treatment in a store on Avenue B, but my goods proved too high for that neighborhood. As if to atone for this, the proprietor of this store, a kindly Galatian Jew, gave me a list of the minor department stores I was looking for, and some valuable suggestions in addition. My dinner that day consisted of two ring-shaped rolls which I bought in a Jewish grocery store, and which I ate on a bench in Tompkins Square. The day passed most discouragingly. It was about seven o'clock when, disheartened to the point of despair, I dragged my wearied limbs in the direction of my factory. When I got there, I found my partner waiting for me, not alone, but in the company of his wife. Well, she shrieked, jumping to meet me. Splendid, I replied with enthusiasm. It looks even better than I expected. I could have got good orders at once, but a fellow must not be too hasty. You have got to look around first, find out who is who, you know. Miss Hyakin looked crestfallen. So you did not get any orders at all? What's your hurry? Her husband said pleadingly. Levinsky is right. You can't sell goods unless you know who you deal with. The following two days were as barren of results as the first. Miss Hyakin had lost all confidence in the venture. She was becoming rather hard to handle. I don't want Ansel to bother any more, she said peevishly. You know what the Americans say. Time is money. Pay Ansel for his work and let us be friends at a distance. Very well, I said, and producing my checkbook, I asked, how much is it? The sight of my checkbook acted like a charm. The situation suddenly assumed brighter colors in Miss Hyken's eyes. <laughs> Look at him. He, he thought I really meant it, she grinned, sheepishly. Every night I would go to bed sick at heart, and with my mind half made up to drop it all, only to wake in the morning more resolute and hopeful than ever. Hopeful and defiant. It was as though somebody, the whole world, were jeering at my brazen-faced, hideous efforts, and I was bound to make good just for spite. I learned of the existence of purchasing offices, where the buyers of several department stores from so many cities made their headquarters in New York. Also, I discovered that in order to keep track of the arrivals of these buyers, I must follow a daily paper called Hotel Reporter. The ordinary newspapers did not furnish information of this character in those days. A man who manufactured neckties in the same ramshackle building in which I hoped to manufacture cloaks volunteered to let me look at his reporter every day. This man was naturally inclined to be neighborly, but I had found that an occasional quotation or two from the Talmud was particularly helpful in obtaining a small favor from him. I knocked about among the purchasing offices with bulldog tenacity, but during the first few days my efforts in this direction were as futile as in the case of the New York stores. Meanwhile, time was pressing. So far as out-of-town buyers were concerned, the winter season was drawing to a close. All I could see were some belated stragglers. One of these was a man from the Middle West, a stout, fleshy American with quick, nervous movements, which contradicted his well-fed, languid-looking face. He shot a few glances at my samples just to get rid of me, but he liked the designs, and I could see that he found my prices tempting. How soon will you be able to deliver 500? He snarled. In three weeks. Very well, go ahead. And speaking in his jerky, impatient way, he went on to specify how many cloaks he wanted of each kind. I left him with my heart divided between unutterable triumph and black despair. Five hundred cloaks! How would I raise the money for so much raw material? It almost looked like another practical joke. By this time, I was more than sure that the Hyakins had a considerable little pile. But to turn to them for funds was impossible. It would have let my cat out of the bag. I sought credit at Claflin's and at half a dozen smaller places, but all in vain. 
I could not help thinking of Nodelman's credit face. Ah, if that kind of face had fallen to my lot, but it had not, it seemed. It looked as if there were no hope for me. Finally, I took the necktie man into my confidence, the result being that he unburdened himself of his own financial straits to me. One afternoon, I was moping around some of the side streets off Lower Broadway in quest of some new place where I might try to beg for credit, when I noticed the small signboard of a commission merchant. Upon entering the place, I found a fine-looking elderly American dictating something to a stenographer. When the man had heard my plea, he looked me over from head to foot. I felt like a prisoner facing the jury, which is about to announce its verdict. At last, he said, well, you look pretty reliable. I guess I'll trust you the goods for 30 days. It was all I could do to restrain myself from invoking benedictions on his head and kissing his hands as my mother would have done under similar circumstances. So, I do have a credit face, I exclaimed to myself, gleefully. When I found myself in the street again, I looked at my reflection in store windows, scanning my credit face. The Hyakins took it for granted that I had paid for the goods on the spot. Things brightened up at our factory. I ordered an additional sewing machine of the installment agent and hired two operators, poor fellows who were willing to work 14 or 15 hours a day for $12 a week. The union had again been revived, but it was weak, and my employees did not belong to it. As for myself, I toiled at my machine literally day and night, snatching two or three hours sleep at dawn with some bundles of cut goods or half-finished cloaks for a bed. Hyakin spent every night from seven to two with me, cutting the goods and doing the better part of the other work. Miss Hyakin, too, lent a hand. Leaving Maxie in the care of her mother, she would spend several hours a day in the factory, finishing the cloaks. The 500 cloaks were shipped on time. I was bursting with consciousness of the fact that I was a manufacturer, that a big firm out west, a firm of Gentiles, mind you, was recognizing my claim to the title. I was American enough to be alive to the special glamour of the words, out west. Goods in our line of business usually sold for cash, which meant 10 days. 10 days more, then, and I should receive a big check from that firm. That would enable me to start new operations. Accordingly, I went out to look for more orders. Whether my first success had put new confidence in me, or whether my past experiences had somewhat rounded off my rough edges and enabled me to speak to business people in a more effective manner than I could have before, the proprietor of a small department store on Upper Third Avenue let me show him my samples. My prices made an impression on him. My cloaks were five dollars a piece lower than he was in the habit of paying. He looked askance at me, as though my figure seemed too good to be true, until I found it the best policy to tell him the unembellished truth. The big manufacturers of whom you pay have big office expenses, I explained. They make a lot of fuss, and you've got to pay for it. My principle is not to make fuss at the retailer's expense. Our office costs us very, very little. We are plain people. But that isn't all. Your big manufacturer pays for union labor, so he takes it out of you. Now, we don't bother about these things. We get the best work done for the lowest wages. The big men in the business wouldn't even know where hands of this kind could be got. We do. I took my departure with an order for 300 cloaks, expecting to begin work on them as soon as I received that check from out west. Things seemed to be coming my way. As I sat in an elevated train going downtown, I figured the profits of the two orders and pictured other orders coming in. I beheld our little factory, crowded with machines. I heard their bewitching whirr, whirr. Hyakin would have to leave the Mannheimers, of course. In the afternoon of the sixth day, when I called at one of the purchasing offices I have mentioned, I received the information that the firm whose check I was awaiting so impatiently had failed. Chapter 6 The failure of the Western firm seemed to have knit my commercial career in the bud. The large order I had received from its representative was apparently to be the death as well as the birth of my glory. In my despair, I tried to make a virtue of necessity. I was telling myself that it served me right, that I had had no business to abandon my intellectual pursuits. I was inclined to behold something like the hand of providence in the bankruptcy of that firm. At the same time, I was casting about my mind for some way of raising new money with which to pay the kindly commission merchant, get a new bill of goods from him, and fill my order. When I explained the matter to Miss Hyken, she was on the brink of a fainting spell. You're a liar and a thief, she shrieked. There never was a Western firm in the world. It's all a lie. You sold the goods for cash. Her husband knew something about firms and credit, so I had no difficulty in substantiating my assertion to him. It's only a matter of days when I shall get the big check that is coming to me, I assured them. I went on to spin a long yarn, to which she listened with jeers and outbursts of uncomplimentary Yiddish. One day, I mustered courage and called on Miss Hyakin. I did so on an afternoon when her husband was sure to be at work, because I had a lurking feeling that, being alone with me, she would be easier to deal with. When she saw me, she gasped. What? You, she said. You have the nerve to come up here. Come, come, Miss Hyakin, I said earnestly. Please, be seated and let us talk it all over in a businesslike manner. 
With your sense, and especially with your sense for business, you will understand me. Please, don't flatter me, she demurred sternly. But I knew that nothing appealed to her vanity so much as being thought a clever businesswoman, and I protested. Flatter you? In the first place, it is a well-known fact that women have more sense than men. In the second place, it is the talk of every cloak shop that Mr. Hyken owes his high position to you, as much as to his own ability. Everybody, everybody says so. I talked of unforeseen difficulties, of a well-known landlord whose big check I was expecting every day. I composed a story about the landlord's father-in-law agreed with Miss Hyken that it had been a mistake on my part to trust the buyer of that western firm with the goods without first consulting her, and the upshot was that she made me stay to supper, and that pending the arrival of Hyken, I took Maxie to the park. The father-in-law of my story was Mr. Even, of course. I had portrayed him vividly as coming to my rescue in my present predicament, so vividly, indeed, that my own fib haunted me the next day. The result was that in the evening I made myself as presentable as I could and repaired to the synagogue, where he spent much of his time reading Talmud. I had not visited the place since that memorable day, my first day in America. I recognized it at once. I was thrilled. The four odd years seemed twenty-four. Mr. Even was not there, but he soon came in. He had aged considerably. He was beginning to look somewhat decrepit. His dignity was tinged with the sadness of old age. Good evening, Mr. Even. Do you know me? I began. He scanned me closely, but failed to recognize me. I am David Levinsky, the green one you befriended four and a half years ago. Don't you remember me, Mr. Even? It was in this very place where I had the good fortune to make your acquaintance. I am the son of the woman who was killed by Gentiles in Antomir, I added, mournfully. Oh, yes, indeed, he said, with a wistful smile, somewhat abashed. He took snuff looked me over once more, and as if his memory had been brightened by the snuff, he burst out, Lord of the world, you are that young man. Why, I confess I scarcely recognized you. Of course, I remember it all. Why, of course I remember you. Well, well, how have you been getting along in America? Can't complain. Not at all. You remember that evening, after you provided me with a complete outfit, like a father fixing up his son for his wedding day, and you gave me five dollars into the bargain? You told me not to call on you again until I was well established in life. Do you remember that? Of course I do, he answered, with a beaming glance at two old tumultus who sat at their books close by. Well, here I am. I am running a cloak factory. He began to question me about my affairs with sad curiosity. I said that business was good, too good, in fact, so that it required somewhat more capital than I possessed. I soon realized, however, that he did not care for me now. My Americanized self did not make the favorable impression that I had made four and a half years before, when he gave me my first American haircut. I inquired after his daughter and his son-in-law, but... My hint that the latter might perhaps be willing to endorse a note from me evoked an impatient grunt from him. My son-in-law? Why, you don't even know him, he retorted with a suspicious look at me. I turned it off with a joke and asked about the henpecked man. Mr. Even had not seen him for four years. The other tumultuous present had never even known him. A man with extremely long black sidelocks who spoke with a Galatian accent became interested. After Mr. Even went to his wanted seat at the east wall, where he took up a book, this man said to me with a sigh, ah it is not the old home over there people go to the same synagogue all their lives while here one is constantly on the move they call it a city pshaw it is a marketplace a bazaar an inn not a city people are together for a day and then behold they have flown apart where to nobody knows i don't know what has become of you and you don't know what has become of me that's why there is no real friendship here i chimed in heartily that's why one feels so friendless so lonely my shop, of course, shut down, and I roamed about the streets a good deal. I was restless. I continually felt nonplussed, ashamed to look myself in the face, as it were. One forenoon, I found myself walking in the direction of 23rd Street and Lexington Avenue. The college building was now a source of consolation. Indeed, what was money beside the halo of higher education? I paused in front of the building. There were several students on the campus, all Jewish boys. I accosted one of them. I spoke to him enviously and left the place, thrilling with a desire to drop all thought of business, to take the entrance exam, and be a college student at last. I was almost grateful to that western firm for going into bankruptcy. And yet, even while I was tingling with this feeling, a voice exclaimed in my heart, Ah, if that western firm had not failed! The debt I owed the American commission merchant agonized me without let up. I couldn't help thinking of my credit face. To disappoint him of all men seemed to be the most brutal thing I had ever done. I imagined myself obtaining just enough money to pay him, but, as I did so, I could not resist the temptation of extending the sum so as to go on manufacturing cloaks. I was incessantly cudgeling my brains for some angel who would come to my financial rescue. The spell of my college aspirations was broken once for all. 
My temple was destroyed. Nothing was left of it but vague yearnings and something like a feeling of compunction which will assert itself sometimes to this day. The Talmud tells us how the destruction of Jerusalem and the great temple was caused by a hen and a rooster. The destruction of my American temple was caused by a bottle of milk. The physical edifice still stands, though the college has long since moved to a much larger and more imposing building or group of buildings. I find the humble old structure on Lexington Avenue and 23rd Street the more dignified and the more fascinating of the two. To me, it is a sacred spot. It is the sepulchre of my dearest ambitions, a monument to my noblest enthusiasm in America. End of chapters 5 and 6 of Book 8 and the end of Book 8, The Destruction of My Temple. Recording by Five Pack.